Good morning. We're going to call this impasse meeting to order. And we certainly look forward to hearing from both sides. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to legal counsel for her to explain protocol and how we're going to conduct this meeting. Madam Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an impasse hearing. It was advertised as a special meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. Your public forum for your regular meeting is advertised to start at 9 a.m. So this is dedicated only to this issue. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. That means you are not going to be taking speakers from the public on this issue. We are going to be swearing in at the commencement, and I would recommend that we do it in one fell swoop. We are going to swear in uh, through the clerk's office anyone who is a non-lawyer speaker who's going to be testifying during the hearing. This is going to be a hearing that is specific only to those three remaining uh, provisions for the master agreement for this particular union. It is not going to be about general issues or other labor issues or anything like that. This is very specific to these three issues. What happens is your decision today by majority vote will set in stone those three provisions. They get plugged into the otherwise negotiated master agreement. It goes to the union for vote. If it is ratified, it comes to you for final vote and we have a CBA in place with your union. Should the union reject the master agreement that goes to them, the three items that you vote on today are set in stone, but however, all the other provisions previously negotiated will be back on the table. So that is the sort of the, the play of field for today. You have uh, here the two tables. Each side is at a separate table. What I would ask at this point is any non-lawyer who will be part of the presentation and speaking or testifying to stand and allow our clerk's office to swear you in by raising your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. We Madam, Madam Attorney. Yes, sir. My biggest concern for me is, is the 4% for, for those employees. Uh, but that's, that won't be addressed today, correct? But correct. These, these issues will resolve that. The, a final ratified CBA with each side voting to ratify it will address that issue, will solve that issue. That is not part of your deliberations today. Your deliberations today are restricted to the provisions that are before you, which is going to be these three provisions. I am going to rely on each party to make their presentation, and I've ask that they please keep their presentations restricted to those items. And, and I clearly understand that, Madam Attorney, but uh, to, my, to, my, to my point, uh, for those who may be listening, we have to resolve these issues so people can get their raise. Yes, sir, a final ratified CBA would resolve that issue. Okay, well, that's the, that's the goal. Yes, sir, that is absolutely the goal. I believe that we can save for both parties. That should be the goal. Um, and I would recommend turning it over for your management team to make its presentation, and the ATU is here to make its presentation. Thank you, Madam Attorney, the Commissioners. Uh, we have three articles. Article seven is union leave, and I'll just read uh, management team's recommendation. Uh, this article shall apply to union officials who are members of the bargaining unit and presently employed by the county, union officials will not be permitted to take leave from regularly assigned work duties to conduct union business except as specifically provided in this article. For the purpose of this article, the term union business shall mean conducting direct re representation of ECAT bargaining unit employees represented by the ATU Local 1395 as authorized by the Public Employees Relation Commission. Direct representational activities will include attending collective bargaining unit sessions, disciplinary meetings, grievance hearings, and arbitration hearings. During the three-year term of this agreement, the county agrees to provide, to provide 120 hours per year to a union leave pool that may be authorized by the county as union leave with pay to conduct union business. Unused hours provided by the county remaining in the union leave pool at the end of the, each year will not carry over to the next year. Designated union officials may request union leave with pay to conduct union business by submitting a union leave request form 
to the transit director or designee with the date slash time of the requested absence and a description of the union business that will be performed. Unless immediate representation is required, all requests for union leave must be submitted no less than five business days in advance of the requested leave. Employees who are granted leave for less than a full shift must report to their supervisor upon leaving and returning to work. Union leave shall not count as time worked for the purpose of calculating overtime compensation. All requests for union leave will be granted at the sole discretion of the transit director. Requests for union leave may be denied if the employee's absence from regularly assigned work duties would pose an undue, undue financial or operational burden on the mass transit department. Article 46 is a sick leave bank. I'll read this article verbatim as, as we're recommending. Except as otherwise provided in this article, the bargaining unit sick leave bank will be maintained and administered by the County Human Resources Department in accordance with the provisions of the Human Resources Department Policies and Procedures Manual as revised June the 2nd, 2022. Relating to the county's sick leave pool, uh, see documented hours previously donated by bargaining unit employees to the bargaining unit sick leave bank prior to the date of ratification of this agreement, as may be verified by the records on file in the county's human resources department will be reserved for the exclusive use of el eligible bargaining unit employees. As of the date of ratification of this agreement, additional hours may not be donated to the bargaining unit sick leave bank and only those bargaining unit employees who previously donated hours uh, to the bargaining unit, sick, uh, bargaining unit sick leave bank as may be verified by records on file with the county's human resources department will be eligible to utilize the remaining hours in the bargaining unit sick leave bank. Upon exhausting the remaining hours accumulated in the bargaining unit sick leave bank, eligible employees may participate in the county's sick leave pool in accordance with the Human Resources Department Policies and Procedures Manual as revised June the 2nd, 2022. Bargaining unit employees who are not eligible to utilize the remaining hours in the bargaining unit sick leave bank will be eligible to participate in the county's sick leave pool in accordance with the Human Resources Department Policies and procedures manual as revised June the 2nd, 2022. Right. Yeah, and that is a revised rec our revised recommendation. And we will give the unit a copy of that. Article 44, as it pertains to bulletin boards, we're simply asking to vacate that article. Uh, we have a long contract uh, with social media and the ability to communicate uh, via social media and other email and such, we don't feel like the bulletin board is as vital uh, as it was some years ago. So we we're asking to vacate that. And that concludes my presentation. Mr. Lauer, if you'd like to make a presentation. Yeah, I'd like to uh, pass out to the commissioners. If I could. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for this time. Uh, regarding these three articles, we, um, I just passed out some uh, copies of a decision by two magistrates, special magistrates. Uh, the first was a, is a smaller packet. It's from special magistrate Gina Charles, who made a decision regarding Article 7, union leave. And then the second larger packet is from Special Magistrate Charles Cowler, who uh, made the decision on all eight articles that were left open on the second round of negotiations. So on the three articles that are open on union leave, if you turned in under Gina Charles packet to page nine. You can see a highlighted area, which as you know, I previously emailed this, so I hope you've read it. I don't wanna prolong this uh, hearing by reading all of it, but basically she took a, a joint effort of both sides positions 
and came away with a decision. In her decision, she included the ability for bargaining unit employees to choose to donate up to a, an additional 120 hours to the union for union leave beyond the 120 hours that would be provided by the bank from the county. Under Special Magistrate Charles Collar, he as well ruled and recommended the same type of decision, which is to allow bargaining unit employees, if they so choose, to donate up to an additional 120 hours as well. So we feel that the special magistrate's decision on Article 7 by both of them is justified and we support the special magistrate's recommendations. On Article 44, bulletin boards, simply the special magistrate said it is common to find language providing for union bulletin boards and collective bargaining agreements. Bulletin boards provide unions with the means of communicating with the bargaining unit members. As you know, you've had a couple of employees come down and speak on that concern. Um, taking away the union board would be very concerning. Even though our methods of communications have become available, as mentioned, social media, some employees rely on the bulletin boards for information. There is no compelling reason to remove this provision from the collective bargaining agreement. Therefore, the special magistrate will recommend the proposal of the union for Article 44 bulletin boards. We agree with him because utilizing, for instance, social media or text messages would require all bargaining unit employees to have to provide that to the union. And as you're aware, some bargaining unit employees are not members of the union and therefore might not agree to provide that information to the union. So a bulletin board would be their way of seeing communication such as a ratification vote or other items that are being presented. Under Article 46, sick leave bank policy. Uh, simply put, the union has valid arguments supporting the retention of the existing 2,000 hour sick leave bank. This is on page 36. Bargaining unit members voluntarily donated these hours with the understanding that they would be available to bargaining unit members only. The 2022 tentative agreement included a provision that reserved these hours for the exclusive use of the bargaining unit members. The special magistrate believes that it would be unfair to require bargaining unit members to allow the accumulated hours to be used by the county employees. The special magistrate recommends the following language and he has the language below. I heard what management just presented and received a copy. The only concern of what they presented to me is regarding the part of verifying from the human resource department. I will say that this sick leave bank, which got above 2,000 hours under this collective bargaining uh, group, was mostly obtained through the private sector management of first transit. So much of those our uh, documentation was maintained by First Transit, who is no longer available. There are emails that the union can provide that would show that the representatives of management were verifying that the, uh, the exact amount, which was in the, uh, uh, the bank. So to, to have to verify through human resource now of the county, which was not the employer at the time, would be very difficult. But we would feel that those hours should either go back to those employees and distribute those back to those employees and we, we, we would feel very good about joining the county's sick leave bank and their policy. But we would like to either distribute those hours back to the employees or at least let them use those hours first before joining the county's um, policy of sick leave. With that, that's it. We, we 
support the special magistrate's recommendation. We think that's a very important process that was uh, obtained and, and very thoughtful through that process. And that's uh, why we utilize the special magistrate. Thank you. Is there any additional presentation from management? Is there any additional comment or presentation from the union? No, thank you. <clears throat> Commissioners, the three provisions that have been presented to you today, you may accept or reject the wording presented by either side, or you can come up with your own wording for those provisions. You can address them each in separate vote, or you can have one vote to address all three. But a majority vote on these articles will establish the wording for these. It will set these three provisions in stone for purposes of going forward. So I turn it over to you for your deliberation. Thank you, Madam Council. Um, commissioners, we'll just start, Commissioner Bagosh. We'll, we'll work our way down. Okay. To yeah. the end. Well, I appreciate both sides. I've read through the information. Um, for my part, I, I, I'm always looking to make things uniform. In other words, each bargaining group should be treated the same. And I think that the management language uh, recognizes that, the importance of that. And I think since we brought ECAD in-house, I think that's been something we've been working towards. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with the language. Uh, in terms of redistributing the hours that have already been donated back, that just seems like an incredibly tumultuous process. Some employees may have left. It just seems like it'd be uh, going down a rabbit hole. So I like the idea of, leaving the hours there, allowing um, those employees under that section to use those hours first and then going into the, um, into the bargaining or into the sick leave pool of the county like all the other unions do. So I think that part's good. Uh, the union leave, again, uh, like I've expressed, I, I think there should be no difference. And I think this language that the management is, is putting forward um, indicates that. And I think that's reasonable. Um, and, I, and I'm going to support that. In terms of the bulletin board, I really have no problem having a bulletin board. If you want the bulletin board, I have no problem with it. I could live with that. Uh, is it necessary? Is it anachronistic? Um, but I, I do recognize the fact that not everyone necessarily participates in social media. The smart ones don't, if I'm being very honest about it. But that said, a, bar, uh, a bulletin board uh, would, <laughs> the bulletin board would not be uh, something that would drive me crazy if you want to keep the bulletin board. We have it in the shop that I manage right now. We have eight. I have a, a number of union employees and no one looks at it. It just sits there. In fact, the stuff that's on there now has been there for four years. And anyway, if you want the bulletin board, you can have it. But the other two articles, I'm going to stick with management. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so you were sticking with um, define what two articles you support and which one you don't have a problem with, Commissioner McGosh? I don't have a problem with the bulletin board staying status quo. Okay. I, I really don't have a problem with that. All right, thank you. Commissioner Cola. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll cut two of them out real easy. The union leave policy at 120 hours. I think that's reasonable. The bulletin board's not an issue with me. I do have the sick leave because I've, I'm very familiar with donor sick leave on the federal side. Am I understanding you don't have a tracking method for those 2,000 hours? We have the balances, but when the forms were uh, filled out by employees, those, those uh, forms were given to First Transit and therefore uh, First Transit is, is no longer here. We know the balance though. We do so know whose responsibility would have been to administratively, because that's an administrative task that should have happened, whose responsibility would that have been? It was done by the management team of First Transit. Uh, that individual obviously doesn't work anymore for the county. So how do I validate that those are correct and I'm not given 50 hours, uh, 50 weeks of sick leave away? How do I know that's a valid number? How do I prove that? I do have, the, I do have copies of emails that are from the previous management when they would verify the balance. Can you produce the numbers, the names, how much was donated to us? I, yes, I would have to pull it up on email and Because I can't those. vote for 2,000 hours of sick leave if I don't have names. I don't know if it's even an honest document. Yeah, I have an email from uh, uh, Colette uh, Wiederman, who was at the time working for First Transit, and she was in charge of providing the balance back to the union as we used it. Do we have that um, system? Col okay, sorry, Wes. Col uh, we have done some research on this issue. Uh, Mr. Dura and Ms. Powell in HR and labor relations have researched this. We have a stack of 
forms from ECAT, but the only the, the number of hours that we can verify through that documentation is 304. That's, that's a pretty big discrepancy. That's a, 1,700 discrepancy. hours almost. That's all we could. That's all we could find. So, what method were we using to verify it, Wes? Forms filled out by the employees at the time. Yeah, and and we have all that data going back. We have what has been available through ECAT records is what we have. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I can finish here. No, no, go ahead. I just. It, um, so do we have a method in the future for this to make sure that we're tracking this appropriately through HR, through a system with you? I, I mean, I can't imagine it's being off 1,700 hours. That's a lot of, lot of free leave. We would track it through HR. Com that's Commissioner. what we're doing now? Okay. Moving forward, that's what we would do. Okay. Commissioner, um, my memory serves that there was over 1,000 and then an employee under first transit uh, resigned and he donated close to 1,200 hours to the bank. One employee. That should be easy to identify then. Yeah. <laughs> that employee works for ECAT right now and he would verify that he donated those hours. Well, Mr. Chairman, if, if I could, I, you know, obviously my comments were predicated on the fact that any hours, you got hours listed, are verifiable. So I agree with you, Commissioner Kohler, and, and that, that's, I'm gonna predicate my comment. Okay, so, so I have a little bit of a hang up until that's a valid, um, that we can prove that number. The other thing I have just out of a, a policy standpoint, and I've had this happen to me before, we, we're allowing um, employees to give all their hours and sick leave, and then if they get sick, they don't have any hours, um, and then they have to go on FEMLA. What do we have in effect for that policy? Is there any that they have there's to leave a, in the there, bank for themselves? There is a limitation. There is? Through HR, there's a limitation. Now, when they were under first transit, I, I don't know what that mechanism was. What, is there a limit now, Mr. Lowry? Uh, well, now under the county, uh, but not under, county, under first transit, no. Okay, so we do have a process to kind of protect the citizen if they do get sick and don't have to go on FEM one. Yeah, we have a whole policy and procedure addre addressing the sick leave pool under, under uh, human resources for the county. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And, and employees can sell hours, gift hours, the whole, whole nine yards. Uh, C Commissioner Bender. Thank you, sir. Um, on Article 7 of union leave, uh, it says during the three-year term of this agreement, the county agrees to provide 120 hours. Oh, never mind, per year, I missed that. Okay, uh, I was missing the per year because it was saying it wasn't carrying over, so I wanted to make sure that, it, uh, I mean, that's a lot of time. Um, and I, I think that um, it's also specific to this bargaining unit, correct? The, the, the union leave would be, yeah, for this, CBA would be specific to this bargaining unit. Each each bargaining unit has their own contract with their own union leave spelled out. All right. So, Mr. Lauer, you still represent other bargaining units, though. So, what what occurs when when you go represent those? Well, that falls under perk, which would require me to conduct business for them during my off time. Okay. Um. All right, I, I, I'd say, I mean, I, I agree that, uh, you know, bringing this under the county, we are trying to get everyone uniform. Um, and um, what, what work or what resources are used to go into the bulletin board? I mean, is it, is it just that it's taking uh, space in the, in the building or? We don't really, we don't, we, we're not gonna remove the bulletin board. Okay. We're just trying to streamline the contract a little bit. We, I, we don't really care to have a bulletin board either. Uh, I'm not sure how much it gets utilized, but we're just trying to streamline so, so the contract. So we don't have any language bit. on that in front of us. So what? I mean, what's the concern? I mean, why? Why is that not TA'd then? Because we were trying to vacate and just make shorten the contract a little bit. We we're just trying all. to shorten the contract. Yep. And, and so what's the the wording currently say though? Just that we provide space for a bulletin board. Yeah, well, a space for a certain size bulletin board meant to be maintained by the by the union representation. Okay. Basically. Okay. Well. I, Again, if it's not undue burden on us to to have it there, then then I'd, I'd say that's that's fine. Um, you know, and, and with the sick leave, uh, I think if there's a huge discrepancy like we're talking about, we need to figure out what that is. Um, and 
and, and I couldn't tell if, if you misspoke, but uh, I mean, it, I think the what had been proposed was saying that they could use what's what's on the table. I mean, it's verified, but they can still use it. Correct. Um, actually, the amount that the balance currently is like just over 1900 that's left. And, uh, you know, our position is we'd like to just utilize that 1900 till it goes to zero for our bargaining unit. And then from there, we would join the county's uh, uh, sick leave bank. And again, Commissioner, 1200, approximately 1200 of it was donated by one employee who was, who resigned under first transit, but now is an employee under the county. And again, he could verify that he donated $1,200. Sure. So, but what's the holdup then? So moving forward, I think we, our big ask is that this bank be administered through HR. Now, if there's additional communication that needs to take place, if they have additional documentation that they can provide us, we're certainly uh, able to look at that. And, and if, if we concur and agree, then absolutely we'll add those hours uh, to the 304 that we have verified. But I think the biggest thing for us is that this bank be administered through uh, human resources. So is the hold up that it's oh, it'll only be the people that participated previously are eligible for the hours or? No. Only the, I'm sorry, go sorry. ahead, go ahead. I think actually given the revised recommendation from management, we're more or less in agreement with the exception of the management's proposal is more specific and clearly states that it's only going to be those hours that can be verified and it will be administered and maintained by HR until those hours are exhausted then all of those employees will be eligible to go into the county sick leave pool. All right, mm -hmm. so, so are, are you good with that? I mean, is that uh, I'm good other than the fact that they only verified 300 some hours. Uh, you know, that, that doesn't seem to be the union's fault. It seems to be someone else's fault on the management side. I don't well, know. Well, so at, at this point, Mike, we shouldn't be at an impasse without the hours not verified. I mean, they're if not we in can't. the air. So, I mean, Excuse me, Christian. You, you, you're saying that the employee is stating it. Where do we have it documented? So when the sick leave bank was utilized under first transit, the union would simply submit a name to management through an email and say they need 40 hours. And then we would get an email back from first transit management that would say, okay, it's been deducted, here's the balance. And so, so you have no, but, but do you, I, I think what the comp, my colleagues were asking, do you have verification of that? You said it was sent in an email and it was returned in an email. Do you I, have I can provide email? emails. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll have to get them well, printed out and provide showing the balance when it was first transit management. Well, well that would be beneficial to resolve this today if we had and that. Commissioner, n not to interrupt, I'm sorry. No, you're We've fine. actually utilized it since the county has been here and the balance was listed in the emails through the existing management and they never disputed those balances. Robert, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I guess my question would be, depending on, on how close to when the contract ended with, with First Transit, uh, did we have a, an email or something like that? You know, I mean, is it, you know, I can't find the last 10 emails, but here's the one from before, you know, I'm not saying that's right. happening, but you know, um, and, and then I'd say what number have we been working off of in, in the last, what, five years? Commissioner, I can't answer that question. I don't know what number they've been working off of. I know the most recent request was for 720 hours to one employee who's been here less than a year. I, we've, only, we've only been able to verify 304. Again, I think the important thing of this article is how we move forward with administration coming out of county's human resources, following county's policies and procedures we need to have, that's the biggest thing for me. We can talk about uh, have the amount of hours, we can continue to look at additional documentation, and if we verify additional docu documentation, we can add that number of hours to the 304. And so I think that, but I think the biggest portion is it needs to be administered by human resources. That's the, that's the main thing of this article. And I, I think the, the concern is that in order to be eligible to participate and use that bank, it has to be from an employee who donated hours. And if the county, if HR can't verify that someone actually previously donated hours, then how do you determine who's eligible? And, and that's similar to what we have in place right now, correct? Yes. You, you only participate if that's you've also donated. That's yes. Right. Yes. Um, so what happened with the, the person that wanted the, we denied that, I guess? Okay. 
Um, is there a discrepancy on how much has been used? I mean, is that part of the discrepancy on how many hours are left? Yes, that, that, that's a discrepancy. Okay. Because we're, we're trying to, we're, we're looking at every piece of paper. We have the forms that employees have signed when they donated. Uh, so we're looking at, looking at everything. If, if uh, the ATU has additional documentation, send it to us. All right. So uh, it, it sounds like we, we've even put in here a little wiggle room to say that it, it's based on what's verified, right? So, um, you know, we're not setting a, the number today. We're just setting the process. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner, uh, obviously, uh, if I had known prior to this that this was going to be a concern, I would have provided the documentation. I would have had it ready. But I did not know that that was the concern of the county. Well, I, again, but that's the thing, is, is that I don't think that the way it's worded is that it's, it's asking us to, to set that number today. Can I make a comment real quick? Mr. Lowry, it's not just an email that has to be verified. It has to be deducted on the time card. It's a two process thing that can be audited. So you can't just produce an email. The email is one piece. The time card verification, the deduction is the proof. That's how it works. Well, Mike, I'm not going to support that because well, we've been cleaning yeah. up messes uh, in prior administration, prior human resources. Uh, if I err, I'm going to err on the side of an employee. Uh, with time cards, I mean, maybe we need to clean up all, but we have very liberal and generous leave policy uh, across this county. Uh, and if they can prove it and put it in an email, that's proof enough to move on. I'm not going to let that stop us from impassing. I, I do hear what staff is saying, how we're going to operate in the future. Uh, we're gonna, that's how we're going to operate in the future. I can't keep looking back in the rearview mirror about what previous staff did. Uh, the reality of it is we clean up a lot of messes and we, we fix a lot of things that cost a lot of money. Um, this dollar amount, Wes, I don't know what this dollar amount is. That's uh, the 1,700 hours. I mean, what's the value of, of, that, of those hours? It would depend on what, what hourly rate yeah. the employee makes. So, so, Mike, to me, I mean, and then I'll give it to, back to Robert. You know, it has to be verified in order for me, me to support it. And one of the things we said when we brought, and I think Commissioner Barry and I were the only two here, when we brought ECAT in, you know, there are some benefits to being private. There are some benefits to being public. But once you became public, everybody's going to go by the same rules. And that's important. Uh, you you got, you got to take the good with the bad if you're going to come in. You know, and that was the majority of your union wanted um, us to bring ECAT in-house to be have equity and parity. And we brought you in. Uh, and unfortunately, it's been a slow delay to putting everybody on the same uh, human resources. And so for me, anything that I'm going to support is going to be supported that everybody in the county is treated equally. Yep. Right. No, I, I agree. So I, again, we're not looking to, to vote on the set the hours. Uh, that'll be something that gets worked out anyway. Uh, but for the, as for the process, I agree with it. Hey, let me just answer your question. If it's a $20 an hour employee, that's like $35,000. So, I mean, we're not, I mean, it's significant, but we're not talking hundreds of thousands. Of, Oh yeah, we, we yeah. yeah. I can talk about a lot of other mistakes that cost more than thirty-five thousand. Right. Yeah, we can start listening. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But I, w I would say this too: when, when people donate hours, you know, I always say I, just, I go just to what Commissioner May said: do the math, because you're not really just donating hours; you're donating money. That's what you're donating. So that's that's one concern I have about employees donating hours. Well, you can bring a policy back, Wes, well, and I'll support. We'll stop donating hours. I mean, uniformly. I mean, that's. Quite frankly, the, the, what, what, what private sector do you donate hours? You know, we want to be treated like the private sector. We want to be paid. We want to give raises. I mean, I, I think that we, we have some failed policies, which is not a part of this conversation. Uh, but we've tried to have pay raises and bring people up. So I, I agree with you, Wes. Commissioner Beer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, what, whatever the hours, you know, whatever hours can be agreed to is fine. I mean, the county certainly needs to administer the certainly needs, needs to administer the pool. Um, I don't have any other issue with the, the county proposals on the uh, uh, on the items, the way that the way that management presented them, and if there's uh, if there's an ability to to document that um, that management's happy with or that that seems you know that seems sufficient, then establishing whatever hours are in place going forward is fine. But I think the county HR needs to administer the pool as they do the other as they do the other pools. And the bulletin board portion, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't know how well our own bulletin board is maintained, so I don't know how much value, I don't know how much value they really have, but if they want to maintain a billboard, I don't, I don't see a, I don't see a harm in it. I mean, it's not, 
Um, it's not an additional liability. It's certainly not a cost to the county. So if they want to maintain a billboard, I don't see the harm in it. Thank you, Commissioner Barry. And I probably would add it, uh, at least an addendum that they can have that bulletin board if they keep your picture on it. Or, uh, yeah. Well, uh, maybe maybe my picture. I don't know. A, birth, a birthday picture. A birthday picture. A birthday picture. And a birthday suit. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. yeah. A, it, it is a it is yeah. it is a happy birthday. Is this how you envision spending your spending your birthday? <laughs> I'm just excited. <laughs> Actually having peanuts for breakfast. Um, so Mike, in any good negotiation, it starts there and it ends here. Uh, you've heard our position of our staff. You I think you know the position of the board, uh, and the recommendations. Has, has there been anything that prohibits you from saying taking this back to your board to get this ratified? So, Commissioner, the three articles, I think it was stated by Ms. Rogers, uh, those three articles are, once you make your ruling, those articles are set in stone for, I think, a year uh, under the PERC rule. I think you might want to refer this question to her because the the collective bargaining agreement, the other articles that have been negotiated that are under a TA, tentative agreement right now, those will be recommended by the union as required under PERC. Well, I think, you know, the impasse of, uh, Mike, of what I was hearing from you is obviously the hours, and I think that the board has sufficiently addressed that. It sufficiently addressed um, the bulletin board. I mean, there was always, I think, you know, the amount of hours that could be leave in the, in the union leave pool. And I, I guess that 120 is a number that the union is happy with. Well, I think in my presentation, we were wanting the language from the special magistrate, which would allow employees of their choice to donate to the union leave pool up to 120 hours, uh, additional to the 120 that the county is providing. Uh, just kind of like a sick leave bank, it's up to the employee. They, they may choose to, they may choose not to. But was, that was the position of, of administration that that was not in the best interest of the county. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to figure out so, what, so what, the, what was problematic about that. So when, well, there's several things problematic about it. So all of your other unions, all, they, they function very well with 120 hours. Most of them don't even get close to 120 hours uh, in a year's time. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, you know, we had that. I, I had agreed to it. I didn't like it, but I agreed to it in, in, a, in a good faith effort to get a contract ratified. The, the contract was rejected. It was not ratified. So I'm bringing it back down to 120 to be consistent with the other bargaining units. That's what they use. They don't even get close to that amount. I think 120 is more than enough. And, I, and you know, when, you, there, when there becomes pressure, hey, donate to this, donate to this. And again, they're not donating hours. They're donating money. That's what it is. It's money. I don't. I don't see the need for any more than 120 hours. No other union use, gets close to 120 hours, and I think it's plenty sufficient. So, Mike, why, if all the other bargaining units uh, are using 120 and they're not even using those hours, why would you need more than 120? I mean, is there are there issues that we don't see? I mean, yeah, I think. Um First of all, the union represents the operational unit as well. So those 120 hours are utilized by those union officials that fall under us. Okay. So what's your, so but, compared, but excuse me. We, we don't. Excuse, we, me, excuse me. I have I'm a question. Sorry. So, and it's going to go to Wes. Wes, are the other unions that we have, uh, uh, is this, does this union represent more FT than the other unions? ATU also represents what we call the blue collar workers, the operational workers, mm -hmm. but in their CBA, there's 120 hours built into that CBA as well. So this 120 hours is not for uh, ECAT and public works or operational. They have their own contract and they have their own 120 hours. So Mike, in theory, you would have 100, uh, 240 hours in. No, the operational unit, I am, I don't fall under that collective bargaining agreement. So Who uses those 120? The shop stewards of that collective bargaining agreement. For instance, if they come to participate in labor negotiations or they have to meet a new employee for orientation, something to that effect, they would utilize those hours. But, sorry, excuse me, yeah. Rob, but you still represent them, correct? 
Correct, but I, mean, I but, but, and only to Mike, I'm just trying. To, I, I want to help you. Yeah, and, I, and I'm trying to help you, and I, I don't know if I have any help to help you. Uh, but what you're, you're saying to me, in, in one end, I represent the operational workers, so I need these additional hours. But then you said operational hours have the shop people representing them. So who's representing who? When I have to represent the operational, that is on my time, because I am not under that collective bargaining agreement. But those 120 hours are utilized by the blue collar county union officials that have been elected or shop stewards. I only fall under the collective bargaining agreement for ECAP, which is 120 hours. So my, I'll, I'll tell you what, I mean, you know, 120, you know, I would say give you 140, 150 or something like that. The problem I have with uh, letting people donate their hours, we end back up with a discrepancy between 2000 and 304 and monitoring it. And so in having people to, to donate it, I mean, if the actual hours of what you need to do your job is a little more than 120, I could understand that. I mean, but if it's trying to have, you know, 2000 hours or 3000 hours, that to me seems a little unfair. Uh, but I, I could see for me, I mean, I can't speak for anybody else. I could see doing a, a few more than 120, but it would be a challenge for me uh, to move to where people can just donate hours un unlimited. That means a guy could just probably basically so, not even come to work, right? So, Commissioner, the special magistrate only offered an additional 120 from the from the bargaining unit donated. So it would be a total of 240, which is 24 days I work a 10-hour shift. It wouldn't just be me, by the way. There are other union officials at ECAT. You have the financial secretary. Her alone would basically use the 120 in a year because she has to spend one day a month conducting the business of the financial secretary. She would, she has a 10 hour shift that would eat up the 120. It would be for the vice president. It would be for our other union official shop stewards at ECAT when they're representing for say a potential discipline hearing or a grievance or labor negotiations. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but it's not unlimited, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Well, Commissioner, well, it's kind of like lawyers; they just keep adding I, meetings I will and say hours this, and time. Commissioner, Commissioner, part of the magistrate's ruling or, or recommendation was not only to allow employees to donate an additional 120 hours, but any unused hours at the end of the year would roll, so it does, would have the potential to continuously grow. Again, 120 hours is more than sufficient for all of your collecting bargaining uh, associations, uh, CBAs. I just don't understand why it's not enough here. And, and I would also add that this is the smallest of the five bargaining units. Uh, Robert. So, Mike, we, we started talking about the operational unit and the need for, for more hours for this. How, how are the two connected? I, I'm, I'm saying, you know, you, 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 go ahead and answer. But. So, um, we just represent the operational Who's side we? of it. Excuse me? Who's we? The ATU local 1395. Okay. Um, you represent them. But, but how does increase in the leave pool for this have an impact on that? It does not. It only affects the ECAT bargaining unit. Okay. So, um, so again, I don't, I don't understand what the holdup would, would be then. So, Commissioner, again, 120 hours is approximately 12 days a year. Once the 12 days are up, our understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, we cannot have union time unpaid. I think the county's position is that. If it isn't, we might not have a problem here. So, uh, so you were given some examples of what union leave is, is used for. What, can you just recap that? So. Uh, the, go the union lead pool under PERC can only be used for the representation of, for instance, grievances, which our bargaining unit does file grievances. Uh, not, not as much under the new transit director, which is a good thing. Um, for collective bargaining, which, as you know, this has been going on since 2018. If we're limited to 12, 120 days, 12 days, I mean, excuse me, 120 hours, 12 days, that would be used up pretty quickly in uh, negotiations going forward. Uh, th that, that 120, we would basically have to save it for 
for instance, wage reopeners and uh, addressing you know, any other issues. But it uh, could be for an arbitration, if there's an arbitration. It could also be used for training. Sometimes the ATU um, provides training classes and we would have to attend a training class. You, you talked about financial book, how, bookkeeping or something like that. I, mean, uh, I thought you said someone does one, one day a month or something like that. Yeah, the, the financial secretary treasurer, she has her duties that she's obligated to perform under the Department of Labor and the IRS, obviously, providing paying taxes and paying payroll to the union or else providing the information of reports that she provide that she does quarterly taxes she does uh, at least at least 12 hours a month of union time i mean how does that stack up against the other ones do they not take it for that purpose they or? do not okay. uh and to uh the ancillary activities uh such as the duties of the financial secretary would constitute ancillary union activity that is not direct representation of the bargaining unit. That's what I was thinking. Okay. So if they came down to public forum because they just didn't like something that was going on, they could take leave to come do that? So Mike, well, y'all, if y'all were coming to public forum to challenge something, would y'all be taking, utilizing this union pool? No, that would be a violation of the PERC ruling, yeah. so we could not wow. do that. We'd have to come down on our own time. Wow. I'm sorry, Robert, go ahead. No, so uh, how often is, is uh, leave requested or granted for less than a full shift? Commissioner, what was the question? Uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, days, but I mean, it says that you can be granted leave for less than a full shift. Is that, mm -hmm. uh, is that utilized or is it just one, it's just whole days or all that's taken? Well, it's encouraged. I can, right. tell, I can tell you that, uh, but sometimes it's not done that way and winds up to be a whole day. I mean, I think the key is what Chris had mentioned a second ago is, you know, activities that are direct rep representational, you know, doing financial stuff is not direct representational. I, I, and, I, and so, again, I, and I know I sound like a broken record, but, you know, this is probably one of the smallest factions that we have under contract, and the others don't even come close to 120. Um, so I guess that's where we, we're held up on the, on the, the 120. I mean, you know, Mike, I don't think that you're going to get, I mean, if you're reading the tea leaves, I don't think you're going to get that, you know, I mean, I certainly, um, I have a passion for transit because I understand, uh, the long history of discrimination and what's happening, what transits have stood for uh, throughout America, throughout time. And so I, I certainly know that, you know, union workers need to be protected. I, I am a, a, a union supporter, uh, but obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative steward of, of taxpayer dollars as well. And so as I said earlier, you know, I don't get caught into the hour games. To me, it gets caught up into the adverse effect of the financial impact to the budget. And that's what we have to look at. Uh, how does it impact our budget in terms of you know, giving these hours uh, to you. So for me, like, you know, I, I would support, you know, additional 40 hours, you know, 140 hours to you guys, additional 50 hours or something. I can't support, you know, doubling that and giving it unlimited. But, you know, that's where I would be. But certainly, I'm, you have to find some friendly uh, support here on this board, and I don't know if you have it or not. And so that's it. Robert. Well, I mean, let me let me just ask. I mean, Mike, what would it take you to support this, at not getting 120? Uh, you know, not doing an extra 120. I mean, because we want to try to get this across the line. I so, want to get this across the line. Commissioner May wants to get this across the line. So, I mean, what would it take? So, Commissioner, I think from the union's perspective, the 120 is fine. I think the only concern that we have is when that is exhausted, which potentially could be exhausted quickly in the beginning of a of a, a physical year it could be exhausted so what's your solution if it's exhausted is we want to verify that if we have to take union time again for another for instance a grievance that we could take it at the cost at no uh no pay so 
we would take off and the union would reimburse that employee for their time. We don't have a problem with that. Meaning, but you don't have a cap on it, Mike. You're saying unlimited? No, they're asking for the 120. I'm asking him south of 120, what, what would he our, agree Commissioner, to? our biggest concern is that the 120 is fine. We're, we're concerned that the county is going to uh, take a position that, for instance, there's a, a grievance being filed and we're representing an employee and the, the pool is gone, that the county is going to say you can't conduct union business unless you use your own personal leave. And we don't think that's fair. So if that's not the case, then we're, we're, we're there. We, because the union is more than willing to reimburse the union official for representing my, my, that I, 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 Hold on, Mike, put a bit. I think that's reasonable. How can we make that work, Wes? Because I'm like, uh, Robert, I want to get this across the line. And really, it's not well, like I, this. Well, yeah, I'd love to get it across the line. I, I will say we, we gave them exactly what they asked for last time, and they didn't, and they didn't ratify it. I, again, so what's changed? Why, why is this going to be different then? So, because uh, uh, I know we're not wasting an hour of our time in this. The, uh, the administrator is not correct on one thing. The union leave, when it wasn't ratified, was not the issue. It was, a, it was other articles. There was three or four other articles that the membership was concerned with. So they're resolved now? Yeah. Those other, you said? Yeah, other? yeah. Right. So, okay. The contract as a whole was not ratified. Therefore, it was all denied. So it's terrible. all ratified now. This is the only thing that's holding us up. I mean, just, just as a reminder, the, the, the purpose of this hearing is these the wording of these three articles. I that is it. what your vote is supposed to be I, on this morning. I, I understand it very clearly, Madam Attorney, but the end result of these three articles is the determination of the bottom line quality of life for people I represent. And so that's what we need to resolve this. So, Mr. Chairman, can I ask one question? So. You said you only need 120 hours. If you needed to come back and ask us to add additional hours, the board could vote on that, right? It would have to be negotiated. It could not, it couldn't, yeah, we couldn't randomly sure. just say, we're gonna give you 30 more hours? Okay, well then, I got it. Mike, I have a question for you, Mr. Chairman, go, if that's go, right. Go ahead. Yes, Commissioner. It appears to me the, the direction this is gonna go, and, and it looks like 120 hours for my vote. Let me ask you this, though. Um, I think it's reasonable what we're trying to do here. You heard Commissioner May. If we, if we impose these articles as management has presented, which are very reasonable, and again, they align with what the other unions are doing. The other unions represent a lot more FTEs than you do. Will you commit to putting this to a vote of all your members at a location that's going to facilitate maximum participation? That's what I want to know. Not a Sunday afternoon, but maximum participation. We're trying to work with you, but this is the only bargaining group we've not been able to put to bed. We're trying to put it to bed. Wes has worked incredibly hard. The staff has worked incredibly hard. We're trying to do the right thing. Will you put this to a vote to, of your members at a location at a time that will allow for maximum participation? It's a very easy question. So, Commissioner, first, when you say, um, for instance- not a Sunday afternoon is special. For, for the union board, uh, I think the, the other collective bargaining agreements, some of the other ones have language in it regarding union board. Um, just like we do in our existing one. So I want to make sure when you say vacate, you're saying take it out of our labor contract. That's a, that's a nothing. Yeah. That's okay. a nothing issue to okay. anyone up here. We uh, can leave it as, in there. As far as the ratification vote, um, I, I'm not sure what you mean by a location. We utilize a union hall. Uh, we usually generally make it a, for a pretty lengthy period during that day. We've done it with your operational unit. Um, I think what he's asking, Mike, what is the voter turnout when you're voting on these, um, when you're voting on these articles? What participation do you get? 50%, 60%, 90%? It varies depending on the issue and when there's a ratification vote. When this was uh, denied, what was the, 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 the voter turnout? Um, so I don't recall the exact numbers, but there was membership there. Uh, uh, for instance, when we did a ratification vote for the wages on the ECAT employee a year or so ago, uh, we had maximum participation. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say. Okay. okay, so, so no, no, I just verified this with the attorney. Look, 
we're trying to get we're trying to get you to a point where we can get your employees the raises that we've already approved. We got to get past this hurdle, and this contract has to be ratified. That's the goal. We're working with you, as Mr. Marino s clearly stated. When we put this out there before, we gave you the 120 plus the 120 donated. Things happen, things change. We'll give you the bulletin board. That's an easy. But this language is reasonable, Mike. It matches all the other agree uh, bargaining agreements, and there should be no special dispensation for your for your bargaining group as compared to the others. Because what will they think? It created. It just. It just cascades into a lot of problems. So I'm going to be pretty firm on my vote on this, but work with us and give your men and women that raise. This is the path to the raise. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner, um, I don't control when the raise is given. That was done by the administrator. He's the one that chose not to give it to them. But I want to, that is true, sir. That is true. I, I can't give the raise. We, we approved it, but the ball was in your court, Mike. Okay, well, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, we're, we're, not, we're, 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 not, we're not going to but, keep wondering about who shot John, but uh, Mike, what we're trying to get to is a resolution into a three vote, and I'm about to call the vote because so, it's 930. And so we're trying to figure out what we, can we do, because the reason I'm willing to compromise, maybe as my colleagues are not, uh, because we've had 4% of these employees' money that's been sitting in the bank, so we've gained some interest, we've saved some money, but it's high time that we get people what they deserve. And I mean, because of some wording here, uh, people may not be putting food on the table. Eggs are going up, bread's going up, gas is going up, but we're not getting these employees their money. And we're allowing for politics to not allow for people to get their money. And so that's why I'm willing to not stand so firm. I'm willing to negotiate, but there has to be some give in these hours because you're not going to get the support from this, from this board to get it. I'm trying to lean Mike to give a reasonable and Commissioner Ben asks you what's reasonable what's the compromise and if so, you still stand to where you are it's just not going to work so I'm going to vote for you Mike yeah. but, but you're going to lose so Commissioner um, he asked about the union is required under PERC once we negotiate a contract and articles we're required to recommend that when we sign off on that so I'm a little confused of um, what, what Commissioner Burgosh is asking me we recommend the contract at ratification. I cannot control which bargaining unit employees show up to vote. That's on them, each individual. So, uh, all right, so I, it sounds like your biggest concern is that there'll be a grievance filed and you won't have any hours. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Correct, Commissioner, and we're not asking okay. for additional hours. We're asking to be able to take union time and let the union reimburse that employee for their time. Okay. But see, Mike, you've said that we got a better administration. I, I would tell you this. I would have a problem with staff if we have to exceed, you know, 120 hours of grievances because then we got a management problem. It's not a union problem. I mean, yeah, that, that's unreasonable. But so that's why I'm willing to compromise some because I don't think we're going to get there uh, with our new staff. Uh, but we, we're going in into this negotiation negatively if we think that we're going to have to go into grievances that exceed 120, 150 hours. That means that we got a management problem. I mean, be in so. addition to the other union stuff. Yeah. Um, so even with the reduced number of grievances, how does that compare to the other unions? The number of grievances, how does it compare to the other unions, even in the current state? I, I don't know the exact numbers. I would say that you probably do have more grievances coming out of this Okay. Of, of, of the union. You're going to have more grievances so, coming out of transit. Commissioner May, if and, and Mike, if this if this gets this thing across, I, I would I would offer a, a, a like a 40 hours or, or something like that to be used for grievances if all other um, hours have been used. Um, uh, is, is that a motion? And, and that would and that would be uh, donated time, like mm -hmm. like you. You got your 120. If you lose it, you got an additional week to get the grievances over there. And when you come back in a year, Mike, I just tell you, here's my commitment. Come back in a year, we renegotiate it. If that didn't work, staff have to tell me why it didn't work, and then we'll look at the numbers again. To me, that's a reasonable compromise, so, and it's not going to go any further than that. And if we don't do that, then I'm uh, going to adjourn the meeting. It was, was that 40 hours that ha would, could be donated by that members? That could be donated by members. Okay. That would, and is that, that, that would, does not roll at the end of the year. It does not roll. Don't roll at the end. Yeah, doesn't And that's per year. Per year. Yeah. Commissioner Bender, I'll support that as long as we unilaterally give it to each and every bargaining group because we cannot have you guys be carved out special. That, that creates problems. But, but, I mean, that, and that's fine, well, Jeff, but I that's mean, not a part of this that, conversation. One way or another, it's going to come that, back. That, and we have to go back fine. and negotiate. That's fine. I, I don't it's, care, it's, but that's not a part of this conversation. Like 
So if, if I can just steer everyone back, we need a motion on the wording of Articles 7, 44, and 46. Yeah, but you said we can modify it. It looks like that's what's going to happen. That's well, Christian, true, can you, but we can't right. open the Can you give us the wording with what Commissioner Bender just said so we can, uh, Commissioner Bender can make the motion? So I guess it would be under Part C with, of, of Article 7 for union leave. that mm -hmm. in the event that all union leave, the 120 hours are, are used and a grievance is, is filed, that up to 40 hours of donated time uh, may be used for the grievance process or whatever you would say that, mm -hmm. and that uh, unused hours, uh, the same thing would not be carryover. No, no carryover. Okay. All right. Is that a motion? Allison, what else do we need to do to close this meeting? So you need to either adopt or reject the wording. So um, I, or, I don't want to modify. Yeah, or modify. So, so you're modifying. Well, he just okay. modified. So of the, this is of the one article. Seven. So you have three articles. So you've got the union leave, you've got the bulletin boards, and you've got the sick leave pool. So you're either adopting the language presented to you by either side or you're modifying. So it sounds like you're it just sort of sounds like your discussion. You're adopting management's recommendation with regards to the sick leave pool based on the caveat that there's going to have to be verification. It sounds like you're modifying the union leave pool article and it, you are going with the union's uh, perspective on the bulletin board. Yep, let's go. That, that appears to be where the is board the is motion? headed, but I need a motion and a vote. Yes. So my motion would be to adopt the, uh, the bulletin board as. Uh, I don't, we didn't get it presented, but uh, as it stands, uh, to, to adopt the sick uh, pool as presented by management and to uh, adopt Article 7 union leave as amended. All right, that's a motion. Well, I'll pass the gavel in a second. second. Right, we have a second. Please vote. Uh, wait, discussion, please. Oh, Mr. Chair. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Look, I want to support that, but I didn't hear in your motion that this would be reciprocally provided to our other bargaining group. Is that, is but, but, but that's just out of protocol, Jim. We, Jeff, I think we'll all support you on that okay. you know, formally. I'll but, support you on that, but I, 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 but it's okay, I got th I, okay, be, I've got three for it's support. It's got to be negotiated. But that you has to be negotiated, it. and that is a, well, not something we can cope with can't unilaterally during this do it, hearing. But for this purpose, uh, the yeah, other contracts yeah, are already I'd signed. I'd give it to the other ones. I'd give it to the other okay, ones. Okay, you, you would agree to do yeah, that if they want it. Okay, it all right, all right, right. Well, and, and, right and, and Jeff, here's the reality of it. All these contracts are for a year, and we're going to have to come back in a year and talk about theirs and talk about everybody else's. And so you know what? Maybe this worked, maybe it doesn't work. You know, I've been, I'm willing to lose one week of pay uh, to see what works and what doesn't work when we come back and negotiate. As long as we'll else. offer it to every other union, then I'm when, fine with it. All right. When, when, whenever you bring the contract back. Mr. Chairman. I, I think we complicated this more than we needed to. Uh, it's a punch in the gut to the unions. Um, I like to negotiate, but Mr. Lowry, you should play by the same rules the other unions do. Uh, you could have got your people a raise. You probably will. But I don't like to be bullied, and I won't be voting for it. Well, I believe in Billy in the face first, so I'm not going to be bullied by anybody. But there, there is a motion yeah, in, in and, a second. And, and, Mike, I hear what you're saying. Believe me, I wanted to go just as it was. But sometimes it, you just don't get the three votes you don't get there. And I think for the greater good, Mike, before I make my vote to approve this, holding my nose and gagging, are you going to, are you going to go out there and advocate to your members to get this over the line, get the raise, you got some extra hours. Are you going to work, before I vote, are you going to work to make sure this gets ratified? Are you going to give it your all? You're, you're looking at the negotiating team. I'm looking at we're, you, but I'm at, I we're going to we're going to recommend it. Yes. Okay, you're going to recommend it. Okay. All right. We have to by law. All right. Good. Well, of course, well, well, we're well, going to. Well, well there's the law, is, and there's what, as a practical matter, what you're going to do, Commissioner. We're going to recommend it okay. to the to every bargaining unit employee that shows up to cast their vote. We'll we'll recommend it, obviously. I could care less if you recommended it. I mean, what I, I care about is that those people that have not gotten their 4% raise realize that we made a good faith effort today to help. And, you know, I would say to my colleagues, you know, it hadn't been convoluted. I mean, there's, the only thing we did was Robert, I think, made a good 
faith effort than at an additional 40 hours. And I can just tell you what, we spent more money on staff time than those 40 hours are worth for money today sitting in this room. We spent more money right now than all 40 of those hours of wasting uh, employees' time. So, I mean, it's called common sense politics. You know, I mean, sometimes in a lawsuit, you have a nuisance case. That's common sense. They get 40 hours to move on with the county's business. So we have, excuse me, we got a motion and a second on the floor. Well, I'm sure that we probably could say those 40 hours get this system fixed. Uh, we have four in favor. Uh, any opposed? One opposed. Commit for the record, Commissioner Fuller opposes. This meeting stands adjourned. Go. <laughs> uh, we can't make for the Welcome to the Gary Sansing Public Forum. Um, public Forum is limited to items that are not on the agenda. If there is an item on the agenda, you will be pushed back to the agenda. 
Uh, we're sorry for the delay, but we had a, a long meeting, so uh, we are very pushed for time and uh, today, uh, so we apologize. So I expect first speaker will be Matt Trinka. I don't know if I pronounced your last name correctly, Matt. Just please state your name for the record. Okay. Your name and address, I'm sorry. Say name again. and address for the record. Uh, Matt Trenka, 3754 Weatherstone. Yes, sir. Pensacola, Florida. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners. I wanted to bring to your attention uh, how overly lenient the special magistrate is for the county's code enforcement. Currently, the special magistrate for code enforcement routinely reduces and eliminates fines. One example just last week was $20,000 to zero. I understand the intent of the special magistrate to evaluate circumstances. I cannot imagine a circumstances where a $20,000 fine would be reduced to zero and justified. At first glance, we might expect the special magistrate to be empathetic or even sympathetic. However, it's not free and it comes at a cost and overlooks every honest taxpaying property owner in the county. Some of these code enforcement cases take weeks, months, and even years to rectify. Meanwhile, the neighbor, neighbors of the offender have to bear the brunt of their irresponsible neighbor in the form of lower property values and reduced quality of life. Keep in mind, to even get to a special magistrate, a citizen already took the time to report it. Code enforcement had already conducted an investigation, in some cases, multiple investigations and inspections to validate the claim and the offenders are given multiple opportunities to work with those officers directly to get this corrected uh, long before it ever gets to that special magistrate. Uh, this continued reduction in fines is causing areas in the county to become more run down and disproportionately favors the offenders and forces the hundreds of thousands of taxpaying property owners in the county to subsidize their behavior. Finally, I'd like the commissioners to review the special magistrate process for code enforcement pro and their processes Matt, and look into actions that down, can Matt, be taken to return the credibility of special magistrate and hold the negligent and absent property owners accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Sharon Cummins. No, please, please, no applause. Sharon, please. Good morning. Um, I've been here before and I, I'm going to short give a Reader's Digest version of my complaints because I've worked on it for over almost two months getting passed around from commissioner to different agencies and passed the buck until one lady took, took an interest in it and got number one, illegal dumping, number two, illegal burning. I've taken pictures, uh, Ms. Gloria is going to have them to show you. They ignored that, I've reported it in a year, not less than two years. They've burned and burned and no, there's no privacy between me and where they put their place. And my question is, are they required to fence that as they told us when they first moved in? Because there's nothing there. All I see is dirt, now the concrete crusher and uh, all stuff, big, big heavy equipment driving around and dump trucks bang, bang, banging all the time. So I need some privacy and safety to keep us between it, from each other because I don't know those people that come and go out of there all the time. Okay. I'd just like an answer to that. And look at the right. evidence. It'll back me up what I've been putting up with for going on two years. Thank you, Ms. Sharon. I, I think Mr. Tim Dale will talk to you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker will be Gloria Horning. All right, these uh, Gloria Horning 310 um, South to Villers. Happy birthday, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm just taken back by this, and I went back and looked at all the articles about concrete crushing sites and the Delta one. Um, the location is directly next to people age 55 and up, two miles away from Wedgwood, where it faced environmental consequences of concrete crushing and landfills. In the wake of the concrete crushing recycling Wedgwood area, the county passed stricter standards for approving new concrete crushing sites. 
Now, let's get to they're not a good neighbor already. Here's burning. FDEP's been out there two times already. Think of Cool Hand Luke. What we have here, gentlemen, is a failure to regulate. And we've done it for years. Look at Wedgwood, 17 violations for seven consecutive years, and the board did nothing until it came uh, just blatant that uh, it was environmental racism. Um, he's been warned about this illegal dumping. Warned, nothing else. Look at that stuff in the background. That is a dump site, a, a C and D dump site, to tell you the truth. Um, oh, that's the good place. Um, FDEP gave him two weeks to clean it up, two weeks is done. So you don't have a good neighbor. You don't have one that wants to work with the neighbors. And this woman, she lives less than 50 feet from this. And yes, Mr. Jones, there is a fencing rule. You must not be able to see any landfill, concrete crushing site from your home. So they've got to do some stuff here to help these people. And this woman's home is going to crack. And you know what? Gloria, I your time's up. I'm sorry. Well. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. Right. Um, sorry. Is uh, this is this about the scheduling of a public hearing of the Delta contractors? No, sir. Yeah. This is about the one that you passed to have this temporary concrete crushing okay. site no, right. no next to brand okay. to okay. homes thanks. of the elderly. Thanks, thanks, Glory. Our next but week, let's believe in science. That's your yeah. words I from believe, the Delta well, Concrete. Our next week will be site. Will Jankowski. Thanks, Gloria. I'm William Jankowski, 5005 Lionel Street. This is a concern of 1205 Poppy Avenue in District 2. We purchased, uh, Mariah Holdings purchased uh, last year this property. We've applied for permits. There is a um, mother-in-law quarters built in 1955. I believe the house was built in 1947. On that case, we only wanted to do repairs. This is for investment property. It's a two bedroom, one bath, kitchen and laundry. Um, it does have an FLP meter directed to the house. It also has a septic tank. We're being told that we cannot um, upgrade this dwelling and it cannot be livable. I feel it needs to be grandfathered in. Been speaking about this for about a month. We've been uh, declined for permits back there to make it nice. If this isn't approved and we cannot pull permits, I myself and other people will lose about $150,000 to $200,000. I'm only making the neighborhood better. It's not always about money. But in that district, we are trying to make it look better. There's a house two doors down from us that has comped at about $200,000. We're gonna be about 400 to 425,000. All I wanna do is get a permit. I don't wanna tear out down the house. It's been there for years. So I don't understand why I cannot pull a permit and I can't make it a live-in dwelling. Thank you. Thanks, we'll just see Tim Day over there or our building inspection office. Uh, Chris Kerr. Good morning, uh, Chris Kerr with Flood Defenders. Um, how y'all doing today? Um, this past week, I uh, uh, had a, a couple of flood risk focus groups that uh, Santa Rosa County put on in, in uh, Navarre and Gulf Breeze. And the reason I bring that up is what was mentioned at, uh, at that meeting is Florida Legislation 380.093, Resilience Flood Grant Program which is funding them to do a vulnerability assessment and part of that vulnerability assessment is having focus groups. Uh, public interaction uh, as relates to current flood risk and, and basically what was said at those meetings is our flooding is increasing and uh, we're expecting it to get worse with climate change and sea level rise. Um, the nice thing about it, it, it is uh, the legislation is something that the uh, American Flood Coalition has pushed in the last couple of years. Um, Y'all actually have a couple of grants uh, that that uh, are on your agenda uh, that come out of the uh, this Florida uh, statute 380.093, but uh, that was in 21 and 22 that these two different uh, 
House Bill, I think it was 753, and then Senate Bill 1954, which is pushing $100 million a year through DEP so y'all can get grants. Uh, point being is uh, I'm encouraged to see y'all have some grants coming up through this, this grant program. But I'm also discouraged that some of the uh, projects that, uh, like in Beach Haven Northwest Zone, is not getting funded. But uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Jerry Price. Have some, have some pictures here for each of you. Um, I don't see the officer. Um, the pic oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. The pictures that I have, there's just two of them. And I'm speaking to the, all the board members here, um, but mainly to Mr. Kohler, because he's in my district, and, and this is in my district, and this is in my district. You've got a great organization called Whataburger. And you got the homeless, and they come in, and they raid the dumpster, and they leave this trash. I go pick it up. I'm one of the people that tries to be responsible. And I don't come here to criticize anybody. I come to ask for, for help. You guys got some very smart people up here. And been coming for 15 months trying to get something done. It's a long time, guys. It's a long time. Need some action. Need an ordinance that works on camping. And um, I don't know what you can do, but anything you do will help. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. Dale Willis. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Good morning. My name is Dale Wheelis. I reside at 8251 Ridgefield Road in District 4. Uh, we seem to have a theme going here this morning, and I'm here to talk about litter. <laughs> litter is rampant. In the area I live on off of Olive Road near North 9th, there is a median of grass heading south towards uh, Beauterre. That median right now, the grass and the weeds are about calf high, and it's filled with litter. Sometime next week, I predict, the county road maintenance crews are gonna bring their mowers, and they're gonna shred that litter and scatter it all over the road. Paper, plastic, aluminum, crushed bottles. I can tell you from experience, it's much easier to pick that up before it's mowed than it is afterwards. I would ask you to think about that. And I know I've often been given the excuse that there's no resources to pick it up. I don't agree. If the county doesn't have resources, the community does. Your estuary program does a great job in uh, gathering resources, volunteers. I volunteered in that project. And I know something can be done. The other issue I have is today, <laughs> ironically, I saw the first do not litter sign I can find in this county. And that's at, it's at the exit of I-110 and Garden Street. That's the only one I can find. Please do something about litter. Mr. Wheelis, sorry. What was the, where's that portion? Um, okay, so where uh, North 9th comes down to Olive? Yep. Uh, just south of that intersection. So on 9th Avenue? On 9th Avenue. Okay. Bonterre. All right, so, so my aide is right over here. That's Angela. Huh? 
and Mr. Alex Smith from the city. I think that might be in the city also. He's here too. Okay. So if we get them together, I think we can get something taken care of. I think they usually do try to pick it up before they mow. So I wish they would, sir. But I, I agree. I, I have agree. seen them do it. So, but we'll also reach out to the state because that's a state road. Uh, but okay. uh, if if you they'll well, get the information, we'll pass it along. So if we, I may say, yes, last sir. year I I called the commissioner's office. I spoke to a woman about this problem. I sent her an email about the issue. She responded and said that it would be picked up before it was mowed. It was not. Okay. She also said that she would look into getting signs. I I told you where I can find a sign. Sure. That's that's her right there. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Teresa Blackwell. Good morning, Teresa Blackwell, Beulah. My apologies, my apologies Commissioner Bergosh. Um, point of order, the staff recommendation today on hiring Sigma is incorrect, it has erroneous information in it, and that is not right. That is false information to the commissioners, as well as to the public, as well as was in PNJ this morning. It says 21, that they got 21 responses to the solicitation and that Sigma was the winner. That's not true. Sigma was the only bidder. So this is, once again, would be a sole source procurement. So, yes, that's true. You can ask David Miller, who is the uh, project manager in purchasing, there was one bid, one bid. Why would there be 21 all of a sudden when we've gotten one? Um, my other subject is OLF8, and I'll cut to the bottom paragraph on that. It's time we get off the fence on April 6th and move forward with the best offer. There may be new ones, but we have a good one now. If we dally, they may well drop out and go somewhere else where they can find partners who know a good deal when they see it and will move decisively to close it. Um, and I'll go as far as I can on this. Um, uh, the one from the Breland is a, from a company that has experience with creating big, successful mixed-use projects in the style of our OLF8 master plan. Experience is often undervalued. But in terms of efficiency and a positive outcome, it is priceless. As Bent Fleigeberg and Dan Gardner wrote in How Big Things Get Done, the more experience we have in doing some, something, the better we get at doing it. We learn from our mistakes, and with each iteration, we become quicker and better than we were the time before. Not only that, ex with experience comes intuitive knowledge about what will work oh, and, Teresa, what, will, would you go ahead and, it, please, and what will not work. If you want a successful project, pick someone who has already Thank you, been Teresa, I appreciate successful. It. Our next speaker will be Thank Brian Wire. And while he comes up, Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask Tim a question because I, I, I too saw that misprint um, of 21. And in my understanding, Tim, we've put that out multiple times in an attempt to cast a wide net. And in this last time, Teresa is correct, it was just Sigma. Is that is that? That correct. is correct. I'm that is confirming correct. it. I believe it was viewed 21 times by firms, but only one submitted. Okay, so that, so it was an honest. I mean, some it was viewed 21 times, but only one. Okay. No. So, very briefly speaking of that, I, I don't even like the viewed part being included because that's just has no. The, I'm not <laughs> speaking to this item at all on the agenda, but I know I've shared this with Wes and and you know multiple times in the past. The how many times the things are viewed, I just I don't see a lot of value in that. I mean, I you know, I mean. It, it, it depends. I mean, it, it's one thing to put effort into making a making an offer. It's another thing to download a package. I, I just I don't. I think that's a, a core part of the problem with the procurement system that we've had for years with the vendor registry. I just I, I don't I don't like that. I know that's not what we're doing going forward, and it takes time to unwind these things. But I've been so unhappy with that for years, and I'm glad that that's not going to be a part of our process. It's changing pretty today, soon. So it's been correct. It's been correct. It's you're, you're voting to change it today. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, I mean, who cares about the views? Um, next speaker will be Brian Wire. 
Good morning, Commissioners. Happy birthday, Commissioner May. Thank you, Brian. I just want to provide a few updates for you. We had our How to Do Work With Your Business on uh, March the 8th. We had 28 people there. It was a full room of people. It was probably the most sincere, transparent, engaging meeting that we've had in a while, where the actual businesses explained to us the challenges that they've been having, their frustrations. It was a very powerful meeting, and I want to thank some folks for doing that. Lindsay Stevens did a wonderful job with purchasing along with Brian Hughes. A Tammy Plant and uh, Hannah Alvarez from the clerk's office was there. So other offices came to that meeting to help gain some knowledge and, and build some relationship with the businesses attending the meeting. So thank you so much, Hannah, for being there, Tammy Plant, Lindsley, and Brian. Uh, Deidre from the city put it on, and we had Bob from the ECA to meet there as well. Yesterday, we had our free vendor open house rib ribbon cutting. Uh, it was a great chance to get a chance to see some of the improvements in the purchasing office, some new floorings, new excitement. Uh, and I do want to share a story with you. Dana McDonald from Cast Tech, a paving company. She's a female-owned business. She was there, and she informally met BNP Construction, Anthony Powell. He's a, a black-owned landscaping and concrete business. Dana was actually finding people to do concrete work outside of the area, as far as parts now Alabama and outside of our region. She talked with Anthony. Anthony does concrete work. They built a relationship together at, at that meeting, where now they're going to do work together and keep the money in our local community and local environment. That's the power of having workshops, the power of having open vendor meetings to have people meet and build connections. I also want to thank Andy from Communication. She was there. She did a great job taking photos and videos for us. And I uh, really am excited to see that we have some things going on in the purchasing office to really help out. Kind of the three Ps to me. To have, people have pride in their work. They're excited about being there. They have a full team of staff in place now. And um, also the processes. I truly think that if we do vote to have the improvement made in the, in the software, it's going to help us out. There are some frustrations that many of us have had with vendor registry in the past, and an improvement in the process would help us to ensure this. Me and uh, Jeffrey attended the metrics meeting together. I did not know all the challenges Jeffrey would take to put the metrics together for me, hours and hours of work. And I think this new software will help that out. Thank you, Commissioners. Good. Thank you, Mr. Wire. Our next speaker will be Steve Campbell. I want to speak to the uh, selection of um, the developer for OLF 8. And the first thing I would say would be anybody but D.R. Horton, but somebody who has a good reputation and can give the most bang for the buck, and let's act on this and get this show on the road. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Cecily, Cecily Campbell, Ms. Campbell. Cece, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Cecilia Campbell, and um, I live at 5965 Frank Reader Road in Beulah. Y'all have seen me before. Um, we kept thinking this is going to be the last time we have to come at all. Uh, my, we are very concerned about getting a, an experienced firm for them uh, to administer the master plan, and there's uh, surely you can start over again instead of spending so much more money. Um, I understand that um, uh, Commissioner Barry was not happy with the attitude of DPZ. Well, those of us who worked with them on uh, attended every charrette and meeting leading up to that, we were very pleased. And we think that uh, instead of spending that much more, that should be opened up and start start from scratch if you have to, if you only have one person. Because the last meeting we attended was when uh, Commissioner Barry said, no, we're going to table this. We're not going to do this now. And, and it looked like the rest of the commissioners were ready to go forward um, and make a decision. I think that's foolish. Um, especially since uh, DPZ has got so much experience and we, um, we are very also very pleased with, we were very pleased and we're hoping that, that you, know, you continue this path. As my husband said, anybody and anyone you've talked, anyone that you can talk to, we, I put it this way in, um, in a chat not long ago, it's like our grandchildren might be coming home to Hortonsville in Beulah. If you look around and see how many D.R. Horton subdivisions have been slapped together and all the trees piled behind a huge berm and burned on the spot, we, that's what we've witnessed across the street from us. Um, we, um, we are those people who have a very long property line 
uh, bordering OLF8, and yes, there has always been commercial beside us. That's okay. We want a place for my grandchildren and my children to come home to. And uh, thank you, Ms. Campbell. Be Your happy to live up. there in Beulah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. And Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, Ms. Campbell, thank you for coming down. Mr. Campbell, thank you for coming down. You're right. We did have the item uh, DPZ, um, and there were significant concerns about some of the issues that took place when they conducted the last master plan at Navy Federal. Um, I was willing to move forward, but I did not have the support necessary. Right, that's, but, that's but, but, but I'm not going to look. Here's the way this works. Mm -hmm. You don't get anything done up here unless you have three votes. So right. I was willing, and I and I tabled it. I'm the one who tabled it. I pulled it back. I realized we didn't have the votes. You can go back and watch the tape. Um, but this is something that I committed to. So we've put it out to bid multiple times, as you heard us say. We can't. We can lead the horse to water. We can't make them drink it. DPZ voluntarily withdrew their application. So I've got several emails. There's obviously something going on. Someone said, send them an email. We can't make them come and bid. They didn't okay. bid. Did they come out with a good product for OLF-8? I believe they did. Was I happy with the way they oper operated? No, I was not. It was very unprofessional. Some of the things they said about my counterparts and me, frankly. But I got over it. Here's the thing. We have the opportunity to move forward today. It will cost more because this company does not have the economy of scale that DPZ had. But this is an important thing for Beulah. You've lived out there a long time, just like I have, almost 20 years. We needed this thing 20 years ago. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forcefully push for this today. It's a campaign promise. We've got the money from Restore Act, which is not taxpayer money. That's oil spill money. We're going to do a good thing in Beulah with it. But I want everyone to know, we didn't tell DPZ no, they couldn't bid. They came back and rebid, uh, and they didn't come back this last time. And Sigma did, and they won the bid. They were the only bidder. Thank you, CC. George Levy. Morning, Commissioners. Good morning, uh, George. I'm George Levy, um, Sweetheart Lane. Uh, I have uh, for somebody uh, copy of my spiel. Anyway, um, I have three items. One is. Um, uh, on this OLF-8, I've had a concern about rainfall and drainage. I hope when they do the design and approvals, they uh, consider a conservative value because it's easier to put in the pipe than replace it. Uh, big item, uh, something new, is uh, house insurance. Everybody's affected by the cost of house insurance, everyone in the room, um, and even if you rent. But the bottom line is I got a house insurance bill uh, the other day, and on there was this code called VCEG, Building Code Effectiveness Guide. And Escambia County is rated four on a scale of one to 10, four is 65 to 76% effective. Okay, and that affects everybody's insurance rates. There's there's other counties and uh, in cities in Florida that have much higher, have ones. Why we're only 65 percent is beyond me. Um, it affects everything. Uh, also, um, homes are, if homes are not properly built, uh, okay, uh, shingles fall off, blow off in a storm, a dresser comes, they, they make a homeowner, and they look at the shingles and it's supposed to, the shingle's supposed to have six nail holes and there's only two, guess what? The insurance company's not c covering it. And that's substandard. And why are building codes are not properly implemented, the inspections are not properly done, is beyond me. It affects everybody in the room and everyone in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, that concludes our, I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought that was it. Uh, Ayers Baines. Good morning. Ayers Baines, 6913 North 9th Avenue. I'm here this morning to introduce and my concerns about the disparities of the employment opportunities for the elderly. I'm the job counselor for the National Caucus and Center on the Black Aging in CBA. 
<coughs> excuse me, is Scammy County NCBA believes that older adults, regardless of race, ethnicity, or status, are the future of our country and our local communities, and have earned the right to enjoy their golden years without fear or lack of resources. Founded in 1970, NCBA encourages the participants dedicated to aging dedicated to aging issues of the elderly. NCBA is the oldest organization dedicated to aging issues, the only organization devoted to minority and low income the elderly. It is a 5013C not for profit. The national office is in Washington, D.C. NCBA provides employment training and placement services under the Senior Community Service Employment Program which is 90% funded by the U.S. Department of Labor and 10% funded by non-federal sources. Participants or employees train up to 20 hours per week. Training may involve training at nonprofits, including faith-based organizations, senior citizens, museums. Priority is given to veterans and their qualified spouses than to individuals who are over 65 who have disabilities, have low literacy, a limited English proficiency, are homeless, or at risk for homelessness. And this is to make the commissioners aware that this is available to all the elderly in that district. I have two handouts for the yes, chairman and vice chairman in my well, business can you get those? card. Thank you, ma'am. And I would advise you to get with Mr. Wire, who's over our minority chamber back there, because he can help get that information. So Brian, if you just get with Ms. Baines uh, when she leaves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner, that concludes. Uh, I, I do want to say we had you know seven speakers on litter and, and code enforcement. Uh, I can just say whenever I call our administrator, uh, there's not never time that WIST doesn't make sure that it gets clean uh, in my uh, communication with getting him. But I would encourage code enforcement and CRA uh, to be alarmed and aware uh, that this is a priority, uh, particularly for District 3, and it seems like all other districts today. So I would just encourage code enforcement and those who are running our CRAs to recognize how critical uh, the litter and blight is in our Commissioner, if I give you a quick fun fact. Yes, sir. In 12 months period, Public Works picked up over 80,000 bags of trash. That's a lot. So we're out every day performing that task. Absolutely. And I, Wes, you've done done a great job. I mean, even before you became administrator. So I just wanted the public to be aware. I mean, <laughs> I think Wes, you and I, I call you and we pick up today and tomorrow it's dumped again. And so uh, even when people moving homeless camps and homelessness, we find that whenever we relocate them, we still have litter. And so we've done some real stings on Herman Street and uh, Tim. We're doing another one, Wes. You know the other ones are that we're going to go clean up real quick. We're concentrating on some of our parks, Lexington Terrace, Brentwood Park, a few yeah. other places. Right. So we are making a conscious effort. So thank you. Commissioner, we stand adjourned. Oh, let's go. Uh, commissioners, uh, obviously we are, you know, a probably now in 15 minutes behind, so we're going to try to aggressively uh, pursue this agenda. Board of County Commissioners regular meeting March 23rd, which is one of the greatest days in America. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, probably the greatest day. Yeah, yeah. My point. Yeah, you're doing a good job. You're doing, and as a matter of fact, you can stay after the meeting and keep singing. Uh, please turn your cell phone to the vibrate silence of the offsetting Board of County Commissioners. Now, any persons to speak regarding the item on the agenda. Uh, the invocation today will be brought by Commissioner Berry and Commissioner Bender. Will you do the pledge? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If uh, Pastor Andy Perry from Gonzales United Methodist, Methodist Church might come forward, thank you. Good morning. Let us pray. Our most good and gracious God, we thank you and praise you for the gift of this new day and for your presence with us. As we gather together as leaders of our communities in Escambia County, we ask that you would give us wisdom and discernment to lead with strength, courage, compassion, and vision. We pray that you would help us to be open to your guidance so that we might seek the betterment of the people of this community and county and for those who we serve. 
We seek you for your con we seek your continued favor and grace on everyone that is represented here today as we seek your guidance in all things. Help us not to take for granted the great trust and privilege you have bestowed upon us as county commissioners and other leaders and staff. Establish the works of our hands and bring to fulfillment all that you have given us to do this day. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Please join us to pledge our flag. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Andy, I want to thank you for coming down. It's uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate uh, a little bit of indulgence for a few seconds. Please, uh, please, take your time. It's a special time to have Andy come down. He gets to, uh, he's, he's Pastor Andy to Sloan and Jack at Gonzales Methodist. They get to, uh, they get to spend time around him, you know, four or five, six days a week, and uh, and, it, and it's a pleasure. He's, he's done a great job out there over the last year, and uh, I also want to recognize him and thank him. Uh, about 10 days ago, we had a food distribution, a uh, pretty large food distribution uh, that was put on at Gonzales Methodist, and uh, Andy was out there at six, six o'clock or before with, uh, you know, seven, eight, ten people from, uh, you know, from church out there volunteering to work and then slinging food until, you know, 11 o'clock or so, and uh, I want to recognize that. It's, it's a, you know, it doesn't get better when you see people that are that are leading organizations that are also uh, that are also working, not just uh, not just delegating. But thank you for coming down, Andy. Thank you, Commissioner Berry, and, and Pastor Andy. Thank you, uh, Sloan and Jack, Little Jack are two of my favorite people. So, uh, thank you for uh, what you do. We certainly appreciate and the food giveaways that you're doing. Um, are there any items to be added to the agenda? No, sir. Nothing for me, Commissioner Calder. Nothing for me, Mr. Chairman. No, sir. Thank you. No. Thank you. Direct that. Right here. No. No. Right. Move. <laughs> move. Move the agenda. Uh, so we have a motion. Second. Second. Please vote. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we're not all logged in yet. Can we hand vote for this can one we and just, then we will be yeah. in the system for the others? Yeah, we passed five in favor. Uh, can I get logged in or am I logged in? That passes five in favor. Uh, okay, Commissioner's form. Commissioner Bagash. Oh yes, sir. I just uh, just very briefly, I want to uh, thank Tammy Thoreau and the uh, Perdido Chamber of Commerce for um, uh, a tour they gave me last week of all their uh, businesses. It was very very helpful, and um, just appreciate the work that they're doing out there to promote those businesses uh, during spring break that that we're going through right now, and, and all the work they're doing out there to promote those businesses and generate the. Uh, TDT and local option sales tax revenue that we uh, that we thrive on. I also w would be remiss if I didn't thank staff. I mean, I have a lot of stuff going on in the district. We're on the verge of starting our second fire station that we're building, and I I certainly appreciate the engineering department, Joy Blackman, multiple issues with roads and drainage, and um, every time I reach out, they get instantaneously um, looked at. They can't always fix it, but I just appreciate the dedication. The other day we had a, a hole erupt in, in a neighborhood. I, I sent an email and just like that, the staff was out there and fixed it. In fact, we got a really glowing email from the citizen who couldn't believe how quickly the staff um, responded. And I just want to take a moment to say that's the experience that I've had since I've been on this board for the last six and a half years. We have amazing employees that work here. Um, and I know we, we take a lot of criticism up here and that's fine, but I just want the citizens to know the people that work for this county are fantastic. They do great work. So I want to thank Joy Blackman. I want to thank Chris Phillips. I've got three very challenging traffic issues. District one's very large now, lots of issues. And immediately, whenever I send them an email, um, it's an immediate response, even on the weekends. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Other organizations, you don't hear from people on the weekends, right? Um, but I'm 24 seven. So uh, when I reach out to Wes, he always answers the phone, even when I have to sometimes call him on the weekend. I appreciate that. So I just want to always make sure I take the opportunity to manage up the hardworking staff that, uh, that makes this county go. And I appreciate your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Calder. Yes, yeah, thanks, uh, Commissioner Berry. I want to echo what uh, Commissioner Bergos just said. And I want to highlight a couple things and uh, I won't take too long, but uh, Mike Rhodes um, recently has been doing some nice things on Lexington Terrace, but he did something that uh, butted up to uh, me and uh, Chairman May's district in Mayfair. And it's the little things that matter. All they really wanted was a neighborhood sign, a bench, and their pavilion cleaned. And the community came together and was just so happy. And I appreciate you for doing that, Max. I mean, Mike, 
And as far as Max and the people working with Claire, Sherry, and them that go to all these uh, neighborhood meetings and talk to the people, it matters. I see some people from Warrington Revitalization out there, from Beach Haven to Brank, uh, Brownsville. I go to all these. I see it. It's starting to matter. People know that you care, and it really does. It's adding up. Robert Turpin, thank you for the boat ride the other day. Um, even though I saw too many derelict vessels, I, I, I appreciate what you're doing. Rob, thanks for going out to Bob Grande the other night. I got three emails thanking you for going out and presenting that um, drainage um, program, uh, project to them. Today we've talked a lot about litter, and I want to just highlight some things. I ran about cleaning this up. I believe this board's committed to clean it up. But yeah, I want to highlight some of the things. Everyone talks about Warrington Middle School. My wife teaches there. We hadn't done much right by that area. Lexington Terrace had drug addicts and dope dealing going on there. Um, the Pines, it's a slumlord. They let the kids walk through trash every day. Code's been out there. It's disgusting. It needs to go away. The kids go out to play and across the street at the Sonic, there's a homeless camp. And I will tell you today that's going away. Thank you, Ronnie Rivera and SRI. I talked to the lawyers in Atlanta yesterday. It is going away, and that building will be demolished in the next month. It's taken me four months, but it is happening. So there is positive things happening. The other thing is we are putting up signs. They're going to be all over. I don't know if the other commissioners want them, but I want to thank CMR for doing that. Um, it's little things that matter. And the last thing I want to say is John Robinson, the other night, it was good to see you get a shout out at the Humane Society and how glad they are for what you do. It meant a lot to me and uh, I think they really need, we need them and uh, they need us. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Kohler, and I know you're new on the board, but that's why it's, when you talk about the Pines or Forest Creek in, in your district that becomes slumlords, that's the power of the 4% and the 9% when these developers come and want us to support them and when you will get a recommendation that it's only 37,500 that we're giving, you know, on a 20 million. So at that point, we have to begin to hold them accountable when they come to us for those. And Jeff has done a great job because that's what happens. Oakwood Terrace was once a very nice place. And I can tell you, Addis Court probably was once a nice place and Pensacola Village was once a nice place. But once those tax credits expire after 15 years, uh, the developers exit, leave it, and leave the blight to us. And so that's why we have to negotiate that deal on the front end. And that's why I'm very reluctant uh, to supporting those tax credit projects that come here uh, without the right developers. And so that's what you end up with. Because the Pines is fairly new, and I remember when it was f fairly exclusive, at, you know, uh, uh, 10, 12 years ago. I remember, well, listen, I picked children up in there, uh, and it's very dangerous at times. There's been a lot of shooting, a lot of killings, and not a lot of lights, and, you know, children are even scared uh, to be in that place, and so, uh, unfortunately, once we sign off on it, we don't have a lot of jurisdiction uh, in terms of going on private property. And so I know that I was called about all the problems at the Pines. I was so happy that you were elected, so I didn't have to go deal with it. Uh, but I'm there regularly. <laughs> yeah, but we got to get it on the front end, and it's very hard to deal on, on, on private property. Uh, Commissioner Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, our uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the family of Jaden Goins, the Pensacola Christian College student who passed away earlier this week, uh, tragically uh, with an accident on Airport Boulevard. Um, uh, that it's uh, definitely our thoughts and prayers go out to his family, but also to the college um, who's, uh, I know, hurting from this loss as well. Um, special thanks to Jamie Higdon for going to New Orleans to pick up three jet skis for Scambi County Fire and, and Pensacola Beach Public Safety. Uh, I know we've been searching for a number of years to try to get these, and, uh, and he was finally able to secure them. Uh, again, it's... Uh, He's done this with ATVs and, and trying to, to get out there and, and make sure that uh, our people have the resources they need to, to do their job properly and, and efficiently. And so um, appreciate his dedication. And then also, uh, you know, we've had a couple uh, large traffic days already on Pensacola Beach. I think we've had two or three that are over the 20,000 mark that we usually uh, mark. Uh, and so uh, special thanks to uh, our staff uh, for for helping uh, monitor that on the weekends. We've been doing that uh, uh, since we've had these large days, uh, especially with spring break going on, and, and we'll continue um, for the rest of the season right now. So uh, thank you so much. 
Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. Commissioner Baer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To recognize the, there was an event on Tuesday, Nick Simmons, I don't think Nick's here this morning, but our extension director, um, uh, the extension office hosted a luncheon on Tuesday for the 50th anniversary of National Agriculture Day, where they honored a number of the farmers from the North End. I, unfortunately, I was tied up with some, uh, some of our affairs down here uh, Tuesday morning, so I was unable to attend. But I want to thank Nick and a number of his staff for, uh, for putting that on and for attending and recognizing uh, the, farmers, uh, the farmers that put a lot of food on our plates uh, here in Escambia County, especially rural uh, North Escambia County. And uh, on, that same, on that same note, this weekend, uh, primarily on Saturday, there's a little bit of events uh, tomorrow afternoon, but primarily on Saturday is the GCA NRYO uh, Youth Livestock Event up at uh, uh, the 4-H Center off of Chalker Road, uh, close to off Highway 99, kind of in Baronet Park, North Baronet Park. Uh, it's a fantastic affair. There'll be hundreds of kids showing, showing animals out there Friday. Uh, as well as the Blue Jacket Jamboree, which is uh, going to be the Northview FFA, it's uh, you know it's, it's going to be a great event. There'll be t uh, you know tons of people out there, and a uh, really good time for families and, and those to bring little ones out there, let them see some animals, let them see some other young people that are uh, that are taking on leadership positions through uh, through 4-H, which is always uh, you know it seems to give uh, young people a, a lot of the skill sets that, that really serve them well going forward. I know we've had a number of, uh, we've had a few of those interns through our office over the last uh, eight or 10 years, and, and I believe there have been some others that have worked in different offices in the county, and the 4-H kids do a great job, and uh, Saturday would be a good example for, uh, for people to see uh, them excel in that livestock showing setting. Well, if you want to take a couple kids from District 3 out there, just stop by and pick them up. I'm sure they enjoy the livestock. Yeah. Um, so I, I certainly want to um, thank um, Commissioner uh, Bender publicly and, and Commissioner Collier. Commissioner Bender, you really are representing Escambia County at, at the state level at FAC. Uh, we thought with the absence of Commissioner Robinson, we wouldn't have that connectivity. Most of us, you know, families and jobs, that we don't have the flexibility. So we really appreciate your leadership at FAC and your leadership at NACO. Commissioner Cole, it was good to see you uh, 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 legislating. I certainly want to thank um, Kevin Brown uh, and the Northwest Florida staff for allowing for, I think, Commissioner Bender, you spoke before I spoke there, and to speak with all the uh, local staff of Pensacola State College and their efforts. And uh, Robert, it looks like in the legislation that we are faring out pretty well for Pensacola State in bringing resources uh, back to Pensacola. Um, I want to also, again, thank Pensacola Sports Association, Ray Palmer, and the Bay Center staff, Mike Capps, uh, and Wes Marino, and Wesley Hall from the county uh, for a great job uh, on the Sun Belt Tournament. Uh, it was a great tournament and brought people, and Michael Rose, I think, was involved as well from our Parks and Rec. So I really want to thank you guys uh, for making that a, a great tournament. Certainly want to send my condolences to Moses Williams, uh, Fat Boys, Sandwich Shop, and Moby. Uh, barbershop. Um, he actually filed for city council. He's a classmate of mine and unfortunately lost his life uh, a day before yesterday. So to his mother, Miss Rose, our prayers are with you and, and the entire uh, Williams family. And also to the Sinkfield family, Michelle Sinkfield, Ariel, better known as Peanut, was once again a senseless act of violence that happened at on Palafox Street and uh, another shooting of, of another young African-American male. And uh, it saddened my heart and our prayers are with that family. And uh, we petition uh, those who are carrying guns and, and doing senseless acts of violence uh, to cease it and to cease fire here in our community. So with that, Dr. Marino, do you have anything? Thank you so much. Chair, will. Um, Entertain a motion for the adoption and ratification of proclamation. So moved. Second. Please vote. We good? Okay. That passes five in favor. We appreciate it. Um, Wes. And while Wes is coming, I do this last week, and whenever you have a, a mother or a father who's extremely sick and they have crisis and they go in, I want to thank Joy 
uh, over at Baptist Hospital and Mark Faulkner uh, for personally taking time to help out with my mother this past week. And so we really appreciate uh, our front our nurses and our doctors, particularly cardiology over at Baptist Hospital. Uh, they always save lives and help families. So we certainly want to thank Baptist for their work. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank the board for all the kind words to the staff. Certainly doesn't go unappreciated. So thank you all very much. I'd like to ask our Office of Purchasing to come up, Jeffrey Lovingood and his crew. I said, uh, you know, I always say this all the time, if you don't have a good Office of Procurement, you're going to have problems. And we got a great <laughs> Office of Procurement. Uh, what a turnaround that they have en en enacted. Uh, we're driving work out the door. We're going to have a record-breaking year again for solicitations going out the door, and it's because of the hard work of this group right here that stands before you. They're energetic, they're excited, and they, ju they have just done fantastically well. And I appreciate them so much. I have a proclamation I'll read and then I'll turn it over. Whereas purchasing professionals play a significant role in the efficient and effective operations of both government and business, and whereas the Escambia County Purchasing Department is responsible for the acquisition of equipment, materials, supplies, and services vital to the operations, facilities, and infrastructure that contribute to the high quality of life for all county residents. The Office of Purchasing adds value to the procurement process by re-engineering, developing, and implementing innovative, unique, efficient, and cost-effective procurement practices. And whereas purchasing professionals are tasked with executing and implementing contracts, developing and improving tactical procurement strategies, and cultivating great working relationships, with vendors and all county departments. And whereas the public uh, procurement professionals working for Escambia County, Florida, are responsible for complying with county ordinances, state statutes, and federal regulations for purchases totaling hundreds of millions of dollars per year. And whereas during the pandemic and when otherwise called upon, government procurement professionals work in pressing conditions to meet challenges and secure materials, resources, and personal protective equipment for frontline workers contributing to the county's rapid response to the needs of its citizens. And whereas, the Skimming County Purchasing Department is a member of the National Institute for Government Procurement, the NGIP recognizes, supports, and practices the public procurement values and guiding principles of accounting ethics, impartially professionalism, service, and transparency. And whereas, it is fitting that we recognize and honor the ongoing contributions of America's Purchasing Professionals by observing Purchasing Month with the motto, Purchasing, Helping Build Better Business and Government. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County uh, hereby proclaim the month of March 2023 as Purchasing Month. Lumen J. May, Chairman, District 3, Stephen Berry, Vice Chairman, District 5, Jeff Bergas, District 1, Mike Kohler, District 2, and Robert Bender, District 4. Would you please give them a hand? I just want to take a moment to say thank you to uh, everyone. Uh, this proclamation means a lot. Uh, we have, uh, I've personally been in this procurement department for about six years now, and uh, I'm excited about the, the changes that we're moving forward with, but uh, mostly I'm just excited that other people are excited. Uh, it's not been very, uh, it's, it's not always been a great experience coming to board meetings and things like that. And for good reason, we, we needed to improve and we're working on that now. Uh, and I hope that that shows we are doing some record breaking things now, even as we've been trying to catch up. So, uh, we've got a great team though. these guys, uh, in, in fact, I am one of the least qualified people in my staff. Uh, so we have a great brain trust here of people to, uh, to make things happen. So the county is uh, well served. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you, Jeff. A picture. Picture. Picture for you folks, yeah. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Jeffrey. Commissioner May?
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have Mr. Henderson. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Berry. It's an honor to be able to present this proclamation uh, for the Fair, Federally Fair Housing Act. April 11, 2023 marks the, 20, the 55th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, commonly known as the Federal Fair Housing Act, whereas Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of dwellings because of race, color, religion, sex, family status, or national origin. To strengthen the protected classes, the Scammy County Board of County Commissioners, along with the City of Pensacola, added additional protected classes to include marital status, military status, and age to each jurisdiction local ordinance. Whereas federal and state laws, as well as city local ordinances, affirms the right of every person to have fair and equal housing. Whereas the Federal Fair Housing Act strives toward economic stability, community health, human relations in all communities to improve diversity and integration. The act goal is to support ongoing education, outreach, monitoring to raise awareness of fair housing, principle, practices, rights, and responsibilities. Whereas the Scammy County Board of County Commissioners in the city of Pensacola, through the Scammy County Human Relations Commission, enforces the Fair Housing Act to address discriminatory activity on behalf of individuals and families who have been victimized. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County proclaim April 2023 to be Fair Housing Month in Escambia County. Board of County Commissioners, Lumen May Chairman, Stephen Berry, Vice Chairman, Jeff Bagosh, District 1, Mike Kohler, District 2, Robert Bender, District 4, Al and your staff, thank you for the great work that you all do in housing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, happy birthday, by the way, as well. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all for supporting the Human Relations Commission. As you, as you well know that anyone who starts out don't have safe and affordable housing, they already start out at a deficit. And so it's very important that we bring about awareness to the community, educate those housing providers on what the laws and the rules are, and then also educate our citizens as to what their rights are. So we, we appreciate the support that you all provide. We're gonna continue. We have a lot of things that are planned for the month of April. So you'll see a lot of things out there talking about fair housing. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner May. Director Humble. Good morning. Unfortunately, we're losing uh, three different employees, but they're going to get to retire and enjoy themselves, although Lois gets to enjoy herself every day down at the library. At least I hope she does. She acts that way. Uh, whereas Lois M. Rogers McMillan has faithfully served the city of Pensacola and Escambia County for over 33 years, retiring as a librarian at Pensacola Library, and whereas Lois began her career in the fall of 1989 at the Northeast Branch with West Florida Regional Library System, in 1990 the Northeast Branch Library was renamed the Tryon Library and was relocated to 9th Avenue, Pensacola State College campus. Lois continued working at the, that Tryon location until she moved to Pensacola Branch in 1992, whereas Miss Rogers McMillan has created thousands of crafts, and provided story time to children, parents, and caregivers. She has planned and executed children's programs with up to over 300 attendees while sharing her fun-loving side by dressing up in costume to add an extra layer of entertainment. And whereas Lois received her bachelor's degree in art from the University of West Florida and her master's degree in library information science from Florida State University. And whereas Lois, a commitment and service to the youth of Escambia County, Florida has left a positive impression on many of the children that have passed through the library's doors. Many patrons have thanked her <coughs> for her th thoughtfully prepared story times and activities. Whereas Lois will be missed by all her staff and many children who have been impacted by her dedication and service to the citizens of Escambia County, Florida. Now, therefore, let it be proclaimed, Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County, Florida,
commends and congratulates Lois M. Rogers McMillan on her retirement, but it further, be it further proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners expresses its sincere appreciation to Ms. Lois M. Rogers McMillan for her 33 years of faithful, dedicated service as a county employee. Signed, Board of County Commissioners, Scambia County, Florida, uh, Lumen J. Main Chairman, uh, Stephen Berry, Vice Chairman, District 5, uh, Jeff Bergosh, District 1, Mike Kohler, District 2, Robert Bender, District 4. So, so um, just so you know, on the costumes, I mean, my personal favorite is the Tooth Fairy, which uh, black tutu, pliers, human teeth. You kind of get her. Yeah. Uh, Lois. Well, that that <laughs> yeah, was please, for Lois. Halloween. So. Yeah. Lois, Lois, do you have any words? Thank you. Thank you for your service. Do you have any comments? All right. Well, <laughs> thank you for your, fe for your festive nature. Thank so. you. Okay. Yeah, you got to have a picture, um, though. Yeah, Lois. Uh, we actually have quite a few represented yeah, from the library please. here, if they'd like to all come up. Uh, this front row is our current children's staff at the Pensacola branch. Um, there you go. Click here. Thank you, Todd. Congratulations, Lois. Commissioner Kohler. Anyone on the Red Cross board? Before I read this proclamation, I'd like to just share a few minutes of where the Red Cross came from. Um, probably most of you know, but being a nurse, I know a little bit more than the average person. Clara Barton started the Red Cross during the Civil War, which was one of our more challenging times in this country. More deaths than any other time in American history. 600,000 of our citizens killed each other in that war. Hundreds of thousands were denied freedom. And you look forward to today and you see what the Red Cross has done across the planet Earth. They literally have saved thousands of lives, taking care of all races around the globe and all, all people from different religions. It's a wonderful story for our country. So with that, I'd like to read the proclamation. Whereas March is the month of American Red Cross of Northwest Florida celebrates the humanitarian spirit of Pensacola and reaffirms the commitment to help ensure no one faces a crisis alone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whereas Claire Barton founded the organization more than 140 years ago with the mission to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergency by mobilizing the power of volunteers and generosity of donors. And whereas since 1917, the American Red Cross of Northwest Florida has helped thousands of people, providing emergency shelter, food and comfort for families displaced by tragedies. They provide help and hope to our community and exemplify simple acts of kindness in people's most difficult moments. And whereas these extraordinary individuals make a difference for fellow citizens in need by donating life-saving blood for cancer patients, accident victims, and people with life-threatening conditions, Red Cross supports the military along with their families using vital skills, the first aid, and CPR to help others survive medical emergencies and reconnect displaced individuals with their families. And whereas their support, volunteerism, and generous donations are critical to our community resilience, we hereby recognize this month of March in our honor of all of those who fill Clara Barton's noble wards. You must never think of anything except the needs and how to meet it and ask everyone to join in this commitment. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Scambia County, Florida, proclaim March 2023 to be Red Cross Month and encourage all residents to reach out and support its humanitarian mission. Board of County Commissioners of Scambia County, Florida, Lumen May, Chairman, District 3, Steve Berry, Vice Chairman, District 5, Jeff Bergoss, District 1, Mike Kohler, District 2, Robert Bender, District 4. Thank you, guys. Of course, you get it. It's your, it's your time. It's my time. Hi, everybody. Thank you um, for allowing this to happen. My name is Terry Jenkins. I am a, a seven month resident of Escambia County, but I'm a Florida native. I just have not lived here in 25 years. So I recently moved from Valdosta, Georgia, where I was the sheltering chapter for the evacuees from this area. And now I moved into the middle of it. So I look forward to learning um, about 
uh, the community, and I want to introduce Charles Thornton. He's one of my board members, and Steve is my uh, newest one as well. So if you have any questions or concerns, um, when I reach out to the officials, I'd like to find out, you know, what your issues or concerns or what your relationship has been like with the Red Cross in the past. And so um, I'm enjoying finding all the good places to eat. I'm a foodie. <laughs> Happy birthday. And I'm in your district, uh, Vice Chair Barry. And um, I don't know if you were at the Cantonment Rotary Club yesterday, but I did a presentation there. <laughs> so thank you um, for allowing us to have the proclamation. Okay. You want to get a photo? I do. Okay. What are we Steve? doing here? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's just a photo. <laughs> you want to hold it? It's your proclamation. <laughs> okay. And in Clara Barton's last words as she was passing, let me go, let me go. <laughs> so the other ones will, are just being ratified and will be presented at another time. Did the clerk's office receive proof of publication for the public hearings on the agenda and the board week, weekly meeting schedule? Mr. Chairman, the clerk's office has received the proof of publication for the regular BCC meeting. Move to wave three. Second. Please vote. Passes five in favor. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to drop the public 932 West. Yes, we've added that to my discussion agenda. So we'll keep, we'll get it at the end. Thank you. Do we need to move to drop it then? Uh, do we need to move to drop it, or we just what do we need move to cancel? Yeah, because we're going to still do it today, right? Are you, yeah, we're just, doing it as a discussion item instead of a public hearing at the suggestion of DEO. So that's based on notice provisions. So it would not hurt to do a motion to uh, right, so drop the right. public hearing and schedule Second. it as a discussion All item. Right, yep, please vote. Passes five in favor of dropping it. Clerk and Comptroller's report. Thank you. We have several items on the agenda. The first one is most important, and that is the publication of the annual comprehensive financial report. This is a financial audit that starts a process in June with field work that ends in January. It impacts your staff, my staff. Um, congratulations to both. It is a clean opinion. That allows us to rely on the numbers, and we do not have audit findings, which there's nothing there for us to improve upon as far as violation of internal controls, et cetera. So it's a very good report, and uh, I appreciate your staff that dedicated. Uh, the second one is the TDT collection data. You'll see that January, even though it was a cold month, it was an outstanding month for visitors. Um, the year-to-date collections continue to be the same pace as about fiscal 22. Our investment report, you'll see the earnings. Um, we see increased yield. However, we're seeing increased borrowing results, and your personal pro portfolio is probably dropping because of it. But as far as government and what we invest, because the most important thing to us is preservation of principle, and the way we invest, you'll see a 4.62 earnings and a 4.65 earnings on the long-term portfolio. The last is a recommendation of acceptance of documents that we file with the board minutes. Thank you. Oh, the sixth, uh, the fifth one is minutes and reports as well. Thank you. Move the clerk's report. Second. Please vote. That passed. Hold on. That passes five in favor. Thank you. Horace. Yes, sir. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Board members. For today, we have the recommendation concerning an at-large appointment to the Planning Board. We have three candidates for selection, for vote and for selection. That would be Tim Powell, Julie Duvall, and Dan Hoffman, three candidates.
Mr. Chairman, we have four votes for Tim Pyle and one vote for Julie Duvall. All right, Mr. Chairman, I move to uh, appoint Tim Pyle to that large position. Second. That passes five in favor. Uh, Tim Powell will be appointed to the planning board. Thank you, Tim, for your service. Yes, sir. Hi. The next item, we have recommendation concerning a final plan approval for preserve at Deer Run Phase 5. No speakers on that? I'll move the item in the affirmative. Second. Five in favor, Director Jones. Yes, sir. The next item will be a recommendation concerning a whole harmless agreement for shoreline protection structure. We have no speakers. It's in my district. I'll move it forward. Second. Please vote. That passes five in favor. Thank you. Director yes. Jones. The last item is the consent agenda Move the for consent April 6th. Second. Sorry. <laughs> Please vote. That's 5-0. Thank you. Ours, as it relates to that public hearing, um, we, uh, we should make sure that it's everything's in compliance. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We'll move to the technical public service consent agenda, county administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are nine items on the technical public service consent agenda. There are no changes. There are no speakers. Move the technical public service consent. Second. Please vote. That passes five in favor. Thank you. We'll go to the budget and finance consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are 32 items on the budget finance consent agenda. There are no changes, but however, hold for speakers. Card 2-4, card 2-24, and card 2-25. Are there any more that you, any other commissioner wants to hold? Seven. Can we please hold seven as well? So any, I'll give you guys a, a chance to just take a quick look to make sure there's nothing else you guys want to hold. Sorry. All right, Mr. Chairman, if there's nothing else, I'll move the balance. Second. Second. Please vote. Pass five in favor. Director Marino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Car 2-4, first speaker will be Chris Kerb. Ms. Teresa Blackwell, you'll be next. Mm-hmm. Thank you. When I think a master plan, uh, I think a stormwater master plan. Of course, that's because I do stormwater. But uh, I read through the uh, the scope of work briefly, and I didn't see a lot of emphasis on stormwater infrastructure. Um, so written into the scope of work. So uh, I guess that'll be something that will emerge when it comes to the public engagement portion of that contract for infrastructure. But uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chris. Ms. Blackwell. 
Teresa Blackwell Bula again. Um, Commissioner Burgosh, I'll be with you next time, but God gave me a sign. So first, let's get real about the contention with DPZ on OLF-8. How many other contractors have you spent thousands of taxpayer dollars to investigate, even looking at their internal emails? The real issue there was the DPC was too professional to tell you what what you wanted to hear. They told you the highest and best use would not be um, include more than 100 acres of commercial. The plans were the four plans were what the people wanted and what, in their professional and experienced opinion, would be most successful. So you went looking for a reason to fire them, which did not succeed. Who among you has not used an occasional choice word to describe one of your clients or constituents? I have read a certain blog, Tin Foil Hats, Haters. <laughs> Let's get real. Okay, so Beulah needs a master plan, and I support that. And I would like that just as much as Commissioner Burgosh. We have seen what our lack of planning has brought to Beulah with two car washes planned across the street from each other. But this is an engineering firm, not an urban land use planning business. They are adding a few town planners, um, but that's, you know, that's, that's not their main business. The project managers are not urban land use pl uh, planners. I also am not comfortable with spending nearly 250,000 more of our restore funds. We could use those somewhere else, on OLF-8, for example. Put this bid out one last time. DPZ would certainly need encouragement to apply once more. They are the only ones who have already studied Buick and, and can offer such a low price. Give them an ounce of the respect Thank and you, gratitude Blackwell. they deserve for their contributions to Escambia County. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Campbell. Cecilia, you'll be next. Let's please make the decision today and go with the best outfit, anybody but D.R. Horton. Cecilia. Those of us who started the process early, or early on and followed through were very, very pleased and we, were, we thought we had reached that compromise and that it was in your hands and it was going to happen, that we we're going to have our compromise uh, selection and that everything was going to be smooth sailing. We are very, we're very concerned about um, the company that you have one submission uh, to administer the master plan. We are, we're very concerned that they may not be qualified and that the extra funds being sp spent because of the higher price that this company is, um, has proposed to you. Uh, if it can be, if y'all can find it with, you know, to, to go back to the drawing board and and give DPZ, for example, a chance to apply. My husband and I do a lot of traveling with our children, and we have seen glorious uh, amenities in, 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 on the outskirts of little towny towns in Tennessee and Alabama, for not just speaking of just the sports complexes, but um, just right within a beautiful uh, community garden with the library boxes on the side. There's so much that can be done when there's experience involved in, um, in doing, making a master plan happen. And we're just counting on y'all to find someone qualified. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that wraps up all the speakers on this item. Mr. Chairman, if yes, I sir. Yeah, um, and I appreciate the speakers coming and I, I do appreciate your opinions on things like, um, I will say for my part, um, the master plan that came out of Navy Federal Credit Unions uh, paying for DPZ to do the master plan on OLF-8. I'm very satisfied with that product, but I would disagree with you wholeheartedly, um, Teresa. Um, there were some things that should not have happened that were very unprofessional, frankly. Uh, you know, We were the client, not Navy Federal, even though Navy Federal was paying for it as part of a swap of the money. Remember, I had the money set aside for that, and we ended up taking that money and putting it at the airport for ST. So there were some things that happened, but look, we got through that process, and we got a good product. Um, obviously, uh, 
you know, we move forward and they bid on the greater Beulah master plan. Um, they did not have three votes on this board to move forward. I can't, yeah, there's only so much I can do. We've put it out multiple times. Um, I want to fulfill the promise. I have faith in Sigma. I think the purchasing department and Tim Day have vetted them. They're more than capable of doing it. The important thing to remember is they're going to engage the community. They're going to do charrettes. They're going to take surveys. We've already done surveys. We've done 5,000. We've got 5,000 completed surveys in Beulah. People that live in Beulah know what they want. So um, I think if we push this out and say, well, maybe someone will bid, we're kicking it down the road. And let me just point out, the costs did increase. There's no question, but the costs are increasing with every project that we're doing. And the more we delay, the more the costs will go up. So uh, when I ran for this office in 2015 from the school board, having lived out in Beulah and seeing the growth, um, I did agree that this was something that I would do. And it's taken a long time. We had an advisory group. Then we had COVID. We've had a lot of, we've dodged a lot of missiles between then and now. We have the oil of fate. There's a lot of great things happening, but now is the time to fulfill that promise. Um, I, I certainly hope that my counterparts will support me in this. I want to move this forward um, for the Beulah community. And, and even though I believe it's 20 years too late, it's never too late to do the right thing. And I, I did promise that we did, no, no, it's our time to talk. It's our time, we, we can talk after the meeting if you want. So with that, Mr. Chairman, unless there's any further discussion, I would like to move that we, uh, that we approve this item. That's my motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll second the motion for discussion. Jeff, if, I mean, this is clearly important to you. Um, so I'm inclined, I'm inclined to support that. Um, as the inheritor of a master plan, um, you know, I supported the master plan um, for OLF-8. I, you know, I think there's a lot of rationale when you're the landowner, uh, that's your master planning your own property. Um, you know, as well as if you're a private landowner and Navy Federal has a master plan for their parcel. Um, you know, other, other large landowners have, you know, master plans for their parcel. Um, like I said, I, I'm I second in your motion. I'm going to support you. My comment would be, it's a, it's a tenuous proposition when you're master planning uses, best uses, future land uses, what's going to go onto other people's private property. Um, in the sector plan, we had three parties that were involved in the MOU that, that crafted it, that represented about, you know, a little bit less than 3,000 acres out of 16, 17,000 acres. So we had, um, you know, we had participation from landowners in the, uh, in the unrolling of it but it still was a fraction, of the, a fraction of the acreage that was encompassed in the master plan. Um, you know, I don't, and I don't know exactly what you're, what you're looking at doing out there, but when you're master planning other people's property, it's generally a tenuous situation. I'm gonna support you, um, but that, that'd, be my only, that'd be my only word of caution. It's uh, been a, uh, an unmitigated disaster for me, so. Um, I wish you, uh, you know, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you for that, Commissioner Barry. I appreciate that. I know it was contentious doing what we did at OLF-8. I would say uh, I commiserate with you for the sector plan. I do, I do think there's some distinctions there between what happened up there and, and, and what we're going to try and do in Beulah. And I would, I would also say there are examples where, where these master plans have really worked very well, not just in Escambia County, but other places. So appreciate the vote of confidence, appreciate the support. Um, I inherited one as well in Perdido Key. In a, in a way, you could say I inherited that. Um, and thus far, you know, um, I think the jury's out. But right now, the folks that live out there uh, seem genuinely pleased with the master plan. And um, that's why I've publicly taken the, the position that I'm going to support that as, as well as the conservation management plan, although it makes it very difficult to build out there. Um, uh, so I think these things can work. And I think the important thing to recognize is this is going to be a very public process. We've already done what, 14 uh, public meetings, 14 months worth of public meetings. We had a tremendous response to the survey via UWF. I mean, thousands and thousands of people. So this firm is gonna start out with on a, on, a, on a really firm footing of knowing what that community wants and they're gonna have additional charrettes. So at the end of it all, I think it'll be something that, um, that this board can be proud of. Um, I'm an optimist. I think it will be something that will be very good. So I appreciate your support, Commissioner Barry. Thank you. Commissioner Magash. Um and I too will support it. I'm reluctant to support anything uh, with, you know, with only one proposal. 
you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very reluctant, but I know your passion uh, and certainly what you and Commissioner Barry, you know, you guys represent that Beulah and that outline field eight, and I know it's important. Uh, I very rarely get in, get on that side of town, and when I do get there, I'm frustrated because of traffic. Uh, so I know that you understand your constituents, and so uh, with that, I would support you. Uh, I would, you know, would not say I did not have reservations with only one proposal. I would just hope that in the future that we would be able procurement and to bring more than one proposal. It's just to me with taxpayer dollars, you should always have more than one option to vote on. You know, in my opinion. But um, I know your passion, so I'll support you. Rob. Uh, yeah, I mean, Jeff, I was ready to support DPZ last time, you know, and, um, you know, and I, of course we've gotten a couple of emails that, that say just give this to DPZ. I can't, I can't do that either. You know, I mean, it, I, um, you know, I, I, I can't not give it to someone because someone else didn't return a bid um, you know if I had two options here and and they were one of them and there was that price difference and I I know which way I would go um, and and so um, you know I, I mean again as as we have with a couple of things like Beach Haven you know when we not award something that's gone through the process and then it and then it comes back the price goes up so um, you know I mean if if this is what what you think is the, is in the best interest of Beulah, then then I'll I'll support you on it. I do, I do believe that. Okay. I'm not going to say too much on this. I understand the uh, bidding process. If you only have sole source, you can't. You got to accept it sometimes. And I think that I'll be with you, Jeff, on this, just because if people don't apply, it's not our fault not to move forward. And this happens all the time. It's discouraging. It's frustrating. But we have a bid. And I think we should move forward with it. So we have a motion in a second on the floor. Please vote. Can you hand me over my next, please? Thank you. That passes five in favor. And Mr. Wait. Chairman, if I might just say, uh, gentlemen, that, that's, that's a culmination of almost seven years of work. So I um, appreciate the support. And I know it was odd the way we got there. And Teresa, uh, you know, I appreciate your passion. I know you've, you've been very, very outspoken, and we've not always agreed, but I can tell you this. Be involved in this process. I'm going to be. Remember, I live right across the street. I'm right in the heart of it. We're going to make this thing fantastic. We spent a lot of money to do it. Let's do it the right way. And Mr. and Mrs. Campbell, we're going to do it good. We're going to do very well, and we're going to do the best we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Bagash. Director Marino. Uh, Commissioner Bender had asked for item 7. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, so... Uh, when I was on the TDC, I know uh, Cadillac had said that, that he would put this into a, a nonprofit, and that was how we awarded it. Uh, I think that was uh, really what it took to get the support of the TDC uh, for this money. So I, I think putting it back into a privately owned um, is, is uh, outside what he had uh, stated. Um, and so I, I would... Uh, uh, I had to hold it so, so I could uh, vote against this um, and uh, in hopes that, uh, again, it's not denying the funding. It's just saying that it, it needs to go to the nonprofit that is, has been established. Um, and uh, I, again, I think if there's some, uh, he, he makes a great presentation and, and, and use for it, but I think there's still a lot of other information that, uh, you know, what he brings in ticket sales and things like that that he hasn't necessarily provided. Um, and, and I've said all along, I'm willing to help get the event going and up and running and successful. Um, but, uh, to continue just to, to give, give, uh, money away, uh, to support something that, um, again, may, may, uh, <laughs> may be well on its way to, to being self-supported. I, I, I'm trying to get them to that point. Commissioner Bender. Yes. Would you mind if we held this at the end of the meeting and give Mr. Banks the opportunity to be here? Uh, if that's your... Well. I'm happy to do that. Well, could we, could we, could, could we, well, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I was, I mean, I, I, I appreciate Commissioner Bender's comments. I was comfortable moving forward with it. Oh, okay. All right. No, it, okay, well, that's yeah, no, no I, I'm going to support it too because I've been to his events and, and Robert, I understand your thought, but if you step back from it, 
it's the same amount of money, same pot of money. It's just what kind of entity is it going to? And I, I think there are examples in the past, and I want to really get into the weeds too much of, of, of where we support all kinds of for-profit. The bottom line is putting heads in the beds. The bottom line is bringing people to this city. The bottom line is bringing great events downtown. And this event, um, you know, I, I had the good fortune on a number of occasions to attend it and actually was out, brought on stage with Commissioner May. And as I looked out onto the field, I mean, it was a packed event and everyone was having a great time and it was jazz music and it was wonderful. And these were folks from Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana coming in, spending money in hotels. So I think if we get wrapped around the axle on, well, it's, it's this or that, I think what we see here is a, is a item before us that, um, that is, passes muster and is legal. And I support Cadillac banks. And um, you know I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion um, because I don't want to hold them up. I don't want to jerk them around. He's a hardworking guy. He does great events for this community. In particular, um, he helps the African-American community. He brings in a lot of uh, overnight stays. He's brought a lot of people to Pensacola. He's passionate. He's a great guy, and he does great things. Um, and maybe he couldn't get the paperwork together the way uh, it needed to be on a nonprofit thing. I'm not concerned about that. The bottom line is same money, same pot of money, same result, and it passes legal muster. And that's why, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I might, I'm going to go ahead and move that we approve this item. Uh, because I support Cadillac Banks, and he's going to do great things, and this is a great event for Pensacola. That's my motion. The second. And, Jeff, just to say, I, I don't disagree with that. Again, just going off of what, of what the TDC board had asked him when I was on it and that he agreed to, I thought he did get the, I think he has gotten the nonprofit stood up. I just don't think he wants to take the money through it. And, um, and, and again, I support it. We voted in November to, 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 to award him this money. Um, and, and so that's, that's what I'm saying is, is that, you know, the TDC had set set expectations. I, I really would like to get out of this business. I'm, I'm not, you know, again, if, if it's off and running and it's doing well, then then I think that's that's great. We've we've helped stand up that we've number of years that we've contributed to this and helped get it to where it is. So um, it's, you know, at some point though, we, we got to let it stand on its own. We have a motion and a second. I'd like to ask something before you move to the motion. I'd like to ask the county attorney a question about the TDT well, we already funds. We already have a motion in a second. I, I, you might, I really need to ask the question, is this legal out of the TDT funds before it moves forward? It appears based on the attorney general's opinions that if these specific legislative findings are made that it can be considered legal. I understood that was also in concert with the same review by people within your office. So I hope that we're on the same page on that. Short of this legislative finding, I do agree it would be problematic. I wanted to have that on the record. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We have a motion in a second. Come up yet? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, it passed. Three, two. Chris, you're the next speaker on uh, both uh, item 24 and item 25. If, for the sake of efficiency, if you wouldn't mind just kind of combine them while you're there. I, I sure will. Uh, I actually signed up for six as well. But uh, um, and I, I mentioned it earlier. Um, I'm real encouraged to see that. Uh, the uh, Beach Haven project uh, is moving forward with the uh, the northeast zone that is phase two uh, with a state flood resilience funding program. Same one with this 24. That's uh, another one of those uh, resilience grant programs. That's something the American Flood Coalition has been been really pushing with our legislation and been successful with it. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that and real encouraged with it. Um, Item 25, which is uh, Lake Charlene Phase 2, Bridal Trail Estates. Um, I'm encouraged to see that one get kicked off as well. Uh, 
that's uh, that's originally in the Warrington Basin study, uh, but uh, this is uh, looking at trying to come up with a, a additional outfall area for the Lake Charlene uh, area for the Bridal Trail because that couldn't be covered by the Phase One grant that's currently under construction. Um, really, the con only conceptual outfall that you have is going through Turtle Swamp. And I've mentioned that and spoke on that, and that's in the Bayou Marcus Branch B, uh, which um, that's associated with the Windrose area. Um, Y'all have heard D come up here several times on that. So uh, HDR and their partner, which is Mont McDonald's, will have a challenging work to evaluate the connection between these two drainage basins. Um, you couldn't have a better group of folks uh, working on this, so I, I'm, I rise in support of this, and I hope you do too. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's item 24 and 25 on card two. Mr. Chairman, I move item 24 and 25 in the affirmative. Second. That's is five in favor. Mr. Chairman, card 3-1 is an item uh, that was requested from Commissioner uh, Burgosh, so I'll let him set the table on that. Yeah, yeah no, gentlemen, no speakers. Do we, have, we have no speakers on that. Okay, so this, this can be quick or it can be a little more time consuming. I'm, I'm going to try and keep it brief, but uh, and we haven't had a committee of the whole in a while, and this is something that I've been wanting to bring to just kind of hear your thoughts on it. Um, one of the things I heard during the campaign and one of the things I said that I would bring forward for discussion was the idea of a strategic plan. I know that we each in our districts have um, unique attributes and maybe different priorities. That's why when I ran my first two campaigns, I had kind of like my mini strategic plans. This last one was called Next Forest Gambia, the items of which I've brought steadily brought forward through my current term. But I told folks that I would bring the idea forward and when we did Florida West's strategic plan recently, I was really impressed with the process. It was pretty quick but thorough. Um, I've been involved in these before when I was on the school board and it was ridiculous. It was an eight hour day with stoplights and unmeasurable ridiculousness. So I was kind of turned off by it. Um, but a lot of people think that we should have one. Um, we're the five people that can make that happen. So I wanted to see if there was appetite for having staff work toward a strategic plan for the county that would align all of our initiatives um, in all of our districts uh, to something that we could support together. And I just want to know from my counterparts if that's something that you would look at doing. If so, I would uh, be willing to work with Wes um, and his staff to bring ideas because um, I think there's a lot of common goals that we all have. Now, again, I know each of our districts have uh, different things and different, we each have different goals and initiatives, but I think there's some common ground. So I would like to hear from you guys since this is the only time we can talk on this since we're not, uh, we haven't had committee of the whole in a while. So um, I'd just like to know if there's support for it. If there is, I'll continue to move it forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Goss, I just got a warm fuzzy. <clears throat> I love strategic planning um, because it shows a vision and a mission of where an organization's headed. I'm um, very used to this. I'm, I'm not sure, Wes, maybe you could answer this question. What would be the difference between our comprehensive plan and the strategic, strategic plan that we do? Your comprehensive uh, plan is more going to be land development. Your strategic plan is going to be your plan, five-year, ten-year plan moving forward as an organization. Okay. That's why I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to cross over. So, yeah, I'm definitely in support of strategic plan. But Jeff, I mean, this we don't have to hire another consultant. I mean, we have the in-house capabilities of doing this. Absolutely, yeah, that's the way I would want to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I okay. All right. Any more discussion? If you're talking about staff conversations and, and conversations with the board members, yeah, that, that's fine. I'm not paying somebody to do a strategic plan for the county. I mean, that's just, that's, you talk about government, you talk about something finding the shelf that will stay there perpetually and it'll be a 50 pound volume, you know? I mean, it's, it's not something that's tenable or implementable. I mean, it just, but 
If, if you're talking about internally, then yeah, that's that's okay. Uh, yeah, I don't have an issue with that, Jeff. I and, and Jeff, I support it, but I mean, but but I caution as Commissioner Barry has said, Scammy County, Pentacle is full of millions of dollars of study. Sure. Yes. I mean, we I mean we, we forever we're doing. <laughs> If, if you have a strategic plan without the resources to implement it, it's a waste of time. No, absolutely. And, and so, I mean, I know it, it's great to come up with a strategic plan pie in the sky that, you know, I'm going to fly to the moon. But if it's a strategic plan that's realistic, yeah, I'm supportive. Well, but not something that I can't, you know, I don't have the resources to implement. No, and I, and I, I will tell you guys, I, I've been involved in those sorts of sessions, and I would never do that. It would it's be a, individual. It's a pretty picture. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are ways to do it. It can be as elaborate as you want. And it can be as expensive as you want, but I would only support it if we use organic right. resources, county staff. And I, I just think there's some good that could come from it. And um, so I, I will, uh, now that I've, I've heard some general support for something that we can do uh, internally, then I'll, I'll work with Wes. Because for each one of our CRAs, we already have a strategic plan. Sure. I mean, yeah. we have to have affordable housing strategic plan. I mean, so there are, I, I think you're right, there's some hodgepodge of a lot of strategic plans that may need to be incorporated yeah. to one strategic plan. And, and I, I've, I've said that since I've elected. What is our mission as a county? Yeah. And, I, and, and every citizen should know that as clearly and defined as we know what's the mission of Escambia okay. County. All right. So well, then I'll, I'll work that. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to make one more comment. I don't want to fund it outside of internal resources. But as a new person on this board, I do want to share this. I do a strategic plan every time a CO changed. It, it was required. And it forces us as a board to focus on what's not just the mission in our district, but the county. And I think it'd be healthy for us. I really do. And um, I hope you guys support Jeff on this. I didn't, I saw that I wasn't sure what the discussion was going to be, but I'm definitely in support. I think it'd make us move forward in a positive way. Yeah. That no, no, it'd be great. I mean, hopefully you'll implement it when you're chair, Commissioner Berry, because I don't want to have any more meetings when I'm chair. So, I mean, <laughs> be great. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll miss those meetings. Um, Jeff, is that the motion? Oh, no, no, just got so you're good to go. Kohler wants to work for free. Get him to help write it all up. <laughs> Commissioner Bergash, you got the next item. No speakers. All right, same same thing, guys. Uh, kind of a big big picture item. Um, we haven't had a committee of the whole. It probably deserves a little more discussion. But um, one of the things, one of the challenges that we've all had in our districts, and I've had particularly in my district, is um, what happens when a large, multi-unit, high-density residential complex is planned uh, for a community. And, and I think there's a bit of a hole in the process because the residents, um, a lot of times are not aware of what's coming. Um, and recently uh, down in Perdido Key, uh, you know, in Perdido, there was a giant um, residential complex that was approved. And look, no knock on the landowner, they didn't do anything wrong, right? No knock on the developer, they do what they do and, and the housing is in demand. But the residents feel like they, they weren't notified. They, were, they feel like they were hit over the head. So I've been looking into that since then because I've had the same issue happen to me on Pine Forest Road right now. Pine Forest is just blowing up with development. Um, obviously, Beulah, we were talking about a Beulah master plan. I mean, there's multiple apartment, big, big apartments going up. I, I look, I have no issue with that, but I want residents to be aware. Um, the residents that live there and drive those roads every single day know what the road conditions are. Um, and developers coming in it, can put these things up incredibly quickly. And, and like you said earlier, Lumen, then they leave and they lease them out or have a company manage them. I, I would like to propose a stand, and this is what I said at my town hall, in fairness to those residents, because by the time I took over that district, um, you know, after redistricting, that was a done deal. Uh, and, um, you know, if you drive out there now, I mean, those buildings are up. It's amazing how quickly they can put residential up because they make a lot of money on it, right? That's their business to make money. So I would like to propose that if, if there's support for it, that staff take a look at a standalone apartment ordinance, standalone in the land development code um, that requires some notification, maybe some enhanced notification of the residents, maybe some consideration of the roads and the current infrastructure because we don't have concurrency, can't bring that, don't have transportation mobility fees. I've tried, we can't get that. Of course, we don't have impact fees and if I even say that word, I get shot. Um, but every other county in, in, our, in our state does and most of the world does, but we don't have those things here. So before we dump a gigantic resource consuming infrastructure consuming multi-unit apartment in any neighborhood in our district. I know, Robert, you're getting lit up on, on JoJo. I, we, hear about, we hear it every single meeting. I think it would be helpful to have a standalone ordinance that would speak to that with some specific milestones a developer would have to do, some public meetings. And um, I, uh, I promised the folks at 
my last town hall when I was getting beat up, when I was getting pilloried over it, something I inherited, didn't have anything to do with it, that I would bring it, because I think it's a reasonable discussion to have. People are concerned about infrastructure. They're concerned that we are building beyond the capability of our infrastructure to handle, and I think this is, would be something reasonable. So I'd like to know if I would have support if I would have support in asking staff to start looking at that. And so, again, we can't talk anywhere else but here. Um, I'm pretty good at reading the tea leaves. I'm like a human windsock. If I don't hear three votes, I don't hear three votes. But if I do, I'm going to move forward aggressively with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Bergosh, that, that's, that's an interesting idea. And, um, you know, I don't know, I mean, does it take standalone or just some changes, changes to the land development code? I mean, it seems like we just go in and I, I don't know that it's... E well, either I, way is fine with me, but to go in to the, do the whole land development code, I think is a very uh, exhaustive process and very intensive. I, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that adjusting everything related to, a, or addressing everything related to apartments in the land development code would be more intrusive than basically, you know, striking and deleting everything in our land development code related to that and then and standing up a new a new part of an LDC for standalone apartments. But mm -hmm. now, if the discussion is some changes to the apartment, I'm, I'm very open-minded to that. There's, um, you know, there's some issues. I, I know there's a few apartments that Robert and I kind of border. Uh, I know I border some apartment complexes with you and with Commissioner May as well, with the growth, uh, especially around Nine Mile Road. Um, you know, there's, uh, Allison, the issue that came up a couple years ago with with just one specific part of the apartments was the parking issue. Did we go back and did we go back and make tweaks to the code related to that? Okay, Jeff, that is something that I think that we need to do. Our our parking requirements for apartment development, in my opinion, is is lacking, and I and I think that you know I, I'm open minded to the other issues that you're having, but I've seen the impact of the shortfalls that we have related to parking specifically. So if the idea is, <clears throat> you know, am I willing to, you know, crack open the code related to apartments? Yes. And I think that, and I think that it needs to, uh, in my opinion, I think it needs to be done um, because, you know, what we have, I'm, you know, I, I have something at the university once a week that I've got to drive out there Monday afternoons. And, you know, by 435, 530, I've got, I've got people parked up and down University Parkway Exactly. That are getting out of the that are getting out of their vehicles, walking along University Parkway to get in and out of the to get to and from the apartments. On the other side of the apartments, I've got people parked on the side of the road trying to get to and from the university. I'm to understand from communications with some of their people that that also includes um, that's happening late at night as well. You know, with with people having to walk long distances late at night. So, and that's appears to be the direct result of not enough parking requirements in our code. So I'm um, yeah. If, if if cracking open the apartment code is what you're talking about, I'm certainly open-minded to that, and I'm sure that Horace and Drew and Joy, you know, and her people have some other ideas for uh, other other aspects of the code outside of the parking. I'm sure there are you know at least a half dozen or more okay. that we really need to take a look at, and I'm good with that. Well, look, hey, I appreciate that, Commissioner Barry. And I will say, driving up University Parkway toward the university to play tennis, I, I'm amazed at how close those apartments are physically to the road too. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of things to look at, setbacks road capacity, I mean, I really want to look at that too. I think that's important. Um, but yeah, if, if we're willing to do it that way, I think that would benefit each of us in our districts and our citizens would realize, hey, you know, we're, we're gonna look out for them before we allow these things to just be dumped in. So I appreciate those words. Maybe not a standalone, but maybe an open it up and look at it. I'm, I'm willing to do that. Um, yeah, Jeff, I can support. I mean, but I'll be cautious, you know, in, in the districts that Robert and I serve, and, and you know, some districts become walkable districts versus some become rural districts. Uh, and so I agree with Commissioner Barry. I mean, obviously the parking puts people in danger, putting them on the highway, but I don't want to do a universal because if I was building it in Brownsville, I would want it to be walkable versus me, or if I was building it in some of my other neighborhoods. And so the parking capacity wouldn't be as great as it is on University Parkway. So I just don't want to blanket it uh, to do it universal. But I think there are some things in terms of, and, and I could support it, I mean, we're not far off, but you know, even in what they're putting in low income neighborhoods, uh, the lighting requirements, the safety requirements, all those things, uh, it's like, you know, even uh, materials and facade uh, because what happens is, you know, they build these things and five years later they look like slums uh, because we allow for them to come and 
put those type of things in. So I'm, I'm about looking at that and increasing it to those developers. I and mean, the developer wants to build as many units as possible uh, and occupy as much uh, density as they can. And so we're trying to increase the quality of life. And so I'd say as we let them come in and build these mega apartments, we got to look at the overall quality of life for everyone. And, you know, they promise us things every time they come down with one of these, they come to the dive and they said, Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be lit up. It's going to be lights on every corner. There's going to be a community center. The pool's going to work all those things. Two years later, they're calling our office and none of that stuff works. And so while, uh, I mean, and while they can present these costs as being, you know, uh, prohibitive on the front end, I mean, the truth is the projects are financed and they're, and they're amortized over 35, 40 year periods. I mean, they're not, they're not even 30 year notes. I mean, they're going to be 35 and 40 year notes normally. Right. So the, you know, an extra hundred thousand in, um, you know, in aesthetics or something, you know, over that period of time is, is, is not, it's, it's not a, uh, it's a, it's a rounding error on their yeah. project. And on a tax credit, they give it back after 15 years. They don't even want it because they, they, they've drained all the equity out of it. Robert. Yeah. So, uh, Stephen, I, tend to agree with you. Um, I mean, we've stood up a, a committee to, to look at some changes already. Joy, when, have we already met? When they meet? What's the name of the committee? It's the uh, <laughs> Professional <laughs> Advisory Committee. <laughs> the PAC. Uh, yeah, we, we have met uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, we've set up an agenda for uh, moving forward. Um, Parking is on the list of items that needs to be discussed. There's some other things in terms of buffering. So separation between uses, intensities, um, similar to the discussions that you've all heard through the Finley JoJo pro project. So we're, we're taking all of some of those items and bringing them to that committee to discuss. And that will come through the planning board and then to you. Uh, thank you for that. And I yes. appreciate well, your work While she's it. up there, can I ask you, the discussion we're having about apartments specifically, is that something that you can broach with that committee if it sounds that there's general consensus that apartments some apartments get into the zoning and use issues. However, the, the, the standards that we're talking about cross all those boundaries. So if it's um, what can get confusing is like Jojo was going to act the Finley Jojo project was going to be a single family development because they were going to well, sell the property apartments. under yeah. each unit. So it truly was an apartment. So you don't really, you don't necessarily want to call it apartments. You just want a parking requirement and a buffering requirement, perhaps that is relative to, to densities and, and, and I, intensity of. And use. I agree with all of the above, but I also want a notification requirement for the residents. I, I and understand. And I want it. roads to be looked at before these 200 unit things get dumped. Certainly could do that through your planning board process, and Horace, I'm sure, can speak yeah. to that. But it's whatever way we can do that. I think, I, you know. Each of us, like I said, we've each, I'm sure, dealt with these mm -hmm. in different, but I said I would bring it forward and, and I, if we can look at that and look at all aspects of multifamily, mm -hmm. uh, then I, I would like to move forward with that. Yeah, and, I think they can do that pretty easily for you through the planning board process. And, and again, that's, uh, that's what I was going to say is that I didn't think that the judge of family would have really fallen under right. the, you know, what you brought forward as, as this. So, but I think we are trying to address it with that, you know, as, as with the university area, I think part of that is because they're being used as uh, dormitory style housing. Uh, and so instead of having, you know, 1.5 cars, which I don't know how you get 1.5 cars per, but instead of having 1.5, they've got three and four cars and, and there's your, there's your problem. Uh, and so I, I think, uh, if it, you know, I don't know if we look more at dormitory style housing, cause we almost had the same thing happen on, on Langley, uh, with, uh, with the uh, students that were going to go through flight school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I think that they're almost using that as a workaround, especially in that nine mile area, that it's apartments, but, and, and that was some of the concerns that I know the residents had with the, with the Jojo Finley townhomes was that three bedrooms, three students, you know, now you've got three cars instead of 1.5. So, um, you know, and, and I know a number of the things that, that Joy was concerned with with the Jojo Finley in, in terms of on-street parking and, and distance between driveways and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so I, I, uh, I would agree with uh, Commissioner Barry in that I, I think we can incorporate a lot of these into the process that we already have, you know, that we started a few months ago, um, but a standalone um, might be a little bit more difficult. I appreciate that. Thank you. But I support everything that, that you're trying to do on it though. 
Car 3 3 is a discussion, a domes discussion. We have four speakers. Uh, Commissioner Beer. I'm sorry, we have speakers. I'll, I'll wait till after the speakers. All right, uh, Keith Bow, you'll be first. Shirley Green, you'll be next. Commissioner Beer, I'll step out and when the speakers go, then you can take it, please. I really appreciate the insight that we have in District 2, Commissioner uh, Mike Kohler, because as a nurse, he understands what uh, the expenses and the operations are uh, for having a uh, uh, District 1 medical examiner's office, and uh, he's recommending uh, that it be in, on Avalon Boulevard in Santa Rosa County, a uh, great central location that's going to serve the District 1 of Florida. Uh, and I, is this what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, at, as a facility that we can get behind and recommend, this is the facility where we can come together with the other counties and really help ourselves while they're also helping us. Uh, I understand that uh, we do most uh, post operations, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, someone passes away and you need a coroner's report, this is going to benefit our county uh, financially, you know, with having it there in Santa Rosa County. So anyway, I'm, I'm a proponent. Thank you. Shirley Green. Good morning. I assume it's still morning. Um, I think we should combine resources and put this more centrally located. I don't know if the bowels of Sacred Heart is the same room as I visited as a med tech student in the 1970s where the morgue was. I think it probably is. It really needs updating. It might have been adequate in the 70s and 80s and maybe even 90s, but um, it's time. And we have enjoyed the uh, facility in our county for years, for decades. So it's time to, you know, be team players too and say, okay, it's four counties. And you know, we have 50% of the autopsies required by that office right now. Maybe, you know, that awareness, maybe we could improve our ratios and not have to be so many, you know, of the shootings and the uh, questionable deaths. Um, that's an awareness too, but you know, Avalon Boulevard, you hop on interstate, you shoot down, you get a little traffic. Um, I think really it's kind of a no-brainer, so I hope you guys will support the new facility, and if you have any doubts, go down in that damp, dusty, uh, well, it's not dusty, it's damp and cool, concrete, walled morgue, and let's get a modern facility, especially since we have, I'm assuming, state grant money for it as well. Nope, it's all on the district. So, okie okay, doke. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Coffey. Dan, you'll be next. Thank you, commissioners. It's a pleasure to be before you today. Uh, I'm the deputy county administrator of Okaloosa County, and I happen to serve this year as the chairman of the Domes Board. So the proposal that's before you today, I'll talk briefly about that and then really uh, request your help. But let me start first by saying thank you for your efforts uh, to try and find alternate solutions. Uh, I'm learning more and more about that. Uh, I'll call it the fire hose approach, and I plan to dive into that more and more, as you've seen through uh, emails and uh, discussions I've had with you. Um, right now, before you, essentially is a combined plan uh, that essentially is $750,000 and $1,500 a body. What that means to uh, for autopsy. What that means to you as far as the county, it would mean to you $750,000 and $5 million approximately over 15 years. Um, I think we are working on downsizing, right-sizing that, and I, I would tell you today as I stand before you, I really think that number is 750000 and $4 million over 15 years in, in working with you. However, I know that that's not the solution that I've heard uh, in my discussions with you, that there were some other solutions that you want me to consider, and I appreciate that. I, I want to it's a business decision for us, and I'm sure it's a business decision for the other counties. We really want to understand the, the apples and apples, compare the different options that are out there. 
Uh, I will tell you there is a disconnect on what that other option is at Sacred Heart. And uh, I'm working to understand that and get that in a detailed uh, bullet point uh, so I can actually do the math and understand that. So here's the disconnect. Uh, right now at the Domes Board, we've hired a architect $50,000 to evaluate the Sacred Heart option. That came back at $15 million. And that came back and it's still got functional issues and it came back, you still gotta pay rent. So from another county's perspective, it doesn't make good business sense. When I talk to some of you, there's a completely different scenario proposed that it essentially it could be $3 million or, or around that range. Uh, it could be something that the Escambia County pays more for, and it could be 90% of the functional issues uh, that are out there. So uh, I'm trying to reconcile the two. Uh, the truth may be somewhere in the middle, uh, but I, I think in order to move forward, we've got to reconcile that and make sure we're talking apples to apples and on the same language so that one group is not pressuring another group and we, we speak frankly and honestly and uh, really get down to brass tacks. And that's, I thank you all for doing that. I'm gonna be meeting next week. You'll see me over in your county again, meeting with some folks. Um, and I'm really trying to get to that end game as quickly as possible so we don't lose our legislative appropriation. So we don't uh, run into other issues that could occur if we, if we can't make a decision. Um, but thank you and I'll answer any questions that you may have of me. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, Dan signed up to speak as well. Do you want to let Dan speak and then the board maybe take discussion after that? If, maybe he'll stay up front. Uh, Dad, Mr. John, I'm not going to speak after the chairman of my, my board. Um, I'm here to answer questions or help Craig with any technical details if you have any. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, so, you know, obviously this, is, this has been an issue for, you know, I don't know, eight or nine months for us. Um, I went to, uh, went to a meeting in Santa Rosa County late last summer. Uh, and I'm not sure how, if board members have been to those donors meetings, but I was asked to attend, so I did attend and was, uh, you know, was troubled by, was troubled by what I heard. Um, and, you know, from that point on, have been, you know, pretty involved in discussions. Um, you know, we had uh, some of the folks from uh, Dr. Oleski's office come and, sp come and speak at public forum at a board meeting um, in the fall time, I believe maybe October-ish, uh, give or take. Um, you know, I'm say off the top, I, you know, I like uh, Mr. Schiebler. You know, I felt like I worked well with him when he was in Santa Rosa County. I like Dr. Oleski. And, uh, you know, I, I and I think, the, I think that our entire board, but, you know, I'll speak for myself. You know, I want to help the situation with the medical examiner's office. You know, when first heard some of the, you know, some of the circumstances they're working under, I mean, they're troubling, so troubling circumstances. You know, see some of the pictures, I mean, they're, they're, they're troubling. So, you know, I think all of us want to try to find a solution to uh, meet the needs. Um, but I think that, you know, some of my conversation and some of my frustration has been um, the, the part of that narrative of meeting the needs and not the wants. You know, for us to, uh, for us to fund the wants of the people that, uh, you know, the partners that we fund as a board, um, we, would have, we would have been broke decades ago to fund the wants. So uh, on some level, you know, it's, it's difficult for lay people like myself to get down to, uh, you know, what, what the needs are. And, and, you know, I think that anytime we start talking about new facilities with a, you know, with a functioning office, even if it's not functioning ideally, you start by saying where, you know, what exactly do we have? What can, what can be done where we are? Are there, are there any opportunities? Um, you know, especially with the cost of construction, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that, that it's not going to be more cost efficient to try to work and expand and improve something where we are rather than just starting from scratch and building new brick and mortar because it's, uh, because it's requested or it's wanted. Um, you know, after I met with uh, Mr. Schiebler and Dr. Oleski and one of her other senior people from the medical examiner's office uh, either the week or two after, uh, after many of them spoke at the board meeting, and in that meeting, uh, which I'm sure Mr. Schiebler remembers, you know, I asked, so, you know, just, it was myself, Wes Moreno, Eric Gilmore, and then the three people from, uh, from their office. Well, you know, what are the problems? You know, without, you know, without the cameras or only, or, you know, speaking at the podium, just talking to, you know, me and, you know, so, some of the other senior leadership from Skimmy County, what are, the, what are the main issues? And the three issues that I was told, and I would certainly suspect uh, Wes and Eric would corroborate this as, as well as Mr. Schiebler, was the cooler space, autopsy tables, 
and the security of the facility. Okay. Well, you know, at that point in time and since then, so that's, you know, three or four months, whatever that time frame is since then, you know, I've had many, many, many conversations, have devoted a lot of time to, uh, to working with Wes and Eric and, and through Eric and the Domes Committee as well as through um, many conversations and meetings that I know that Wes and Eric have both had with Sacred Heart Leadership, you know, we've moved forward. You know, we move forward with conversations. I can't thank, uh, you know, the help and the, and the uh, cooperation out of uh, Don Rudolph, the CEO of Sacred Heart. I mean, she has spent a tremendous, in my opinion, she has spent a tremendous amount of time um, and effort and good faith trying to help us accommodate what those needs are of the medical examiner's office. The cooler, uh, the conversation about the coolers that we're moving forward with is going to more than double the cooler space. That was, that was one of the top line issues that was brought up. That's a, you know, one of the things that was said from the podium by one of the employees was, you know, the possibility of stacking bodies in the hallway. Um, you know, that's a very troubling image, uh, you know, that's said publicly. So that's a, that's a big concern. So the conversation more than doubles the cooler space. Um, the autopsy tables, there's not, you know, that problem being raised was there's not enough room to work. Okay, well, we don't have enough tables. So the, uh, the conversation with Sacred also more than doubles the autopsy tables that are available. Um, then you move on to the security of the facility because they do have evidence. They have, you know, they have FDLE people, they have state's attorney's office people coming in, they have sheriff, you know, they have, you know, four counties of sheriff's department uh, people in and out. Security of the facility because it's cohabitated. Um, Don has, uh, you know, Don has agreed to, uh, to have the Sacred Heart employees that are currently that are currently cohabitating in the facility um, out of that facility so that the facility can be secured to, uh, you know, to maintain chain of custody issues or, you know, again, a, a layperson in law enforcement stuff, some of you may know better than I do, but I know that there are rules about maintaining, you know, not just the bodies themselves, but the evidence that's associated with them, whether it's fibers or clothes or whatever. So that, you know, the secure facility, that made sense to me as well. And, um, and again, I, there's, in, you know, in an immediate reaction culture, three or four months seems like a long time. As we all know, even Mike, I mean, you're new on this board, but you've been in, you know, you've been involved in government and government agencies for your career, it sounds like. So three or four months is not a very long period of time for, I think, a lot of progress to have been made and a lot of partnerships to, uh, uh, to develop through that process. Um, you know, I don't believe that there's been a lot of, you know, communication of those efforts that Escambia County was making during that period of time, um, having conversations with multiple board members of our neighboring, uh, you know, our, our partners in, the, in District 1. Um, to a person, the board members, this is conversations with six or seven, you know, out of 15. Um, none of them were aware of any of that. All they had been told about Escambia County was Escambia County wasn't cooperating and we were being obstinate and uh, an obstacle in the process. And that's, I don't think that's a good faith conversation about what was going on over here at the time. You know, I committed in that meeting with Mr. Schiebler and Dr. Oleski that I was gonna, that I was gonna help. Those sounded like, those sounded like real problems, even to a lay person. I, okay, those sound like real problems. I'm gonna try to help you. And I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like I've done it. I feel like Escambia County leadership, um, you know, with Wes and Eric, you know, kind of leading the way as people that can actually do work on behalf of the board. Obviously I can't, I can just have conversations. Um, and then I know, uh, you know, I, I know Commissioner Bender's been involved in a lot of the conversations the last, you know, six or eight weeks as well. And I, you know, I feel like Escambia County is, is doing a lot and having not gotten, you know, any credit for the efforts and the, and the, and the, you know, the moves that we are making because we haven't been asking for any financial resources from any of our partners. On some level, uh, you know, there was one of the young ladies that spoke mentioned, you know, being in the facility in the 70s. Um, it has been here a long time. And I don't think we've ever asked uh, any of the partnering counties to put capital into, you know, into our facility and it doesn't appear that we've put a lot either. So I, I didn't deem it something that, you know, it didn't seem like it made sense to go and say, well, you know, we haven't kept this up to date, but now you need to chip in on it. I felt like it was a scammy county's responsibility and, and we're, you know, we're going to do that. We're, you know, we're going to expand the capacity there and hopefully it's, uh, you know, hopefully long term. We're able to, you know, work something out with leadership at the medical examiner's office where, you know, where we, uh, you know, we're doing what they need to do to be able to do their jobs efficiently there. Um, you know, there is a, 
you know, and we exhibit, I think we exhibit this on the TPO on a regular basis. I mean, there's a real camaraderie, um, you know, uh, between us and neighboring counties. I think not just the Florida Alabama TPO, but the regional, you know, the regional TPO that many of us serve on. You know, we, we do work together, but those friendships and relationships aside, you know, it's our responsibility for our taxpayers and likewise those counties have you know they have the same responsibilities so it just didn't you know from the very beginning the bad taste i got in my mouth last summer was that huge number of Escambia county tax dollars going into brick and mortar in a neighboring county um you know now it would just within in just within the last week which also coincides for whatever reason also coincides with more communication from our board and our leadership to other boards and other leaderships in the, in the district, actually letting them know what we've done and what we're doing. Now all of a sudden the offers and the proposals are coming down considerably, which makes me concerned to a degree about where the original proposal started. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of uh, room to negotiate just in the last week or so with the proposals that have come forward. And I think that's good. And, and those are steps in the right direction. And it gives me it gives me, uh, you know, good faith that maybe over the next few weeks we can get further, you know, further and further along with some recognition for what, you know, for what we are doing. Um, I'm concerned that, on, you know, on some level, the estimates that were, that have been arrived at for what goes on at Sacred Heart, um, I don't know that they match reality. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm concerned that the, you know, and Jeff, you mentioned this when you're talking about the master plan or who the client is. Um, the counties pay for it, but we weren't who signed the agreement with the architect. We're not the client, and I'm concerned that uh, you know I'm concerned that the Escambia County, Escambia County specifically, our taxpayer best interest has not been uh, represented by the procured professional doing the estimates at what what would what would be taken to uh, what would be taken to rehab some of the facilities, because. You know, I, I know conversationally what I was told it would cost just for the tables and the coolers and stuff at Sacred. Um, when I first brought that up, you know, in the fall time, it certainly looks a lot less expensive now that I'm seeing actual numbers from Sacred Heart for what it's actually going to cost, which makes me think if we had, you know, a professional that Escambia County board, we were the client to, um, they may, you know, they may come back with some different numbers for what those estimates might would be. Uh, you know, and I, and I can't thank uh, leadership at Sacred Heart enough, you know, in addition to those, the, the improvements in the area specifically where they're working, um, she and her team worked hard to find a, you know, to find another building on campus that uh, that's not being utilized right now, that I believe was used for either testing or testing or something to do with COVID, but, um, um, you know, to find another building, that's a, that's a possibility for, uh, you know, for an expansion of, of the office there. And there's a lot of square footage in the, in the building. Um, I just I think the conversation is going to take more time and more effort. I'm very pleased. I appreciate Craig's time yesterday afternoon. We probably spent 30 minutes on the phone. Uh, I was very pleased with uh, very pleased with that conversation. At least he you know let me you know kind of let me vent a little bit um, you know about some of the frustrations that you know that I've had in the last uh, you know six months through the process. And a lot of those really do come down to communication and. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Jeff, you've been on a board for, you know, for longer than Lumen and I, maybe less on this board, but, you know, six, I don't know, 14, 16 years, give or take, between the two. Lumen and I have more than 10 years on this board each. And uh, to an instance of the times that something has come before us that this absolutely has, this is, this has to be done, and this is the only answer to this problem, it's been my experience that neither of those have been true in those instances. And I don't know that that's, uh, and, and so that would lead you to believe that that, uh, that that wouldn't necessarily be true right now. I mean, I think this is a it's, a, it's a lot of money that we're talking about. So, you know, finding that immediate, immediate approval, I, I don't know that that makes sense. I mean, I think we're, we're making progress. And then, you know, one answer being the only answer, I don't know that that's ever the answer. So Steven. I appreciate y'all's indulgence and, and, you know, and generally speaking, obviously, I don't say a whole lot out here. I do, you know, I, I, I do try to, you know, um, have, have other conversations that, where they're not 
all, all from the podium and certainly, you know, um, um, you know, try to be effective in, in other ways. But uh, on some level, you know, Jeff, as you mentioned earlier a couple of times, it's the only time that we get to talk. And I wanted y'all to know because the one time it did come up in the fall, I said, look, guys, I am I'm trying. I'm, I'm working on stuff. And in the good faith that I feel like I, I you know, I have with my board and, and want to continue to have, I wanted you to know that over the last three or four months since I said that at a board meeting, I have put a lot of work into trying to find not the answer because I'm maybe not capable, I'm not qualified medically to find the answer maybe, but try to find an answer, you know, at least an, a couple of answers, a couple of alternate options that may work that won't be so cost prohibitive to our taxpayers. No, so. thank you, Stephen. You mentioned, since you mentioned me, I'll just jump in right quick. Uh, no, I appreciate your efforts and I appreciate Craig Coffey. He called and we spoke yesterday as well. And I appreciate the latest proposal because I feel like it's a move in the, in the right direction. But, but I also uh, tend to agree with Stephen. Um, and, you know, I toured that facility. I met with Dr. Oleski. Um, I saw the issues firsthand with the, with the cooler space and the lack of a, uh, you know, uh, and at that point when I visited, they had this MacGyvered uh, collection system because the thing was leaking so bad. They had tarps collecting the water into barrels. It was, it was just bush league. It was rustic. But um, well aware of the cooler and the additional space. I've spoken to Dawn Rudolph and really hats off to her as well. Um, I do think we keep moving forward because, and I've also taken a different step. I've spoken to folks that run funeral homes and crematoriums, the people that really the day in, day out movers that actually move the bodies and have to deal with a lot of the fallouts of these decisions. And, you know, to a person, those folks have told me that, you know, the majority of the death in this district happens in this area. We get people coming from Baldwin County. We get more overdose deaths, you know, by a large number in Escambia County. We have, sadly, we have more crime, more uh, victims of homicides. We, we just have the majority of the death. And if you live in o Okaloosa or Santa Rosa County and you have a serious injury or uh, illness, a lot of those folks end up coming to Escambia County to one of the big three hospitals and then sadly they die here. So it, it really always made sense to me what you said, Steve, about keeping the footprint here, expanding it to meet the need and really taking, um, you know, taking an approach of what do we really need? What are the needs? And like you said, what are the wants? What are the requirements? So and, I like the idea. And Commissioner, I'm going to give you the floor back. You did mention something I didn't mention, but uh -huh. I, have, I have had conversations with 10 or 12 of our funeral home Okay, partners. you have. And I, there may be, you know, there may very well be some communication coming from them with some feedback as well. But there, it's, it's, yes, it, it's along those lines. The majority of the deaths happen here, but they may have some, some other feedback about, uh, you know, about just the day-to-day -day operations. I mean, it, there's, they're, they're partners. They're partners. Right, they're not, right. they're not direct partners to us, but they're partners of our partners, which make them our partners. <laughs> Absolutely. Some, some I'm and sorry. They're, and their coolers sometimes become our, uh, you know, default additional space. We use space. them. Absolutely, we use. So, so I, I, you know, I like the idea of having a facility here. Like I told you, Craig, on the phone yesterday, I, I like the idea of having the main hub facility here. But I know a number of years back, Dr. Minyard had a facility in Okaloosa County, and then that went away, and that sheriff was not happy. And I understand um, why he was frustrated. But, um, you know, when when people wanted to rush us into into putting a lot of money from Escambia County taxpayers into a facility in Santa Rosa County, you know, I had the same reaction as Stephen did. Um, you know. Uh, we, we, then we're taking all the bodies from Escambia and driving them out of the area. I mean, I, I, think, I think there's room for a compromise, but I think it's going to entail Okaloosa, Santa Rosa, and Walton figuring out where, where the satellite facility should be. I think that the main facility must remain in Escambia County. That's and where the majority of the deaths are. It's, it's funny, Jeff. So what you, what you just mentioned there, and, and Craig will tell you, I even mentioned this yesterday afternoon, um, you know, towards the end of the conversation, and, and you know, and I have... Uh, interacted with Craig a few times over the years. You know, he's been in leadership in, uh, in the Panhandle for a number of years, so we've interacted a few times. There's a bit of a relationship there. Towards the end of the conversation, he asked, well, just kind of an open-ended question, what, what do you think you might could live with? You know, what do you think you might could support? And, uh, you know, it is important to me to end up with the main facility remaining in Escambia County. And I said, look, it's a to me, it's a it's a it's a financial thing. I mean, it is purely a financial thing. Like I said, I like I like uh, Mr. Schiebler. We had great interactions when he was in leadership at Santa Rosa County with the, with their board. Um, you know, even his predecessor, Hunter Walker. I mean, I thought I thought Hunter was a friend of mine as well. So you know, I like him. I like Dr. Oleski, and I want them to have a facility that that works. But I said the you know the main facility staying in Escambia County, and I'm not you know being completely obstruction is saying, 
you know, some line in the sand, absolutely no tax money would go to another county. What I even just kind of tossed out there yesterday afternoon, you know, if there was a smaller capital contribution from Escambia County towards a satellite facility in, um, you know, say Okaloosa, that, you know, that would be reasonable to me. And that would, be, that would be the type of thing. And, and, you know, we do have the resources to put towards something. And I would be willing, you know, I'd be willing to do that. Um, um, and I think we're getting closer to where, you know, whether it's a million dollars from us or, or some number, you know, we could put some money towards a facility that would be impactful towards that satellite facility and then, you know, um, manage our own affairs here. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'm so glad to hear you say that. I think that's the, that's the right course of action. And again, Craig, like I told you, I, I think Okaloosa makes sense because you're central to Walton and Santa Rosa. But of course, that's a decision for you three. But I know eventually we all four have to come together. But I think, um, you know, from what I'm hearing uh, on this board, I think there's, you know, consensus that the majority of death is here. Therefore, the, the facility should be here. The majority of the crime is here. Therefore, you know, um, we got to have that facility close for law enforcement and our sheriff and our police department. But I, I didn't mean to jump over you, Robert, but, um, you know, Commissioner Barry and I were we're talking about that, so I uh, appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Rob. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Commissioner Barry, you finish? Yes, sir. Thank you. And I, and I, and I appreciate my colleague's indulgence. I, I didn't say much up until here today. I was saving my minutes. So. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I think you've used them. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, Robert, you got yeah, it. Thank you. You got the rest of Stephen's minutes. <laughs> I've been saving mine, too. Uh, you know, Stephen, I, you know, I think the two of us, I don't think anyone in the paint has worked harder on this than, than we have. And, and uh, I mean, I know that uh, it, it's probably been over two years that I've, every time I go to a FAT conference and I, I see somebody from one of the neighboring counties, I, I talk about it, talk about the need to do it. And, um, you, you know, and, and so I, I think we have made great strides in the last week. I think this initially was, was somewhat uh, gone about in the wrong way. It's all about location and how much money each county was putting in. We weren't really looking at, um, I'd say, the needs. Um, you know, so to, to hear that the cooler was, was being ordered without the knowledge or coordination or anything like that with the medical examiner's office when, when it seems like they were the ones that tried to present it to us, I, I find that hard to believe. I mean, I know you may not have known what we were actually doing, but I think if you said that you would help them, that, that that's coordination. Um, you know, and, and I, uh, I mean, we were uh, working on their behalf um, to, to improve the situation and, and even if, um, you know, some of them seem like they're, they're big enough issues that even with the new facility, they would still need to be addressed because you're going to be there for three years. Um, so to have a, a dedicated cooler from Sacred Heart to, to not have the access issues and things like that um, seems like they should be addressed. Um, I would, my other concerns is that, you know, we have a proposal that was sent to us this week that I don't think any of the other counties have. I mean, I don't know if they've been shared, but clearly two of them have, I think, taken action on, on the previous one that I think was uh, very slanted against Escambia County with a lot of the terms. Um, and I, I understand the importance of, of trying to get this across the finish line um, to try to get some money from, from the state this year um, that we've already gotten some funds for some of the things that have already happened. Um, but I think, I think, again, we start to ask about the size and it gets reduced from 29,000 square feet to, to 20,000 square feet. Um, and, and that was never part of the discussion. It was always, this is what we need. Um, you know, I've toured Leon County's facility that was just renovated. The, the building was renovated to accommodate their new office. Um, you know, they're about 8,000 square feet, but the, the surprising thing is, is that, um, Leon and their 
nine surrounding counties that are part of their, their district and the ones that they handle, I think they only do, what, 800 cases a year and only about 500 autopsies, which is, is less than what we as, as a standalone county do. Um, and, and so, um, you know, to have the hospitals here, um, you know, I've, I've met with Dan and, and again, uh, uh, think highly of them. And, and uh, you know, when we met, I said, you know, I want to work on getting a solution done, get something across the finish line, a little bit like what we did with the ECAT today. I want to get that contract across the finish line and, and approved. So um, I, I would, you know, Craig, I appreciate this offer and, and coming up. I would say my concerns, though, are, are that, you know, I feel like we had tentatively reached an agreement or similar understanding of, of you know, keeping bodies in Escambia County. Uh, you know, again, I'm not getting into the numbers here, but it seems very similar to what's on the table, and I was told that that was a no. So has that changed? Is, is it safe to assume that, that, that the, the possibility of operating two facilities is viable and is on the table? Um, I, I can't speak for the rest of my domes board, but I would say yes. The, the goal I, I've been trying to do is to find out, is there a middle ground that we can reach on um, by all means? Okay. So I mean, you're correct. I haven't talked with the other candidates. Okay. So, so we do have something in front of us that the other boards, I would say, then don't have. Um, and, and that's uh, a little concerning for me, um, you know, because... Um, Again, they're, they're voting on one thing and, and then we're voting on something else, so we're already apart. Um, Stephen, I'd say I'd agree 100% with you, and I, and I said it to Dan when we met, that um, I would be willing to do some capital uh, funds towards the new facility uh, in, a, in a new location. Um, I thought if we could keep a footprint here, to have one in Okaloosa would make sense. Uh, again, you've got some of the, the fastest growing counties in the state in this area. And, um, you know, Okaloosa has the second highest number of bodies. Um, I know Santa Rosa's, you know, where they are, and, and I think Walton is increasing. Uh, and, and my concern with if you want to uh, plan for the next 15 to 20 years in a facility, um, you know, if we do two facilities like's proposed to have one in Escambia and one in Santa Rosa, um, I don't see how that's really in the best interest of, of the district uh, in, in the future. And so I think a lot of these things uh, have not been discussed within the boards in terms of the size of the structure or, or you know, it's, it's, it's just here's the, the latest offer on the table. Um, and I feel like those don't even get vetted before another offer comes up. Um, and so I, I would, um, uh, stand with the rest of my board members and that this is a priority for me to to uh, find a solution uh, on the best way to move forward with the medical examiner's office uh, I, you know I, I understand the importance of it and uh, and that you know the, the need that they serve uh, and I think it's just would you kind of, would you kind of anticipate us taking uh, us having this as some type of discussion for the next, for each meeting for a while. I mean, it seems like something I'd, that's- I'd be that's, happy to. I'd I mean, it just, to. it seems like there's a, it's enough of a dynamic situation. There's enough conversations going on amongst our, our three neighboring college, our three neighboring counties that it's probably something that we're going to have to discuss every time we're together for the next, you know, for the next couple of months. And, you know, and, and still trying to come to, trying to come to that eventual landing. But, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's good that we're having the discussion today. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I know the legislative request is in, uh, and I don't know how that can be, um, uh, you know, how that can be changed to uh, incorporate any changes that we may have in the next few weeks. I mean, I would love to see that. I, I, I don't want, you know, I'd appreciate, um, Right. You know, I mean, I think I called Senator Boxen. That's year what I was going to ask you. You're closer to Tallahassee than any yeah, of us. Yeah, I mean, I called him a year and a half ago, there. and I said, Senator Boxen, I, th I think we're not going to be able to get this across the line if, if, if you don't help us out a little bit. 
And, and so his willingness to, to, to put that as an appropriations ask uh, to support the district, uh, is, we're very grateful for that. And uh, I want to uh, 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 do everything we can to, to accommodate his uh, efforts. And, um, but at the same time, I, I, I do want to I do want to try to help our neighbors to the east that have been having a, you know, you have what, three commissioners over in Walton County that were sh former sheriff's deputies that have had to make the drive and sit in our facility. And, and uh, part of what I'm thinking is, is how, how much money could we save as a district just in transfer costs of, of bodies if, if that's cut in half, you know? I, I mean, they're not having to come here and they're not having to go back. And, um, you know, so, um, you know, I'd say my other other thing is is that this is a capital expense. I know we're not going to get 25 across the board, and and I've it's mostly what I've been working with with these other counties when when we talk is of saying, okay, what can you live with? Um, and but on the other hand, this is something that we all need. You know, I'm not saying that the the operational costs uh, are going to be split the same way if we spend if we use 45, 48% of, of the operational stuff, then we pay 48%. Um, but the, the building and the facility is needed throughout the district for all use. And I, I think we could come to a better agreement. So um, I, I think what I hear you saying, Commissioner Barry, is, is that, Craig, we appreciate the offer. It's, it's a very good start. I think it's, it's, it's the direction that we, we want to start going. Um, of, of course, you know, you can talk to us uh, and, and somewhat get where we're going and, and how we tweak that. But at the same time, I, I also want the other boards to have some input on this and, and see um, uh, how we can come to an agreement and, and, and get this thing. And maybe they'll off. watch, you know, maybe they'll watch our discussion in the same ways that we watched, you know, that we watched some of theirs. And, uh, and, and you know, and, and maybe it's a, it's a, you know, maybe it will be seen in some way as a, as, you know, as, as an additional, you know, especially our conversation about potentially putting some capital, you know, further east of here. It's just, it's, it's not the, it's, it's not the, the, the issue with doing it at all. It's just the number, <laughs> you know, it's just a number how, thing. I mean, exactly. how, how much are we talking about? So. And, and I, you know, like I said, I, when I met with Dan, I, I, and I don't know if you threw out a number, but I said, I'd be willing to at least give a million dollars towards that new facility without even talking to the rest of my board. Um, if it went to something like Okaloosa, you, you know, I mean, it, I don't know if, if we'd be willing to do more, but uh, I, I felt like that was at least a, um, a, a decent offering yeah. to, to show my commitment to, to help the other, not just put it on them. Yeah, that's not, I mean, that's not unreasonable at all. That's, I mean, that's, I think that's a, I, I, I'd be supportive of that. All right, Mr. Chairman, can I uh, make a few comments about this project? You're limited to three minutes. <laughs> hey, your, your birthday will still happen today. <laughs> I wasn't here, obviously, for those discussions. I've only met Dan twice. Um, I told you the first time I met you, Dan, I thought it was too big. I know it was too big because I, I designed medical things before. It was way too big for the scope of what we need to do. Mr. Coffey, I've never talked to you. Um, but I did go tour the building. And it is outdated. <laughs> it's, it, we need a new building. I'll just put it there without going through 30 minutes of joint commission regulations for y'all to be bored with. Dan, do we have a joint commission survey on that? I, I meant to ask you that in the past. They're not covered by the joint commission. Oh, yes, they are. Infection control, his two samples that are in the back, they have to, they have to. Uh, I mean, some of it, but I mean, right. it's, so, I so, mean, some of it, right, though? I mean, it'd be, right. it'd, be, it'd be the labs, but not. Well, they have labs in there. They have egress. They have ILSM. I, I don't, we don't need to go into that, but. Uh, I mean, I'm asking because I mean, I'm, yeah, I looked they, and they I, did, I didn't see where they, they were. Every, covered, every know, place where you're covered, doing so. any kind of thing in a medical facility, for example, in your biohazard area, which has had a closed block door, which I addressed with you, the porous floors, the chain of custody in, in the, I, and I, I mean, this isn't really necessary because I, I know what the issues are there. My concern is that the building is not set up. Okay, that's the first problem. We need to do something about the building. The second problem is, for me, it's not cost effective to have two buildings. I'd like to have the building in Escambia County. A medical, a forensic pathologist costs about 400K. There ain't that many of them. 
we need one building for a lot of reasons. You need one building for transport time, you need one building, you know, so you can consolidate efforts in that you're not driving. Uh, there's a lot of reasons from a medical reason you would want to have that in one building. Um, and, you, and I could provide lots of research on that if you guys are interested in that. But my thing is, I want it in Escambia County, but I think we're getting wrapped around the axle. I talked to two commissioners in Walton County, two in Santa Rosa. Walton County's willing to drive. Okaloosa, as you guys know, voted 5-0, was gonna put up three million. They're gonna vote four to one in Santa Rosa, it looks like, the other day. You guys decreased the imprint by six million, which I think was a very nice thing to do. Uh, I think you have too much reefer space. I think they need four plus one with a decom with a negative pressure room. You guys know that, you don't need six plus one. If you look at the metrics, you do about 25 autopsies a week, unlike healthcare. That's about 12 for Scambi County. So when we talk about funeral costs, it's a flat fee that go from point to point. That's point 2.3 runs a day. That's not that much. It's actually, and I think it's about $200 a run. Isn't that right, Dan? I think it is. I, I could be a little off, but it, it yes, you know. Sir, for, for our service, I don't know what the funeral homes charge the families when they come for pickup, because we transport to the facility, the funeral home transports from the facility back to their place. Right, but they're flat fees. Yes, sir. Right. And the other thing, um, I believe I believe this is correct. When Wes and I was at the um, legislative initiatives and the medical examiner talked, and I want to, I, I think I'm right on this. The senator said if you got three counties, he was in. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you got three counties except for us? Yes, sir. That's what I thought. Um, I think we should, we should do some modifications to get it right but I think we should support this. 13 to one right now uh, in one facility. And to put in context, if, in my district, in Jeff's, if you have a real incident with live people, it's farther to get to one of the hospitals than it is to take a deceased from where you guys are putting it from the hospitals. And the other thing is, the most important thing is the mission. The mission of the medical examiner is to identify the cause of death. And the cause of death is determined if that evidence can be used in a court of law for prosecution or it's a natural cause of death or whatever that may be. All this stuff about where we harbor that and what the greater good is should go back to the mission. And the mission is to make sure we give justice and find out what the cause of death is. And so I'm on board with you guys. I really appreciate you doing the six million decrease. I, I think that was a big move for y'all. I told you this, Dan, I said you have way too much space and uh, that meant a lot to me that you changed, you didn't even tell me you're doing it. I watched on Santa Rosa, so, um, but that was a good faith effort for me. Thank you. Well, great discussion. I kind of feel like I'm in church. There's nothing else to add. Um, uh, Robert, but one quick question. Um, is there anything with the appropriation that's conditional on the actions of the three commissions right now out of Broxton's office? I, I have to transfer to, defer to them. They're looking for a deal of at least three counties to move forward on the appropriations. Uh, but again, my concern would be that at least the deal that the other counties have passed is not what necessarily we have in front of us today. Well, we, we have the, the deal that we put out through the domes board. The, the way we were able to shrink square footage uh, potentially with the proposal we've given you more is, is to, to consider a split situation, which is not as efficient. But I, I, I think we're going we're gonna to try. Everyone wants to compromise and work with Escambia County. And if we can't, we might go back to an original proposal. So there's, we're basically trying to reach a consensus any way we can. So Mr. Chairman, I mean, I don't know if if we want to try to get members of a board all together or something like that to, to try to hash this out and see, again, I Well, I you said bring, put all three commissions together? All, all four, yeah, all four. And, and, you know, one representative from each or, or two representatives from each if you want to sunshine it and... No, um, I mean, I don't think, it, because I, I'm just, you I'm, don't have the, you, you would have to have the, the consensus of your board. Well, I'm just saying, I'm willing to do whatever to try to get, the, I mean, I just feel like the point where we are now is really what we should have been doing 
two years ago. Right, and I, and I think Commissioner Barry was pointing yeah. on saying it's going to take a lot of discussion and a lot of meetings. Maybe you know, in the next sixty to ninety days, we do call a joint meeting with all four commissions to get it um, able to, as we uh, flush it out here on our board, Robert. I, I'm I'm open to uh, supporting let's that, just, Robert. Let's let's keep making progress. Let's see what the other counties have. You know, in response maybe to our conversation today, see what they have to well, say. I mean, we, there's been a lot of progress made in just the last week, I, I last, guess, last week or two weeks. And, you know, I, I understand I understand there are time issues, but that's not, I mean, I, I'm not going to make my decisions based on somebody else's time schedule. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I guess part of it would be is, um, you know, if, if those other three go ahead and adopt what they have in front of them, what, what's going to happen? Well, then, I mean, we've got other options. I mean, okay. we're, we're moving forward at Sacred well, Heart. I mean, I'm, a, I'm asking I mean, Domes, I'm, ask, I'm asking Emmy's office if those other three ad, ad, adopt what, what they have in front of them. Then we'll, then we'll deal with that. Uh, I, I, that's right, not, I mean, right, I, but I just want to hear from, from them. Okay. Uh, you know, are, 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 are you guys still willing to work with us? Uh, uh, sir, we're still your district medical examiner. So, yes, we're still going to work with Escambia County to provide the service for the, for the residents of Escambia County. No, I know that. But I'm saying, are, are you willing to work on, on the current proposal that we have in front of us, even if the other three adopt the one that's in front of them? I, I think it would be a separate agreement, yes, sir, between, the, between Domes and, and Escambia County. If, if the other counties adopt an agreement that you're not party to, it would have to be a separate agreement, I think. I'm not a lawyer. but. I, I know, but I, you know, I mean, the, yes, we're we're going to we're going to keep working for for a solution. I understand that, that, but I, I guess what I'm saying is that you know, you, are you, you asking if we don't adopt this today, are they going to take it off the table? If that no, I'm not asking that. I'm asking okay. that 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 they they gave a April 17th deadline or whatever to to approve the one that the other three have. We we the, the deadline is based upon the the legislative cycle and the legislative. I understand, session. but I'm saying that are are you willing to to tweak that that they've approved? based off of what we have in front of us to try to get something or is or is I, I, it or think, yes there's okay. been no there's been no formal agreement presented to any any board it was the outline of a of a deal okay and that has been updated um through the chairman's discussion with you all um over the last week so yes we're going to continue to work on a solution but there is um with the legislative appropriation request there are some requirements that have been laid out to to have that continue to go forward this cycle and and let's talk after about what those are because maybe we've still met those and and that can move forward even if we're still working out the details and, is what i guess i'm also and, trying and to and say. i will tell you that that what i'm going to be trying to do and i've already set an appointment with the hospital administrator is to verify to understand really are the needs addressed you know, is the cooler, who's using the cooler? Is this, you know, small portion of the cooler? Is it all the cooler, autopsy space? What's the rent rate? Uh, what credit for capital improvements? How much are the capital improvements? Uh, and all those parking spaces even, uh, secure Sally Port location for uh, bringing, the, the, there's those things that I don't fully understand if we, if for sure those three things meet the needs that we need to meet, or maybe it does for a certain portion of the autopsies that are performed. And, and that's what I'm, I'm really trying to get to the bottom of the actual cost, because right now we have not received anything in writing for all this time. We have not, don't have a deal point from Escambia County or Sacred Heart that these are all the terms and conditions. So it's hard to brief the financial aspects of it because you aren't, you can't compare them. You don't sure. know, you don't know what they are. And, and listen, I, I, I understand that, you know, what I guess the, the current contract is between the ME's office or, or in domes or who's the lease with Sacred Heart with, with the well, ME's office. Okay, so, you know, I, I understand that, uh, you know, we're not a party to that, if, if you want to, so to say, but I, I, I believe it was in Commissioner Barry's good faith effort to try to address the concerns with capital improvement projects that probably weren't already in the budget to address those needs. And, and so, uh, again, I, uh, I appreciate Sacred Heart's willingness to work with us. You know, I, I, they're, uh, they're almost like an innocent third party uh, between all of us. And, um, and so I, I don't want to see them get caught up in, in all this. I just know that, that they've been very accommodating and, and have offered to do whatever uh, collectively we need them to. And, and I know that uh, that included trying to, I think, add like 1,300 square feet to the space that they were willing to move some things around or get rid of to, to, to help accommodate that. And, um, but, 
anyway, I, I look forward to continuing working with both of you on this and, and trying to find a, a path forward to, to deliver something for the medical examiner's office in the community. Thank you. I just have one question. I'm sorry, I didn't, I, it just came to my mind. In the deal for the 750,000 you put in there for the counties that didn't participate, you came up with the $2,000 autopsy. Those, those rates are ridiculously low. That was very fair to us. Um, how did you come up with that? Because I would have come up with a larger number. I know what the number is out of Jacksonville. How did you come up with 2,000? Because I think the board needs to know that was a very fair number to this board. That, that was a, a discussion about what, what based upon the number and, and one of the revisions we've been able to make is to um, track the county of residence of each decedent that comes to our case, not the place of death. Um, so that provides better accuracy um, for making sure that the taxpayers of Escambia County are paying for the services of Escambia County. Uh, we came to that based upon the debt service necessary to fund that smaller building, um, assuming that the, the cash up front and assuming some amount of, of state assistance over the next uh, year um, for the project. And that provided the, the debt service for the loan that would have to be taken out um, to, to pay. Well, I'll just say that's a very favorable number for us, and I know that, because that was one of the things from a business standpoint on the thing, I almost would say we maybe should have walked away for the 750,000, because that's extremely good rate for us. Just so you know, uh, Leon's is $800. Well, I understand, but I'm just telling you, you know, but, um, you know, and I, I think, um, and, and that was the thing, there were no terms over the length of that, of that fee, you know, I, I mean, if you want to address that on, on whether it would be, you know, is it once it's paid off, it's paid off and nobody pays it anymore and, and, and that's. I, I think all of that's negotiable and back to the fee, the fee was actually recommended much higher. The goal always is, you know, even if we can't agree today, can we bring them back in the fold? Can, sure. Is there another way to do it and not no. be punitive to a county? Because it, it I, you know, obviously I work for a county. I wouldn't want to be uh, anybody be punitive towards my county and, and we've got to work together. But there is a, a discount for being up front and taking the risk and all that stuff. And that's so. Uh, that's it. I mean, we, that's just the term we and, can work on. And we yeah. talked about that, and yeah. I appreciate it. And, and, and that's the, I guess the, you know, heartache or, or I mean the heartburn I had with it was that a lot of that wasn't in there. It was it was conceptual, um, and I and I know what you're trying. You know, I mean you're trying to get something across the line, um, but to truly vote on it, to give it up and down, I would I would need to s see an actual agreement. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not a problem. Wes, did you have anything to add? Not, not to that item, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, moving on to car 3-4, uh, broadband, broadband funding. This is requested by Commissioner Kohler, and we have one speaker, Mr. Keith Bow. This is an opportunity where we have funds to get freed up and put back into a common purpose because there's grant money coming from the federal government in this particular case. Well, in water mitigation, we have maybe two million here, three million here, four million here, you know, or whatever. And when we scoop that water, we're not retaining any towards water mitigation because all of the funds have been moved around. When a, a week ago, I understood that the Beach Haven uh, project was going to be fully funded. Now there's no phase three. Uh, phase two is going ahead, but there's no phase three, but there's a northwest and a south version. The south version only has $6,000. So let's put this with the $6,000. Let's put this with water mitigation. Even if we don't put it into the Beach Haven, it'll free up funds that will go to Beach Haven. So we can scoop water. If we take this little bit of money here, little bit of money here, little bit of money here, now we got a lot of money and it's enough money to get the job done. So a week ago, this job was, it was agreed on that we were gonna get the Beach Haven completed. Now, I wonder if $6,000 for the Southern portion is enough to even do the Southern portion of Beach Haven. Then we have the Northwest. I understand it's totally dropped out of the plans. Is the $6,000, $6 million, I'm sorry, put in million where I said thousand, 
I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, homeowner. But uh, <laughs> is it just for planning? Is it, or is it gonna get the job done? I don't see where six million is gonna, gonna get the job done when phase two costs 20 million. So we've gone, we've gone backwards on this. So let's take this money and some other money and let's work together. This, this could be the five fingers of the commission right here. Let's put them together and get the job done. Thank you. That's all the speakers, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kohler. Yeah, I just want to talk about this for a short second. Steve, you know that um, everyone on the board knows that I'm not against broadband. I was against the cost of it. And it's going to happen. I was at the broadband summit, and it, they're going to spend a lot of money. We're going to get another infusion of money into the county, according to the FCC, on the 30th of June. And all I'm asking here is that we look at phase two and what we had in phase one and put that back into ARPA funds and we use the infrastructure broadband that's going to be earmarked for that for future broadband. That's all I wanted to bring up and have on the record. Mike, I, I don't necessarily disagree, but here's the way I would nuance that. There's nothing that stops us with going after that money and just leaving what we've currently planned in place. Okay. And, then, and then if we get it, we can move the money around. I checked with the lawyer yesterday. I don't disagree with that. But We've got areas of this county that desperately need this broadband capability. We, Stevens worked very hard. I've worked hard. It's a big deal. Uh, I'm proud of the vote that we made to do it. I don't disagree with, with, with whatever you guys want to do and staff want to do, go after the money if there's a way to legally take that money back. As long as we get the project done, I'm fine. But, I, I, but when you say pull it, pull, I'm not going to pull back something that we voted for already. No, no, let me correct that. I'm not, not, not the 6.3 that we spent for you, Rick. I'm going to ask for that. Right. We put forth $22 million. We've got 15.7 that hasn't been allocated. All I'm saying is the future funds that haven't been allocated, we reconsider putting them into ARPA for infrastructure funds. And as we get the broadband money, which is going to happen, we use that for broadband. I already just realized that 6.3 is gone. Yeah, well, well even, even going forward, I mean, we've, we've, got, we've got an agreement that we're going to do. There's nothing that stops us from moving forward with that ARPA money for the broadband while, we, while you apply for the grant or the county applies for the grant. And if the grant comes in, then we move that money back. But I wouldn't want to move the money back until we got that money, right? Yeah. I mean, if that's what you're after, that's an easy one. Yeah, but, and I mean, we're going to, and we're going to, move forward with the phase two pretty pretty soon yeah. i mean that that's going out pretty soon and if these other funds come in we can backfill we can backfill the arpa money but you know what what's going to happen now that we've got the you know the contract signed with erec and everything um in 15 months or less um, our most rural constituents are going to have better service at their homes than the five of us do yeah and that, that, that is that's what's going to i mean that's what's going to happen so i mean it does you know it does come down to the other you know there's three hundred thousand you know, constituents, citizens, whatever left that aren't within this footprint we've done. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I can speak to it at my house. I mean, I, I want it, you know, and I know, and I, I know my neighbors do. And I, like I said, I mean, we're, we're going to end up with our most rural, our most rural residents with, uh, with services that exceed ours greatly. And it's, it's been, and it's exciting because it's also on the precipice for us. That's so right. We just, we, we just got to, now that we've ex and it's only since the last meeting that the contract's actually been signed and that's done. So that's great. So now we can move forward with that phase two that also brings in, you talk about a quality of life, that advanced traffic management system that's part of this phase two. Yes. You talk about traffic and stuff. I mean, it's going to move people like we've met, like our citizens have never seen. And that's, that's exciting. Right. It is. So Stephen, you know, again, we, we read these stories in the press and we have limited conversations here, but I mean, you agree with what I said. I mean, we move forward, and if we get the grant money, then we pull that money. If we get the grant money, that's fantastic. I, I know, uh, just uh, you know, no You're two things, that, no two oh. things are, no two things are the same. But you know, we've been waiting two and a half years for infrastructure, uh, federal infrastructure money to come through. Right. That was going to be able to fast track the interchange, fast track some other projects right. in the district, and um, that didn't happen. The funds fi funds came through, 30 months later, and all they did, uh, all they did was, fill out. The current work program cost overruns. That's it. Yeah. So no, you know, maybe the funds come in the summer. Maybe they don't. But if, if they, they do, don't, we, we, if, we should apply for it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So we we've, we've applied for the 247 million in broadband. No, we're we're going to move. I don't think that's available yet. But what we're we're going to I assume we're going to apply for everything we can because this next phase is going to be a. You know, the next phase, the, the first phase was very rural. You're running a lot of miles of fiber, but you're doing it in a very unoccupied area. 
And the next phase, because it incorporates the rest of the county, it's, uh, you know, it's much more dense. And I think there's going to be a lot of uh, vendors that want to participate in that area because of the access to the population. But you're also going to be working in, in very heavily trafficked areas. I mean, and, and that's expensive. I mean, you know, we see with road construction. So it's a big, so it's a big project. And, you know, I mean, we need to apply for whatever, whatever money is possibly out there. Um, uh, you know, the only thing we wouldn't have access to in the phase two would be specifically rural broadband, but because the rest of the county wouldn't qualify necessarily as rural, but it will, you know, there's going to be portions of it that are qualified, that are, that are uh, specific for low income areas, which we certainly have many of those. There's going to, you know, and then there's just the broadband build out in general, which we certainly qualify for. Okay. So who's leading that charge with that's applying for this? I mean, it hadn't come out yet. There's no it's not been, Yeah, it's not been. Uh, so where do we get the number yet. from? Is, is that an anticipated number or has it been an RFP and RFQ that say these, these funds are going to be available? Where did the 247 come from? I believe that's a number that may uh, have been uh, communicated at the Broadband Summit for a future, for a future announcement, but it's not been announced yet. So Formally. it could be 247 Formally. or it could not be 247. It, it actually is probably way higher than that, according to what the speculation was from the FCC chairman. Well, yeah, and, and that's fine, right? See, but, you know, in God we trust all others, right? It pay. I just hate, like, when you say it's going to be 247 or 347, the moment we see it from this dais, constituents begin to expect it. So, you know, when it's not a sure thing, I just don't like putting it on, on, on the record because we don't know. Well, there, here, here's what is on the record. $65 billion across the United States of America that's going to go for infrastructure. Every state's going to qualify for that. 30th of June, they're going to designate how much each state gets. At that time, they wouldn't give us a firm number. Robert was there, but there was speculation it could be up to a up to billion dollars. Now, I don't know what it's going to be, but that's a substantial amount of money. It is, but I mean, but it's so political when you say, I mean, you're right, it is 65. But... Well, it's, I can just tell you, you know, Florida is not in the best position with this administration, so you don't know what share you're going to get, you know, and that's just the way it works. But Lumen will have you be our representative Listen, there. I love it when Democrats and we get infrastructure money. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't spend all that money on social programs. Well, and that's the thing. It, it may, that may be going nationwide. We still got to get our part of it. Right, we but what, what I'm saying is, no, to, to my point, Robert, is this, and, and, it's, and, and, it's clear, right. we don't know. And right. the average citizen that's home saying, oh, are the reporters writing it? We don't know, and you give people false uh, narratives when you just pull the number out. And or say, you know, or I mean, we can't wait for that money to come in before we do I mean, this is, yeah. this is, I mean, you know, Doug's going to get good internet before the, the rest of us do. Right? <laughs> and, and, uh, but, 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 you know, there's a billion dollar in the clearinghouse if you buy this magazine. Maybe you'll get it if you buy this magazine. But the so, thing is, I mean, is, is that we've, yeah. we've I, I feel we've addressed the, the, the houses that are the hardest to serve. Oh, I, I absolutely. And I'm good with all that. I'm very supportive and, where we are. I'm, right. I, 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 had, I made one point with this, and I, I appreciate where Commissioner Coley is, where you are. There's one point that I made is that we are not for sure on any funding. As of now, the only funding that we can allocate and discuss is the funding that we have on hand. Yep. That's good stewardship. I mean, we can all pray and hope, you know, but I believe we know it's going to be something, but we don't right. know what that is. And so, I mean, I'm not going to give people, I mean, <laughs> politicians are good at giving people false hopes. I'm not going to give people false well, hope of something that's going to happen. Not only that, I'm but they, they tell that. you the money's coming, but then they don't tell you what the details are. Right, no. And as Commissioner Barry said, we're probably not going to qualify for the urban I mean, the rural broadband, because A, we've addressed it, but, but B, I mean, a lot of that money might be going to some of your smaller counties exactly. that are very r rural, yeah. and, yeah. and, and it, it goes there, right. or, you know, you, you got to look in the fine print, too. You do. Well, dude, we're, gonna, we, we're getting $15 million from Triumph Outline Field 8. How many times was that written about? Oh, no, we're not. We're really not going to get that. I mean, so that's why I'm saying we got to be careful with what we say. I mean, any more discussion? All right, Wes, let's try to get this thing in at three. least 3 o'clock. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Hey, you're going to be another year older by the time we finish this. Oh, yeah, miss my whole birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wanted to give me a gift, so everybody just made me stay in the meeting. Everybody, happy birthday. I've got your gift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your gift is you get to stay here with all your <laughs> friends. Oh, yeah, that's just what I wanted to do, stay here with all my Republican friends. Let's go. All right, let's go. <laughs> Car 3-5, uh, Mr. Chairman, is, is a 13.5 million rebuild Florida Hurricane Sally uh, grant. It, it's a competitive process. There's about 10.8 million 
uh, between Escambia and Santa Rosa uh, that we'll be uh, competing for. Uh, the minimum award is 500,000, maximum award is 5 million. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the examples are public facility improvements, including streetscapes, lighting, sidewalks, and other physical improvements to commercial areas. So to that end, uh, staff has put together projects that were kind of been on our radar that seems to meet that criteria. Uh, I don't know if y'all have had an opportunity to review them. Uh, the first is uh, for ECAT, it's 84 solar powered bus shelters with ADA upgrades. And that's for 3.5 million. Then you have Jackson Street sidewalks and drainage from 57th Avenue to New Warrington Road for 2.3 million. You have Palafox Street sidewalks from Highway 29 to Nine Mile Road for 5 million. You have W Street sidewalks from Airport Boulevard to Highway 29, 604,000. Hollywood Avenue uh, sidewalks and drainage from Massachusetts Avenue to Fairfield Drive, it's about 805,000. And of course, uh, as with these grants, uh, being in a low moderate income area, it rates you uh, the most points and makes you the most competitive. And you can submit three applications. This is just like the other process. We're limited to three applications, so what we're asking for is uh, direction on which three uh, we may want to apply for. Well, could we not combine the drainage? Well, did we combine all the drainage projects with us? That'll be the next item, uh, Commissioner. That'll be oh. car 36. Oh, okay. This is something a little bit different. I mean, can we can we combine the two sidewalk projects, the W Street and the, the W Street and the Palafox, or do we know? So oh, max max being five yeah, million. Then we're already uh, at the max. That's why. Million. Okay, so that's why it's not combined. Okay. Well, Commissioner May, seeing uh, seeing none of these in District Five. Um, <laughs> Uh, or you know, nuns in District One, either. And I, you know, I, 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 I understand that it's based on this low moderate income populations. I, I, I don't know exactly how that's calculated because I have a tremendous amount of poverty in District Five as well. But um, it didn't, you know, didn't, didn't, it didn't, didn't make it here. So, you know, uh, if we're looking at these, I mean, the, 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 it would seem like the Palafox Street sidewalks would be, would, would be one that would be. Uh, you know, would seem to be a good thing. I know there's been some fatalities in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it connects. I mean, all and Palafox would directly affect your district, and I mean, yeah. and, and a little bit with Jeff. Um, so, uh, it, could could we not? Uh, excuse me, Commissioner Barry, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Could we not combine the Jackson Street sidewalks and drainage with the W Street in Hollywood? That's one point. That's 1.4 plus 2.3, 3.7-ish. And then, and then that, those can be the, the three S, the ECAT, the 3.7, and then the 5 million. As long as we can combine them, that's, I'm, I'm good with that and move forward and, and move them all, move them all forward, basically. All right. Liz, can we do that? <laughs> um. I'm going to say that we probably can. I'll double check. The only thing that's going to change a little bit, they're all LMI areas. It's just the percentage, which I don't think is going to change. Our yeah, look, I mean, if it, the numbers are, you know, a little over, I mean, these are guesstimates anyway. I mean, so we should combine them and just make the numbers work and let's submit them all. Okay. All right. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm good with that. Yeah, just do them all. Yeah, if you've you got to change the numbers, some change the numbers. Okay. Let's do them all. So, I mean, why, is that a true estimate, the 3.5 for these bus shelters? I mean, where do we get that estimate from? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that estimate actually can be moved up and down, sir. So it's, it's not a true estimate. It's just we add additional costs that could be associated with that. Right, yeah. I mean, we, we, they're, they're, we've not actually priced them all out. In no, sir. Okay. Yeah. So make the numbers work and we submit it all. I mean, it's... it's all right. Yep. Move them all, Wes. Do we, we need a motion for that? No, I, I got the direction. All right. Okay. We'll move them all. I mean, we got to change those numbers, Wes, to make them work. Yes. All right. Okay, Wes. Let's. All let's right. Car on. three dash six. Uh, we have uh, several speakers on car three dash six. 
this is a Hurricane Sally. How rebuild. many speakers we have? Uh, we have nine speakers. Well, we're going to limit them to 12 minutes apiece. <laughs> you, Since y'all decided to ruin my birthday, I mean 13 minutes. So I don't your be first speaker is going to be Matt Trinka. Yeah. Sheila Bowen, you'll be next. Oh, looks like I think Matt left. Pardon? Yeah. Matt he Trinka, is he here? Yeah, he left. Okay, he left. Okay, Sheila. Oh, well. Sheila oh. Bowen, Chris Kerb, you'll be next. <laughs> My name is Sheila Bowen. I live at 1729 Bainbridge Avenue. Um, I've lived there, like I told you last time I was here, since I was eight years old, I'm 65 now. Um, I have, and over the years, I have seen a lot of problems in the area, like rain and flood. We are not a part of the Hurricane Sally re, um, infrastructure plan. We're just south of that line. And I, can, I do not understand why we can't be a part of it. It's two blocks from Group Hera to, um, to go, um, Guppy Highway. And we are in such desperate need there. I watched a girl one time, not once, just two or three times, walk to the bus stop, which is just short from her house, through water that's up to her ankles. She couldn't even wear shoes to the bus stop because she didn't have any other pair of shoes to wear. So that's what we need in our area, just south of Grapira. And um, we also need a road, a Heinrich Street, to put through across Bainbridge Avenue and that property and on to Augusta. We have a lot of problems with um, ambulances and fire trucks who comes down that road trying to get over there, and they can't. They have to go all the way around the block to get to where they gotta go. So that's another thing that needs to be done. Um, Bainbridge Avenue needs to be widened. It is now considered a one-lane road. You cannot put two cars down that road to where they don't have to pull, one of them has to pull off of the road to let the other one come through. We don't even have the sides of the ditches to be able to do that because we're really endangering our cars and the lives of the people in our neighborhood to do that. Um, like in front of my house, if we were to pull over in front of my house, my mailbox is going to go in the, in the ditch. And this is problems that needs to be done. It's never been addressed. The last time our road was. Um, Thank you, oh, Ms. I'm Bowen. sorry. Thank you. I appreciate it. Chris? Keith Bow, you'll be next. Thank you. Um, what Sheila's talking about is uh, Beach Haven Northwest Zone. Y'all sent this map out. Uh, I, think, I think at the last board meeting when we were talking about this, uh, uh, a lot of people are under the impression that that's what we we were trying to get pushed forward and then Beach Haven South got added to the list and Northeast got a grant for uh, blood resilience. So uh, there's six million dollars that you have put in there. I don't think that's going to cover your, your whole project cost. Uh, as I think that's a, probably a, 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 an old uh, master drainage plan from 2003 for that area. So. Uh, Maybe y'all could look at doing the design for both the Northwest zone and the South zone and get that and make, make a lot more people happy. Um, as far as uh, flood defenders is concerned, we want you to do, definitely do stormwater projects um, versus these other uh, quote, nice to have projects. Um, I think that, that you know when you're talking about Hurricane Sally stuff, I think you should be going with drainage and flooding type problem um, problems to correct and, and septic to sewer is also related to that as well so uh, i'm very encouraged to see that beach haven um, south zone was added as well as delano um, i did have one question though and, it, and i'm not sure why do came up with this that you only have three i mean don't they know that commissioners you have five commissioners in escambia county and five in santa rosa county they should let y'all have five of them and not three. We asked. <laughs> but uh, um, each project would count it as one application of the three unless you combined them. Um, I like the fact that they're allowing y'all to combine them, but uh, I did notice that a lot of these drainage projects, uh, well, most of them are in LMI areas. Chris, that's but there's a few that's not. Thank you. Thank you. Keith Bow. Chris, do you mean to yield, yield my time to you? 
Jim Member Kaufman, you'll be next. Commissioner May. All right, the CRA funding is going to sunset in uh, Beach Haven uh, in 2025. The, uh, that's a lot of money that could go for sewer to septic that is just going to be lost because we keep postponing getting this done. I'm with Chris Kerb. I don't think that we're going to get the uh, lift station put in, the road improvements put in, the drainage put in. Uh, with the $6 million that is allocated, considering that it's $20 million allocated for the uh, north, uh, northeast phase. The northwest phase has been totally eliminated, and let me tell you, every time it rains, their streets get flooded from one side to the other. Why did the water cross the road? Because it had no drainage. It's real simple, but it takes two weeks for that water to mitigate. So it's just pretty well common sense that we can take all of these little funds right there, whether we free them up from somewhere, let's grab up a scoop of water and let's get it out of there. And uh, I do appreciate all of you working with uh, our commissioner, Mike Kohler, uh, who is definitely working to improve the entire county as a whole, five fingers together on one hand. I think we can get it done. Thank you very much. And once again, happy birthday. Thank you, Mr. Bowe. Mr. Kaufman. Glenn Conrad, you'll be next. Hey, guys, Jim Kaufman, uh, chair of the Warrington Revitalization Committee, and I've come before you today to speak uh, in support of the stormwater mitigation and septic to sewer conversions over in the west end of Warrington. There are uh, a lot of great uh, opportunities listed here or proposals for the money that's been uh, predicted in the grant, and I, th I think some of them are great, but then some of them are not so exciting, like improving some existing buildings that could potentially be used to house people that are the victims of flooding. Uh, from the standpoint of the people who live in the West End of Warrington, the opportunity to have some place to stay for a night every 10 years when your home is flooded with your, with your family, your children, your wife, uh, versus your home not flooding I think uh, I don't speak for everybody, but I personally would want to ride out the storm in my own house, secure in the knowledge that it will not flood. Uh, these other these other items, the infrastructure programs for base center upgrades, Ashton Brosnan indoor multi-use sports facility, and the ECAT, that seems like the sort of thing that might come out of the normal budget. Additionally, there are schools and churches funded by the government and by the private sector all over this town that are currently being used whenever there is a need to house people that are the victims of flooding. Uh, I'll use the last few seconds to appeal to your sense of pragmatism uh, and talk to you about a cascade of positive benefits that come from resolving these flooding issues over at the West End of Warrington. Uh, you get increased property values, which are going to bring increased tax revenue. You're going to unlock a lot of underutilized affordable housing out at the west end of Warrington, and there's no small amount of that. There's plenty that just can't be used now because of all of the flooding. Uh, you're going to improve the health of the wetlands, waterways, and bayous, and you're going to eliminate a lot of flood victims having to Thank wander you, around Coffin. and look for housing. Thanks. Glenn Conrad, Michael Jones, you'll be next. Thank you, Wes. I'd like to use some of my 12 minutes to wait for Commissioner May and Burgosh to come back. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, so I agree uh, with the prior, prior speaker that the rebuild, the Sally Infrastructure Grant Program should be used more for stormwater, septic to sewer, those kinds of things, as opposed to some of these projects that seem, would seem to be more along the lines of the normal budgeting process, like the sports complex. We've had some problems with those in the past in the county. Uh, some of the repair, we should be planning for repairs for facilities. Uh, Areas that need the stormwater infrastructure have never had it. They still need it. Warrington, Beach Haven, uh, other parts of the county still need this now very much. Um, I think that there are, as was mentioned, other facilities. They're called schools and churches. They're used now for shelters. They generally have um, cafeteria, kitchen facilities and people have slept in them before. Uh, so we have these things, although I can appreciate the linguistic gymnastics that was done in describing some of these projects, these very high dollar projects 
that if they don't come in under budget or within these estimates, are probably going to exceed vastly what the grants are, posing another problem to the county in order to fund and complete them. So uh, my argument here is prioritize the stormwater projects, prioritize that kind of resilience uh, infrastructure that can be built with this money, and that's an entirely appropriate uh, set of projects to use these monies for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael Jones. Ryan Bell, you're on deck. I was going to wish Mr. May a, a double birthday today since we've been uh, over time a little bit. Um, but let me get to the point. Uh, Mike Kohler, you've done a wonderful job in District 2. You've presented so much that is to the people in Beach Haven. Um, and so I am here uh, this afternoon, actually, uh, to support your game plan that is concerning the monies here because I think that um, you have well articulated uh, something that needs to be uh, done. And so I'd like to thank you. And the people before me, like Keith Bowe, uh, also, Chris Kerb and uh, Glenn Conrad, they have made a compelling case as to why this needs to be done. And I'm hoping that all of you guys would listen, that is, to the voices of those of us who find ourselves without. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ryan Bell, is Ryan Bell still here? All right, uh, Shirley Green, you'll be our last speaker. Hello again. Um, yes, thanks for having all this interaction. Um, I'm all for the package deal of the $46 million to get the storm drainage going. I know that doesn't give us any income or a whole lot of tax bases immediately, but the long term is. Um, everything everybody just said, Keith and Mike and Glenn and all, I agree with 100%, so ditto on that. Also, we have our water quality overall. I know I've been um, Mr. Boudreaux with the Northwest Florida Water. I keep in touch with him, the estuary system, a lot of different things. A lot of the storm, the sewer problems go into Bio Grande at, and Bayou Chico. Those both go into Pensacola Bay. Pensacola Bay water quality matters. When I lived, we had our own little shrimp boat back in the 70s and 80s, and we used to go out and huddle up and go out and get our these great big, wonderful, nice big old shrimp out in Pensacola Bay, and then things got too polluted, they stopped it, and then it was only for commercial. That all in the realm of things, but the, the critters that were in the water were so much more plentiful and healthy than they were, and part of that is stormwater runoff, and we all know the pollutants more so in um, Bayou Chico, then in Grande, but it's a package deal. And I'm so encouraged by hopefully you guys working, like Keith said, with the five fingers to scoop it up and keep it moving. And we know Pensacola is moving toward the west. You know, I've heard theories of we're going to be the next East Hill. Well, let's start cleaning it up now. Let's start getting it going. Um, like I said, I appreciate you all hearing all of us, and I am all for all the storm drainage rather than piecemealing the little three to five to six million dollar pieces together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. That it concludes our speakers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Board. Thanks, uh, Chairman Barry. I'll just talk for a second about this. So, I obviously. Feel your, feel your concerns, the people that live in Beach Haven. Um, this project, if you read it, there's three things that we can do as county commissioners. So when we did our legislative initiatives to the state, the first thing that we said that we wanted to do was try to lower entrance rates. This board voted unanimously for that. Really, as a county commissioner, there's only three things I can do to help you out with that. I can have a stormwater drainage plan that decreases your, your housing insurance so you don't flood. I can put a firehouse close to where you're at so your ISO standards are right. And I can fund the sheriff's department adequately so the crime rate hopefully goes down. That's it. That's what I can do for you. This grant, the intent of this grant was for hurricane sally damage for low, modern income people. 
There's no people, well, Oakcrest is in there as well, that is a very applicable, uh, and several of the other ones, but the people along Beach Haven, and Chris, I hate to tell you this, when I was reading through the background data, there was a document with you as the point of contact. That's how long this has been going on. And I thought it was, I, I'm not joking. This has been going on way too long. The people in Beach Haven deserve to have this, and I hope the board supports it. Board, any other comments? Mr. Chairman, so of this list, I mean, we're moving forward with all of these, is my understanding, or do we have to whittle it down? We got to whittle. It? Okay. Uh, yeah, I believe we've got to whittle it down. Yeah, we got to whittle it down. Uh, we, 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 there's a possibility we can stack some of the drainage projects. But I, don't th I don't think we're going to be successful if we try to stack all of them uh, in one package. We've asked that question. Maybe a couple. We might be successful, but it was, we didn't get very, very positive feedback on taking all the drainage projects and stacking them into one project. So what's you asking us to put three projects up? Because that's what the instruction, or we say no, we're going to we try to stack, stack a we couple. Stack we told, we've been told we can stack them. Um, we, we'll, we'll have three applications. How will we form Three applications, the, the okay. couple projects. Okay, so we're going to move all of this stuff. We're just going to put them into. Th well, I don't know if we're going to be able to move all of it. Uh, and and uh, the discussion I have with DEO is, I mean, of course, if uh, if you when you package them, they all live and die by the same sure. application. Right. Um, and so uh, I'd say I know Liz sent out some good information today um, that, that talks about the percent of LMI for each uh, or for most of these projects. And I, I really think that we need to consider that to, to, uh, as we look at, at how we can either consolidate, you know, if, um, you know, of course, the city's already gone in for 48 million or something of the right of the whatever. Um, and I, I think the way it's going to work is if uh, more projects come in than money that's available, that your your non LMI are going to be cut first. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I appreciate all the uh, comments to have uh, a new sheet of ice uh, included in the mm -hmm. in the Ashton Brosnahan indoor multi-use sports facility. Um, and and Steve and I, I support this 100%. I just don't know if this is the, the avenue for it. And and I, I will do what I could to help a Triumph grant because I think that could be a really uh, great option for this. Yeah, we're going to we're going to get this project done. Yeah. So I mean, it's, you know, exactly exactly how we exactly how we fund it is, is maybe up in the air. Um, this would, uh, you know, this would potentially uh, alleviate you know, alleviate some of the pressures um, that would come on other uh, on other sources or other other projects or other funds that we that we have or will collect uh, through our uh, through some of our partners over the over the coming years. You know, so it would alleviate some of that pressure. Um, but I mean, we're 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 gonna we're gonna get this we're gonna get this project going. We're gonna get this project funded. We're gonna get this project done. Um, however, you know. This is, uh, um, you know, as, as, as my dear friend, the chairman, you know, has said many times, it's, uh, you know, there's some, there's some give and take on this. And, uh, you know, something, even though it's, it's extremely important to me, and I think it's, a, it's, it's important to me, but I also think it's a fantastic idea. I think it's hugely needed. Um, we have, I think we've seen through the soccer tournament as well as through the Sunbelt basketball tournament very recently, we are a potential uh, destination for many, many sports fans. And we have many, many of our citizens traveling every weekend for, uh, for, for tournaments, you know, all throughout the, uh, you know, throughout the Gulf Coast, even throughout the Southeast, you know, with their, with their uh, youngsters in their house playing, you know, playing different sports, whether it's basketball, volleyball, you know, the ice, uh, you know, the ice hockey is certainly an option. But basketball, volleyball, those are, those are, It's, it's very important to me. However, again, you know, this is a, this is a back well, I mean, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it fits here. And that's, that's the point. It doesn't mean it fits here. There's a competitive t nature to the, uh, there's a competitive nature to the process. Right. And, you know, given, given that competitive Well, see, nature, I don't know if you ought to pull it. I mean, honestly, I mean, we're going to spend other projects. I mean, you know, and we do need another shelter. I mean, I, I would, you know, I see CAPS is here. I mean, you know, 
not only have I enjoyed the pleasure of being down at a Sunbelt basketball game, but I've had the nightmare of going down during a hurricane when there was no other shelter other than the base center. You know, and so, I mean, I think on, on that north end, we do need another shelter. I mean, although it's going to be double use as an indoor multi-use facility, uh, the number one thing is uh, for shelter in the time of a storm. And, you know, that's how Santa Rosa County built their community center. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm not opposed to it. I mean, nothing fails but a try. I mean, I can just tell you, I don't even know. I would, Wes would help me or Mike. I mean, how do we come up with 2.5? In my mind, you know, I would have put more in for Pensacola Bay Center unless, you know, the 2.5 encompasses every single thing that I could do uh, as it relates to hardening of the surface, uh, hardening of the, um, of the building and things that we can tie uh, to a disaster relief. I mean, because. Commissioner, I'll tell you, back to the, the this, this, you know, kind of negotiating back and forth. Um, in light of maybe some of that discussion, if if, um, if we move forward with the Ashton Brosingham and maybe, um, you know, if we're if we're limited and don't move forward with the base center ask of that 2.5, um, if you know if we're successful on the on the Ashton Brosingham, it'll be very very easy to find 2.5 to uh, to do those improvements at the base center, because like I said, what, whatever funds we can get towards the project at Ashton Brosingham, will alleviate will alleviate other sources for us. I, yeah. you know, and my question, Steve, was 2.5 enough? I, well, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, to me, it's low. You know, I, I mean, I, and I, I guess what's, how do we derive all of these numbers? I mean, I mean, did we just, I mean, we, was it best guess estimate? Did, I mean, how do we create the schedule of values for each of these projects? Yeah, I would say, yeah, best guess estimates, uh, along yeah. with some factual um, data mingled in there uh, from, from prior knowledge that we, that we have on hand. I mean, yeah, because I mean, I mean, I would, Steve, I'd have to see if these projects were created by historical data uh, or, or just, as you said, best guess estimate. I mean, you know, in this world of construction, I mean, it, honestly, I mean, it, it changes 120% every day. You know, I'm a builder. It changes, you know, that 20,000 really could be 40, I mean, 20 million could be 40 million or it could be 15 million. I mean, we just don't know. Well, for, I mean, We've, I think we've got a pretty good idea that the, the overall project cost is going to be a lot more than that. Yeah, this that's is, what I'm this, saying. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a uh, you know a, a portion of the you know portion of the pro of the project cost. So well, I, I mean, I guess we're trying to get to where we can only submit three of these projects. Is where we're going? Yeah, and I, I mean, the city submitted 47 million. They're just a city with, right, you know, they, they, with, with they, only 25 percent of our population. Uh, and and that was the I mean, I I went over there and I I talked to the the people that are are. Um, you know, going through these applications, and, and I, I asked if we could do more than three. I, I was going for five, and that may be uh, some of, uh, you know, I mean, 15 possible points for homeless shelters and So facilities. the city put three million projects in at 47 million is what I'm hearing? Three projects, yeah. Well, they put all of the uh, Hollis T. Williams 31 million in. They don't have any, any funding to, to help that. But, you know, there are 15 possible points for homeless shelters and facilities serving as shelters during disasters, but... You, you also have 30 possible points on an L mine, and I, um, you know, again, I, I, I work with Stephen any way I can to help get that thing across. It's, it's just I question these LMIs. I mean, and, and that's not yeah. it, it, because I'm telling you the you know, Gonzalez, Gonzalez, Cantonment, um, you know, the closest LMI. I mean, the the the, the only LMI or the one it primarily shows. Uh, you know, encompasses the university. I presume that's because of the income reported of students that are that are, you know, on on campus. Yeah. You know. Well, that's okay. That, you know, it's debatable whether the surrounding residents that are our taxpayers, you know, our, our property taxpayers at least, it's it's probably debatable if that's an LMI area if you don't consider the students. So you know, so I'm not sure about that. But then I, I don't understand how it hasn't encompass some of the other areas of Cantonment and Gonzales and that would be served by that would be served by the by the by the center I mean you know but to that matter the, I mean the base center I mean it's it's maybe literally it's not in an LMI but it's it's not it's it's blocks mm -hmm. from you know what has to be LMI areas I mean it, so you know well it was built by LMI area. before we tore down Aragon Corps yeah, that kind, of, that kind of changed it just a little bit. Yeah, the demographics. The demographics, demographics change. south of the base center have changed. <laughs> yeah, they changed They've they, changed it. <laughs> they built the base center, then they ran them out. I, I guess what I'm trying to say, though, is, is that we have, what, 12 drainage projects in here. 
for a total cost of 46. Do we still have the same $5 million cap, though, per application? 750000 Huh? It has to be at least 750000 Yeah, but I thought there was also a cap. No. Well, how's it cap? I'm the city. No cap. cap how could it be so cap? I thought it was not on the. Okay. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah. So, and uh, there's no way we, we're saying we can't combine these stormwater No, we, we can combine some, but I, I, they cautioned in, in, a, in combining too many of them because you would. They. Instead of a project standing on its own, uh, of that might be, you know, I think one of the ones that we have is like 80% LMI. It, that gets blended with the 50% LMI, and, and now what's really served as a as a strong applicant for that project has has been muddied by one that although qualifies is not as strong. Um, and and so I, I, listen, I think there's some great projects in here. Um, but I, I think we should probably. So, are there any connectivity to any of the drainage projects? Why don't we, the ones that are connected? Can, can I just highlight uh, the policy just so I make sure that we don't do something that we could lose? I just want to make sure collectively it's not about just Beach Haven, but that we put projects up that are competitive. When you look at what Santa Rosa put up, they put all stormwater <laughs> drainage and they're all in LMI. And if you look at five, it says it has to tie back to Hurricane Sally, has to support low, uh, low moderate income housing. Over here, has to demonstrate tie back to Hurricane Sally. Okay, it has to be damaged to Hurricane Sally, water and sewer facilities. So if you read through this, I've read through it multiple times, the stormwater drainage projects look to me like they're gonna get funded. It doesn't have to be Beach Haven, but to, it seemed to me that would where we'd wanna put our interest wherever they are in the county to get the funding, and I hope you all see it the same way. Well, so, we, we, we should be making a commitment with local dollars to drain. Commissioner, if you don't, Liz, do you mind coming forward? This, the LMI stuff, so. Tim, you may want to come forward as well, Tim Evans. I'm, in looking at this map, it doesn't even show that Century is LMI. Century is definitely LMI on well, our map I'm, at the very top. It, uh, I don't think she included, because uh, the city of Pensacola is not in the map, so I think that's only oh, Escambia County, okay. so I think it excludes the, the I think it excludes the municipalities. You would, you would think so. Uh, so, how come Avondale is not? I mean, there are areas of Avondale in my district, parts of Beulah, I mean, the, the, uh, District 1 is totally excluded from all of this. The yeah. LMI, the, the, the percentage of LMI in an area is based on a census tract block group. Uh, and as you're probably aware, census tracts are built around population size. So in some areas where there is denser population in the more urban parts of town, uh, the LMI communities uh, are obvious. In other areas where there is less dense population, uh, Cantonment, for instance, there are some areas that one would assume would be easily highly, uh, a high percentage of LMI, but because of the way the block group is structured, it also captures a number of neighborhoods that are not low income at all, which, which counterbalances those low income areas in some parts of our community that we anticipate would be LMI. So in other words, if you're a poor person or you're a group of poor people, but you live very close to rich people or wealthy people, you're stuck. You're not, you're not gonna be able to get any of this. Uh, that's one, one that, way to I mean, look at that's it. Because I know the areas of District 1 are, I mean, there are areas that I've walked door to door campaigning and they're very poverty stricken. I mean, they're tight trailers, I mean, off of Highway 98, but how come, I mean, there's none of it. None of it in my district is in this map. But is it because they're too close to affluent? It, it's just the mix of demographics within that census block group. Which is not set by us. Yeah, no, I know, I know. It's just fr it's frustrating because my constituents that, are, that aren't wealthy are gonna say, how come we're not getting a piece of any of this? And I'm gonna have to look them in the face and I'll say, well, look at the meeting. I mean, that you know. What's the criteria for LMI? Uh, for an LMI area to be determined, at least 51% of the residents of that area have to be low income or below. Low income being 80% of area median income. How did we collect the data to determine that? Uh, we were using an, uh, a mapping 
application from HUD's website. Uh, the data is based on 2011 through 2015 uh, American Community Survey information, and it is what is current for HUD right now. Right, but I mean, and I, I got it, and I knew that's where you, you're going, but drastically the demographics have shifted since then for our, for our county, probably more so than many places. That, that, so what I'm saying, the reliability of that data could be flawed in, in, in a little way. Would they take us with our own data? I mean, or do we have to go by the HUD data? That's, I, I mean, I mean, be stuck using HUD's data. And is, is that, I mean, one of the requirements in the request for proposal is that we have to use HUD data, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, in the application process, it asks specifically. For the HUD data. And I, that's probably what everybody is using, I would assume. But it hasn't been updated in, since 2015. So. Yeah, I mean, that's flawed data, 2015. I mean, that's inconsistent. So, I mean, which I'm very surprised. Maybe that's what they're requesting. I mean, I would appeal that and, and, and question that. I mean, to me, that would be a, a request for information, I, in my opinion, to ask them that. I mean, because you want somebody to use some data that's, that's history. Right? That's not data. That's history. For all of our HUD, all of their grants that they come through uh, Neighborhood and Human Services, they use the HUD LMI data. I, 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 I might be valid, but again, it's still history. I mean, whether they use it or not, it's not valid. Chris is probably on the edge of the seat talking about how old the rainfall data is that we use, you know? Yeah. Uh, so. Well, I mean, I, I don't, <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, hey, whatever, but, but, I, but I, I, mean, I could care less. Um, but is, is the percent, is that taken in, or is it just a check that it's more than 50% LMI? So if it does an LMI of, of 84 have any more weight than an LMI of 60? Yes. yes. It does. It and just has to hit the 51% mark to be checked, yes, LMI. And then anything above that, the higher, the greater points that get. Okay, so I, so, uh, so thank you for sending that. So I'm, I'm trying to like come through. I mean, I, I don't know if we just want to sort of kind of go through this and, and see what rises to the top, but the Delano Street area drainage project um, is. So Commissioner Bender, we had to remove that. Oh, we did, okay. Because it was not part of the original list, it was added late. Okay, so when is this due? Uh, April 4th. We have a week and a few days. So it wouldn't make the 14th. So days. What, what's the gist of what you're trying to do, Robert? Do you want to go through this list and pull out the ones that aren't LMI? Is that what you're getting at? Uh, part, part of that and then try to, try to even see which ones have the higher, I mean, like I'm looking at the city's Fricker Center it's a it's a shelter that they could use, so that's 15 points, and it's an LMI, so that would they they they're getting, you know, a good number of points right off the top for that. So, I I, I have a an idea of what I have to do to be competitive. Um, but yeah, I, I think LMI areas would. I'm would. not sure if it helps at all, but engineering team did put together their priority list, and we got specific percentages on those. Um, Beach Haven was about 82, which is the highest. Oakfield Acres came in. Well, what, what are the percentages you're stating? So Beach Haven for one block that this project would cover was 83%. LMI, is that what you're talking about? LMI, yeah. And then the second block that would affect that project was 81. And then Oakfield Acres came in, all of them were above. There was three blocks that were affected for that, one at 63, one at 55, one at 64. And then Carver Park was also 56 was over. Those are the, the main ones. Olive Road was a good one, but it covers four blocks, and one block did fall underneath the 51. It was at 42. All right. We go through the money real quick. So there's 67 gross or 57 gross? So there's 67 total, but 80% of that will be spent between Escambia County and Santa Rosa. Okay. So that's the 57. That's, so that's, that's our number. All right. And... There's not a portion of that that's going to be dedicated to projects in Escambia County? No. Hypothetically, the, All competitive. But hypothetically, it could go 100% to Santa Rosa County. Hypothetically. Steve, but it's I actually 53. It's not 57, guys. It's 53. Okay. Right. And what's the LMI for PHS uh, drainage on D Street? I don't see how the LMI for Carver is still. I, I know you said it's one of the higher ones at 50 something percent, but how's it not 90? I don't understand this. Well, it's the census tract, so it's, you know, I mean, it's, and those are, are just, it's like, 
you know, Jack drawing lines around stuff, you know? Man, it's fl flawed it's data. I don't even know if we keep discussing that This data. is the way that the, the, the RDOF funds for FCC were done through census tract stuff. Right. And, I mean, it was, you know, I want to say there were... So, so Liz, what were some of the census tracts were very small. It was like there were census tracts I, I remember I, I seeing out of that been. data was, you know, there were 80 people on a census well, tract. And that's like when we were doing the redistricting and you're having to click on each little block. That's what happened. And it was so ruled and, and spaced there, out. There's one that's a couple of houses next to the one that's a thousand houses or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just there's no rhyme or reason or anything. So you, you think, think, think for this, if you had a, a housing project within a census tract versus you just had people sparingly spaced out in Carver, I mean, your percentage would be a lot higher because you'd have more households. And, and I'm sorry, I, I know you want to ask a question. So yeah. in this, the decision makers mm -hmm. are going to be who exactly? So a DEO is um, who is going to be receiving the applications and reviewing them. And on then behalf it's in of connection HUD? with HUD. Mm -hmm. On behalf of HUD or mm -hmm. in, so DEO is who's scoring it, or HUD, HUD's going to be scoring it with them? Um, DEO is a direct grantee from HUD, so DEO is responsible for the distribution of these funds. Solely? Solely. Okay. Are they, how, are they going to be distributed? Is it simply a points basis? I understand there's points being attributed, but, I mean, we attribute points to things and then we vote. So, I mean, it, it's, is it, are they saying it's a, it is going to be, they're going to sweep, you know, they're going to start with, you know, 100% of the money, they're just going to go project down, sweep the money off the top? That is my understanding. Yeah. It's a points basis application process, competitive. Mm -hmm. And so the application scoring the highest points will be those that get funded. And that's, uh, so there's going to be no subjectivity into it. You're saying it's going to be point based and that's it. And basically, if, if you're talking about 57 million gross, say, the, say project number one is $20 million project, project number two is a $37 million project, then your funds are done. So that is what you're understanding and how the process no. goes. No. So when I spoke to DEO, let's just say 67 million, let's say they get projects for 100 million. First thing they look at, because they're required to do the LMI first as priority. So any projects that are not in an LMI area, those ones are cut off the top. If they receive a total gross request more than more than their okay, amount. Yes. yes. So in the city, you said Santa Rosa County only submitted 7.5? 7. 7. Okay. And so the city submitted 47? Yeah, but their port, I can't remember what they asked for that. That's only in a 25% LMI area. So but I'm saying, but the total two. submitted, you're saying DEO is going to assess it by total submitted project request, right? First and, thing, and yep. So that's going to be the first, that's the first method. LMI and, areas will be cut off the top okay. of right But what, what I'm saying is if the, if the project, as long as we submit more than $13 million of projects, based on the numbers you've given me, as long as we submit more than $13 million of projects, which we will, then the first thing that's going to happen is any non-LMI project is going to get scrubbed out of the request. Correct. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And you're 100% sure of that? Yes. Okay. Then, okay. And the city's already submitted theirs or draft? They've, they've done it? Okay. Well, if, if that's their number they've submitted, we know what Santa Rosa County submitted. Obviously, we're going to submit more than $13 million, so it doesn't sound to me like we can submit any project that's going to include something that's not LMI or your now I'm going to tell you Liz my dear friend and I have been told many things over the years from the podium that says absolutely this and absolutely that and we make decisions based on it and they don't end up being true and this is based this is not you this is based on history it's by I mean Dewberry engineering this is still probably spending the millions of dollars that we gave them because we were told we absolutely had to hire them because they're going to help us get hundreds of millions of dollars after whatever yeah. And it's yeah. and that's just one that's one just one example of many of these. You're saying based on exactly what has happened, if we submit more than thirteen million dollars of grant request, that's gonna exceed the gross number that they have available, meaning Santa Rosa County, the city of Pensacola, and our applications will be scrubbed. Anything that's not LMI will be immediately eliminated. That's that your is over sixty seven million, yes, the max. That's what you're saying. Yes. The second right. thing that they did say is that Obviously, we're, let's just say all of ours are LMI applications and it exceeds. Not as easy as a, a line. So they will look at partially funding things. So like if we submitted ECAP for $20 million, But that's, that's assuming they're all LMI. Correct. Then so, okay, I'm not sure we're on to the second point yet. So the first point is I don't see how we submit any, and this is kicking my, kicking my project out, but just based on expert testimony, I don't see how we submit anything that's not LMI. That was that was where I was going, Stephen. Okay. All right. So let's just scrub. So 
that's that's Ashton Brosenham out. That's Bay Center out. And you go through the list that's got multiple projects. You have to kick the ones that aren't that don't have L. Nine now. ten. Well, see now, see now, see now, see now. I, that. If what she's saying is true, <laughs> that's that's what we. That, that, think, and what and, we and I get do. that, but 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 as we put this together and presented it to the public and had people uh, with the idea that these things okay. would be presented, I mean. Well, you know, maybe 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 this some of this conversation would have been about valuable last time before I put the list together. I mean, if well, I, I mean, I don't I, think Mike Caps would have wanted to spend his time on this if he knew it. That but it I, I think part of it was was that we wanted to just go ahead and list the project so that we met the requirement of you know so we didn't have the Delano issue where it wasn't. But if, if, but if a project was not in an LMI, LMI was never eligible, it should have never been on the list. Well, I, again, we that, were, try, we were trying to get line, that information. Now, I mean, we, I, mean, well, I, I didn't I meet with DO until a couple of weeks, you know, for, for what's worth. I, I talked to someone else who has gone through this process before, so Stephen, to hopefully answer your question. His, his uh, would say, I would tend to focus on LMI projects as they have a much higher probability of award than non-LMI. They, well, they have a much better so probability, it's, it's, but it's, it's not, not an the, absolute. Well. But we've got, I think Wes is doing a great job. Wes, I think Allison's doing a great job. That's the two employees I have some input over there, over their employment statuses. I think, I think they're both doing a great job. Everyone else either works for, it works for one of the two of them. Liz works for Wes. I, you know, I've got no input over, over, over her job, but my conversation with Wes will be if, your staff is saying not likely to be funded is different than it's getting scrubbed out. If she's saying it's getting scrubbed out, then to include, so if we include a group of projects that includes some non-LMI with LMI, they're being treated as one, as one request. And what she's, what she's saying is if we submit that as, one, as, as a group that includes a non-LMI, then it's going to kick the whole request out. I, I don't think it would kick it out, uh, but I think it would it would diminish its well, score. That's what she's saying, Robert. No, I, I don't Commi you, commissioners, you, know, you know more than I do. You know more than I do. Commissioners, but that's not what she's saying. Commissioners, we contact <laughs> DEO every almost every day. She's on a first name basis uh, with our contact. We've asked we've asked this question. We we are simply reporting uh, what has been communicated to us from DEO. I was on a phone call with Robert and Joy Blackman. Uh, I mean, uh, it's all we can do is communicate the information that's communicated to us. So, Wes, the recommendation is three projects, right? I mean, that's what everyone well, submitted. That's what the policy. That's, that's that's just constraints. That's what the other policy other. says too. That's what the other bodies have done. Well, I they think said that, we can. We, they said we could stack. But. Would we put ourselves at risk, Robert, by doing it? It depends on what you stack it with. I mean, if you stack two. LMI projects that that are strong projects, then I think you have the chance of both of them getting funded because they they would both stand on their own merit, and and they're they're both stormwater projects. You know, I mean, I think if you could find a link to them or something like that, that would be even better. But I, I think they could stand on their own. But I think if you did one non LMI and an LMI, you've diluted your your score. So would you think that, Rob, I mean, how did you conclude that? I mean, I, there, there's one thing to say, you know. Based on our, uh, the, the meeting that I had with him in Tallahassee. Okay. That's fair. We could have saved some time. So, we're, well, we're going to make a decision to get out of here. That's what we're going to do. Sure. Um, so, well, obviously, if we're being told that we got to take the Bay Center out, I, I don't understand that. I get that it's not an LMI, but if, if it's something when you have a homeless problem, you have a a a, a shelter problem during the storm, uh, I would think that DEO a shelter would fall on receiving years, whether it's in an LMI or not, because shelters are not necessarily going to be in a low moderate income area. That's not where they existed to be. I mean, they're going to be centrally located uh, for the good of the community. So, I mean, maybe it's out of that geographical area, but I, I'm telling you that in the com that would be a common sense conversation there that I think that they would be open to. You know, I don't, I mean, Jared Moskowitz is gone. He's in Congress, who was my contact there, uh, but I, I don't know who, if you're dealing with 
the CEO. I mean, and we all know that these decisions are going to be somewhat political. Uh, and I, I would think that, you know, they're not going to give, you know, if it's three, if it's the city and the county and uh, Santa Rosa, I mean, I would say that they're going to hopefully divide it up proportionally. I mean, I can't see where they're going to disproportionately uh, take those funds. I, uh, I mean, they, they did say it would be based on scoring. I, I agree. I would, I would hope that they would uh, uh, try to spread it out. But, um, you know, and, and again, they could do it. Again, the city's $31 million ask is a, is a huge ask for one project and and uh, it sort of kind of put us all in a little bit of a of a bind um, but but maybe they only fund it partially and and would still give some others I mean I, as I say that but it still counts toward the 67 gross in request right. I'm yep. sure if, yeah if, if it does again, based on what she's yeah. saying um, mm. you know again the new air escape ECAP building is there a way to turn that into a shelter and then you get LMI and uh, shelter, I mean that that might. We don't even know if that thirty million dollars is real for that ECAS center. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, that, it could be forty million. It could Commissioner be twenty May, million. Just so you know that there are special funding just for shelters. Yes. So even though the Bay Center would not qualify for the LMI, they would get at fifteen points for it's being fifteen. So it's half. But so there is still that. Thanks. That's to my point. I mean, and hey Liz, that's stuff we got to know. It's, it's right. So, well, you know what, Robert, if we want to say that, um, you know, ECAT, I'm sure if we got $30 million, I mean, we probably could put an uh, indoor sports facility there with it, too. I mean, but we could, um, I guess we could try and put a shelter there. I mean, you know, Commissioner Baker, I feel bad for you on this project, and, and obviously it seems like it needs to be pulled, and I certainly feel bad, you know, about the Bay Center if we're going to pull it. For me... If I had to vote, I wouldn't pull it. I wouldn't, I'm not going to pull the base center. But, you know, if we don't have the support, we just have to pull it. But it's, it's a small amount, and we'll, we'll have to find somewhere to, to we're go gonna do. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to do what's needed there, and we're certainly going to do what's needed. Or, you know, I, I believe we're going to do what's needed there. I believe we're going to – we're certainly going to do what's needed there for the Sun Belt Conference. Um, this is, you know, we yeah. – So you know, let's we, do We've been good stewards of money. We, you know, the county has the county has resources. We can – we can you know, we can afford to do what's necessary. It's just – this is – this is a, Extremely frustrating process. Yeah, no doubt. So why don't, why don't we? I mean, just so we can move. I mean, so before my candle burns out, um, why won't Robert? I like your idea. Why don't we try to incorporate, you know, in the narrative, Elizabeth, uh, that we try to create some type of shelter? I mean, because that would be great, Robert. It would be unique. We have transportation, we have buses, and we can shelter people there, and make that not only you know the, the improvement for the uh, transit, but we turn that into a shelter. Rodriguez, do you think that's possible? Right. Yeah, we could we could have bought one right by the Bay Center. Yeah, yeah, we, that may be in the right sense of track. You still can. You still can. You can. Yeah, yeah. We'll call Justin and see can we get it. Wait, can we just get it? put a point uh, point out? So no, 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 no. Let, 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 let me try to land it, and I'll hand you the mic. We're going to get rid of the Bay Center upgrades. We're going to get rid of uh, Brosingham, and the major project and it's going to be a shelter. Is we are going to put the new Escambia County uh, ECAT. I mean. Do we have support of that? That's one. That's do we? One that's one of the three. Do we have enough? Do we got three votes for that? Okay, well, I, I'm with you, but is there going to be room for these other stormwater projects? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move to them. Okay. I'm, 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 but I'm just trying to get us off first base to at least at least, at least get. To, I'm okay. working my way down. So okay. For, so for now, yes. Okay. Yeah, so now I'm just trying to get to second base, and maybe I'll get to third. All right. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Calder. I guess I, I just I wish we all had this scoring sheet in front of us so we could rack and stack these because it's it's it, it's on, based on 125 points. Like I'd say, every building we buy, we have to pay insurance on. I'm all for that. Our insurance went up four million dollars. We can only help insurance rates by deep stormwater drainage, firehouses, and supporting the police. We should do three stormwater drainage projects. That's, yeah, but I Mike, mean, I mean, taking taking the ECAP building out of a flood area and and, and rebuilding it that would help. That would help well, our. I, I'm for also. both of them, but the problem is ECAT ECAT is going to address drainage. You know, we I, we have for, a major drainage problem. But the yeah. numbers but here's Mike, what, let's go through the for, math. For our insurance, it's the it's the quality of the building. If it flood, I mean, the, the, that's what impacts our insurance. So there's 46 million dollars left if you take out the Santa Rosa dollars. That's not including what the city put in. So we got to look at what actually, we, it, there's an appetite that we can actually successfully get. 
So when if you took the 30 million out, and Liz, you and I have had this discussion, so you know exactly where I'm going. That project, we probably wouldn't get fully funded. And so then the counties, and I'm for that project, but if it's funded for $10 million, you see my point? Yeah, but here's, here's the other thing, uh, and I have not, I'm sorry, I failed to mention this. Any project that we put on this list, all stop until it's decided. Correct. 18 months, yeah. the project is all stop until that goes through their process. So I think as, I'm sorry to add something else that we gotta think about as we do this, but that's, that's a big one. You know, I mean, that, 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 that you, can't, you can't do any more work, you can't do it, I mean, right? I mean, that's what they, they told us. And so, I, I, again, that's what you. But I mean, is there any more surprises? I think I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because that's very frustrating. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to me, I mean. Yeah. So, so, Commissioner May, I, you know. So, so, so for me, listen, yeah. the first project can be a shelter. It can be transportation. It can be a drainage project when you're going to put in something like that. That hits, to me, it's in an LMI. Uh, to me, there's no question because wherever we put that, that's going to be a public works project and it's going, it can address a drainage wherever we put it at. And it's already having a drain problem there, the jail, the whole nine yards. So to me, that's a good project right there. And so and that's and so, that's one. So I, again, so, for Olive Road, you're- you, pick, 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 you pick one and well, somebody- Well, I'm just one. saying, so Olive Road, the south side of that is, is your district. Uh, three of the four census tracts are, are LMI. When you, when you incorporate the, the having to stop on the project, I think, Rob, are we in a pretty much good stopping point if we needed to, to for that project? Which one are you talking about? For Olive Road. So you, that, you have that area south of Olive Road now between mm -hmm. the interstate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so three of the four census blocks uh, are in LMI. Um, and, All right. and I, I, I support that because we already got money and there's already been seven million secured. All right. right. Yeah, we already got money. Right. So, I, I think that's going to help them when they ask right. a seven million, not fourteen. All right. All right. Um, Get another one. Uh, Jeff, uh, call it. Y'all have one y'all want. For me, it would. I would take staff advice and I would go with Oak Crest, Beach Haven, and was third one Carver. Liz? Yeah, that would be my three, but I, those are all LMI, they're all stormwater drainage, staff recommendation, they meet the, they meet the intent of the policy, so that's where I'm at. Well, I mean, I would certainly want to improve, include uh, Monroe Avenue, which is, which is a very, it's, it's a $200,000 project, but it's stacked, it's in that list, it's in an LMI, it's adjacent to, or it's very close to the Carver Park project. Um, it's a especially being that small uh, as you know project size being that small and being an LMI I'd at least like to include that and uh, you know and honestly I'm fine if if the intent is to include the whole lot of them that aren't in that that are in LMIs I'm, I'm okay with that if that's yeah I think that's a good that's a Steve that's a great idea everything that's that's LMI we should put forward yeah what yep. do we have to lose I like that Jeff let's just do that can let's we make that? that let's, let's do just that, do that. Well, let's yeah. do that I mean, you, you, Easy. Can lose, you can lose all of them. We can lose all I mean, of them, yeah. At least one. But, Robert, we won't lose them off the top. True. That's true. We, we, that's we'll, true. we won't lose them off the top. I mean, and, and at least once you're in there, if you don't get eliminated off the top, then you're part of the discussion. If you eliminate it off the top, then we just said we have no discussion. Yeah. Commissioner, just a, a quick clarification. If you combine all of the stormwater projects, some LMI, some are not, it, it would just, you could do that. It just would lower your point score in the LMI category, and then if they go to cutting, that's what they would If we at. left the non-LMI in there, it would Correct. cut our score. But if we take all the non-LMI out and do what we just said up here and just only do the LMI projects, then we wouldn't lose those points. Correct. But And we could still combine them. Correct. But the We're problem, just going to exclude the non-L. The problem, I think, goes back to what Commissioner Barry said. They're going to be, they're going to be, if we put seven projects together in, each project's going to be scored independently. So are they, so going, to them into mean, three. Are they going to do a mean and do a cumulative force and say, because everyone else is going to get scored based on the scoring sheet independently. And if we submit seven, we're asking them to do what we're not willing to do. And I, I don't know how they're going to score that. 
I, we, we, I, I, I like I like the way Jefferson bundling. We got one huge Escambia County party. I mean, a uh, problem of drainage, and right. it's one you bundle it together. In in the narrative, you time together. Yeah. Because they're not interdependent. They're all dependent on it. That's all the stormboard. You can create that narrative and just submit it. And uh, all in LMI, put them all together, and you know let yeah. the chips fall where they may. Because if not, we'll be here to next week this time. All right, so let's do this. What, which projects are we submitting? All those stormwater projects at the LMI. All right, so, so what are we saying? We're saying the ECAT uh, uh, shelter. The ECAT is one that stands one. alone. All right. All right, so you've got Beach Haven as the septic to sewer. So that would not be part of the yep, stormwater be two. projects. So that would be two. All right. All right, so then you've got Delano is not eligible, right? 5.1 was not eligible. All right. So you would have, uh, and listen, I, I want to do wood run, but one of those is and one of those isn't. And and so. Uh, the one that is, we keep in, the one that's not well, taken. Yeah, out. but it's it's the project, so. So what, it's out. I, listen for. Yeah, I mean, it has to be I mean, out. I, right. Yeah. Did you say eliminate wood run? Yes. It's a smaller ask. It's a smaller ask. I, hopefully I can get the board support. Stephen, that was your old. Area, maybe we can. I know we're already doing one of them Absolutely. to raise those bridges. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, so, the PHS uh, drainage improvements. Yep, stays in. Stays in. Um, Oakfield Acre stays in. Oakfield stays in. Carver Park stays in. Uh, Monroe Avenue stays in. Yep. Gulf Gate Highway a pipe replacement stormwater, I guess that stays in. Uh, the Brickyard Road stormwater stays in. 9, 10, and 11 are out. Yeah, Muldoon's out. And then, and then Bayou's out. And you know the sad thing about that, just as we stop, we've had a 10-year issue with that, the Velma Pond and Muldoon. We've had, you know who the guy is that used to come to every meeting, and he would speak on every item. And this is an opportunity to freebie cheese money from the government, and there's a lot of poverty in that area, and I can't submit that project. No. This, is a broken, this is a broken process. Yeah. We're going to submit. It's a broken it. process. Right. We're going to submit some of these for resiliency, almost immediately. But yeah, there are other pots of money, and there's other infrastructure money. They that's have coming no down. LMI requirement. Yeah, it's right. coming down. But, but Joy, on any of those that we just listed, and, and so it was three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and twelve. Mm -hmm. Are any of those not in a point that when we make this application, they can't sit dormant for eighteen months? And in some cases, they won't have to. They've gone through some of those requirements. They just right. have to pr show proof of it. Okay. So, yeah, we, we kept that in mind when we were submitting these. We, so uh, you got some shovel-ready projects ready to go? If we uh, some, some shovels, some. The Beach Haven is about design, so we haven't even gotten into that, so that's the best way. sooner we get into the environmental assessment, then you're eligible for even more funding later and other grants. So we get that behind us, we're eligible for more. That's my motion. <laughs> 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 the latest yeah. face just dropped. Okay, I'm teasing. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> you went all the way to so, Birmingham to go to Mobile. Yeah. I appreciate so, it. Right. Commissioner Binder, you just said Project 12, but I think that there were only 10 left on the new recommendation. No, no, sorry. It was. I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to make sure. So it was uh, the ECAT, the Beach Haven, and then the, the way I had it in, or uh, maybe I'm working off of an old one. So I'll, I'll read it then. Well, I mean, it's, it, 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 you know, I mean, it's right. simple. So it's. it's it's yeah. it's PHS, it's Oakfield, Carver, Monroe, Gulf Beach, Brickyard, and Olive. All stormwater projects that are located in the LMI. Yeah, there you go. That's yep. Period. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, that's what we got. Uh, did Chair entertain a motion? That was it. That was the motion. So we have a motion and a second. Commissioner Kohler, you were the second on that? Yes. Thank you, sir. Do, is there any more discussion? Joy, Tim, Elizabeth? Is, Y'all got any, anything else to add? All right. Well, I'll give y'all about five minutes to deliberate before you vote. Oh, y'all ready? Yeah. All right. Happy vote. Birth Happy birthday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. That's your birthday present. <laughs> yeah. How quickly can I do your report? Passes 5-0. Thanks. What we got? There, I'll wait. Are you ready? We're ready. 
No, I'll just go and thank Chris Kerr for all his lobbying. He got, a, got everything he wanted today. There are 10 items on the county attorney's report. My recommendation would be to hold item seven for a separate vote and move the remainder. Hold on. Say that again, Allison, please. There are 10 items. Please, I would recommend holding item seven to treat A and B as separate votes and otherwise move the remainder of the report. That would be my motion if there's no second. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Council. Appreciate that brief report. Passes five in favor. Thank you, Madam Council. Yes, sir. My recommendation to the board on item seven would be to approve item A and to hold off on action on item B based on uh, the requesting party's uh, failure to yet retain or identify an attorney. So moved. Second. Please vote. You did, the, you did great. Just, that's what we did before, so that's, that was going to be my I'd motion. like to have a discussion if we can on this. Just okay, for yeah, so, um, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, the floor is open for this discussion, Commissioner Kohler. So, I know I've only been on this board a short time, but I'm I'm perplexed on on this process a little bit. So, medical professionals have a different standard in the court than most people. We have a we have a board called the FDOH that does investigations on people. There's literally every person in the state that gets a medical license has to do this every two years. I'm doing my right now to renew my license. There's four ways to close out. Either it's closed, you're, you're punished, you have some fines, or you have an administrative hearing. If you have an administrative hearing on a license, it's on your record and it's a disciplinary action. The state statute clearly states that, we sh that you should not pay for these fees. And we, these people, this current person we're talking about is currently not licensed and has a disciplinary action for fraud for his um, ACLS, BELS, and PALS. Where are you quoting that statute from? Because if, if it says that we legally can't do it, then I will. It's FDOH. I'll cite it. You can, it's uh, Health Professionals and Occupation 2021-456.072 says we should not pay, for, not the county, but that people should not be paying, it reads, the nurse or it could be another healthcare professional should not for cost of investigation, prosecuting, which are determined by an affidavit, itemized cost of salaries, personal that worked on the case, time spent by the attorney or other personal that worked on the case. We sent this out. Now, if we did this in-house, it'd be different. We are literally superseding FDOH's rules. I can't get on board with this. I, I, I want to, but if they were exonerated, if they, um, it was expunged by the governor, the state surgeon general, but we are voting for people that have disciplinary actions on their licensure. I can't do it. Well, I mean, let, let me let say, Alice. as Commissioner Barry said earlier, I mean, many times we make decisions based on staff recommendations. Some good, some bad. I've never gone, yeah, I stopped by law school for a couple of semesters, but I've never graduated from one. Uh, but I'm going to have to listen to our legal counsel uh, to give me some advice. And, we, you know, if I err because of that, I mean, there's malpractice on the attorney, not me. I mean, if she gives me bad advice, but I'll let her answer. Jeff, I'll let you go, and then I'll let the attorney well, answer. Well, no, I, I know that, that when you were saying that, Mike, and we all listened to what you said, but I believe that Allison had something that's Yeah, relevant. Madam Counsel, can you address that? Because we're not going to sure. do anything outside the, what's that word that someone likes to use, the general rule of law? As you know, <laughs> respectfully to the commissioner, and I know where he is on this, the, I've had you hold item B, which is related to administrative proceedings that are before FDOH, which apparently has yeah, yet to be determined. It, it's still up in the air. So he has not been disciplined by FDOH at this time. The hearing is still, his license is, is true, is not active, but it's for voluntary reasons apparently. He did not re-up his certification. That is the way I understood it. Regardless, I'm not asking the board to pay at this time for anything related to administrative proceedings. The only thing that I've asked 
in item A is for the successful defense of his criminal charge. Correct. You tr did this already for somebody who was on the same uh, standard, which was Kate, Kate Kinney. Kenny. You've already approved that. The clerk's already issued that check, and that check is already in the hands of Ms. Kinney's attorney. So this is treating uh, this particular individual on par with how you've already treated one of the other individuals from public safety. We're holding off on item B. We will wait and see what happens at the administrative level. I that's, just want to that's add my one. recommendation. Thank you, Madam Attorney. If you read the last document on the counts, there would not be a disciplinary action or the need for attorney fees if the individual didn't fraudulently do what they did. So you, we're trying to separate what wouldn't even happen if the individual did what was right in the first place. This is very, very serious in the medical community. The standards, we don't gun deck vital signs. We don't fake our credentials and they're there to protect the citizens. We would not even be in this situation if they didn't fraudulently um, try to fabricate their professional standards. So that's where I'm at, that's where I'm at on this. Mike, Mike, there's been a lot of, let me, t let me just tell you, before you got on this board, it's easy to get on the high horse and point the finger. But let me just tell you the history that you don't know about. We had a person in this county who was terrorizing employees because she overheard a paramedic say something that she didn't like and it got back to her. And she wrecked the careers. So I don't believe any of that garbage. Every single person that she pointed the finger at has been exonerated. They went through a diversion and they all took deals because they had to. So be careful what you say. Then all these I would ask. These people are, they are, they went through the process. This is a legitimate payment, and it's all because one rogue employee was allowed to terrorize an entire department and did it with free reign until she, until she was shown the door, which was a great thing that happened. So I'm certainly going to vote for this because this, this guy got treated poorly, and a lot of others in that department did too. A lot of careers got wrecked. So you weren't here when it happened. I don't think you're aware of everything that happened, Mike. With, I'm all, with all due respect, and I respect your abilities and your medical background and all of this, but that... What, what happened there was a travesty of the worst variety. Some of the worst, some of the worst treatment of employees that I've ever seen in my life. Let me just tell you. So yes, there was some culpability at, on the county level because one of our employees was given free reign to destroy people because she had an ego that was out of control. So this is, this is just one thing that we're doing to put it all back together. And all those That's people where are gone now, right, Jeff? That's what and, really and, happened. And Jeff, and Jeff, you brought this. So I mean, a couple questions. And all, uh, 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 but all those people that were, were with those bad practices are gone. This the, this individual no longer works for the county, I believe, anecdotally. But wasn't this guy exonerated anyway? No. His <laughs> criminal charges were dismissed. His charges were dismissed, Mike. Uh, and that's the seventy-five hundred dollars. That's part A. Charges dismissed. Okay, I, I get where we're going with this, but here's the problem. I don't know this medical director, but if we really feel the way you do, and I respect that, then we have a responsibility to con contact the governor and say the investigative process from the FDOH that's putting, and if she was that bad, we should do that. We should, we should go and say, hey, the state surgeon general is putting disciplinary marks on people's licenses and affecting their careers. I don't think there's an appetite to do that because the problem has subsided, but I will say this. There is a lot more to the story, Mike, and I've read reams of documents and I was in the middle of it and people's lives got wrecked and it's because we didn't do our jobs. The staff and the county in reining in an employee who was out to wreck people because she didn't like what they said. She didn't want anyone. There was games going on. There was all kinds of, look, it's been a nightmare and this is just cleaning up the mess. That man's career was ruined. And he, his isn't the you only. You didn't make him lie. He yeah. lied himself. No, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say. I'll, what I'm going to say is he went through a process and he was exonerated. That's the way the justice system works. Allison, what, what, was he exonerated? What is the correct legal term? For the criminal case. For the criminal case. The criminal case is resolved. The charges were dismissed. Dismissed. By the state attorney's office. He has, in my opinion, legally been exonerated, exonerated. by the criminal system. And so we're going to pay this. I'm going to vote we to have pay for it. It is true that Even if I'm on the bottom there of is the an an unresolved situation before FDOH. So I'm, I am a rec 
recommending that we approve A to treat this person the same as we treated Kate Kinney, hold off on B so that we can study it further or there may be no need going forward to do anything. It's, it's still uh, un, unaddressed by Mr. Salter. Motion and a second on that, right? We do have a motion and a second. I'm going to restart the vote so everyone okay. can just vote again, okay? Are you good with the motion and the second? Yes, sir. It was, it was clear from the beginning. Yes, sir. That passes four in favor. That's all I have. Oh, well, Allison, thank you. Um, and it's far fetched, but I, you know, certainly there was a death on Airport Boulevard. And Commissioner Berry, you, I'm, I'm never one to say I told you so. Uh, when we closed down Rawson Lane, uh, you know, there was talk about putting an overpass, and I know the guy was just working, uh, but that is still dangerous. You know, there, there, there were commitments made uh, when, we, when we took a, a public asset of Rawson Lane that was probably worth, you know, five to ten million dollars and gave it to a, a private entity, and that they were going to make those improvements on airport, walkways, safety things. Uh, unfortunately, a life was lost, and they've still not addressed those issues. So I just wanted to just publicly say that, and hopefully staff, engineering, joy, let's we'll look into Prince Cola Christian with some of the promises that they made when we closed down Rawson Lane. And you know, my exact words that night, if we don't get a walkover, if we don't put some safety base, someone's gonna get killed closing down Rawson Lane because we're pushing too much traffic there. Uh, Commissioner Berry, you stood with me? And I appreciate it, uh, but the end result of the things that we, I said five years when this board made a horrible decision to close down a street. Uh, we now had a loss of life. So I hope that staff will begin to talk with them in traffic to see what they're gonna do about protecting the safety because that's one of their students, but next it's one of my constituents that's trying to get to Hancock and trying to get to airport when they made promises when we closed down that street without giving one dime to the taxpayers that they were gonna put it in the infrastructure. And for me, it's very sad. So I hope that that can be conveyed to them. I suspect the message has been, has been received. I mean, there were commitments that were made, Wes, so we're, we're going to look into those and see, what was, see what's memorialized. All right. I appreciate that. I appreciate your support, Commissioner Berry. You did support uh, when they closed down and took a public road. Uh, and now um, I hope that, you know, they know that you know, it's sad. And, and certainly my condolences and prayers go out to the person who lost their life, and we're praying for that family. Is there anything else for the good of the order? What? Uh, I mean, was it beneficial? Was it beneficial to all concerned? <laughs> Did you build goodwill? <laughs> yeah, we stand adjourned. And everybody's invited to my birthday party right back here at 3 o'clock. It's going to be in here? In here, yeah, right here. Lay it down.